makes a difference makes a difference in uh, assessing the surgical risk if there is a past history of bleeding it's better to go ahead in spite of a little higher grade as well as when the compact nidus is present versus a diffuse nidus it is favorable to and less risky to go ahead when there is a compact nidus invariably we will come to discussion about aruba trial this is the lone randomized trial about unruptured brain arteriovenous malformations it is uh, often quoted to criticize it of the, of the methodology and uh, uh, results what is highlighted particularly by us neurosurgeons and for obvious reasons like because out of 1700 odd cases which were screened only 226 cases were enrolled and only five underwent neurosurgery alone which was very less compared to what the literature shows us of the excellent results of good obliteration rates using surgery as the mainstay of treatment the results after 33 years 33 months of follow up is very less when we consider lifelong risk of avm and there is an extension of this study which is again published after 50 odd months but still it's insufficient to give a conclusive picture about the risks associated length of follow up is very low treatment arm is below standard of care in most centers in india in us and certain centers in uk and rest of europe there is abnormally high rate of uh, embolization being utilized which is not the standard of care in most of the centers the good points is that it is the only randomized avm trial for uh, randomized trial for unruptured avms there are some good things which we need to extrapolate into newer studies to actually see uh, what's the risk associated with leaving a small leaving a avm uh, asymptomatic avm without managing but as lotton has highlighted surgery should be regarded as gold standard therapy of majority low grade avms there are series of articles which came after uh, this uh, original aruba trial which all highlighted the importance of surgery as the gold standard we can use embolization as preoperative adjunct and radio surgery for deep located avms but surgery is the mainstay how complex the decision will be is highlighted in this grade 5 avm which bled after initial conservative trial required an emergency surgery then required an embolization for this fusiform avms and a small vestibular nidus and then still small vestibular nidus required a srs later radio surgery so the recommendation would be like this for grades 1 and 2 surgical resection with or without embolization grade 3 multimodality treatment as appropriate grade 4 and 5 again multimodality treatment only if repetitive or significant hemorrhage or there is a progressive neurological disability as i said surgery for small avms and large avms equating together is like equating a cat and a tiger so what has progressed in the last few years is about identification of various different taxonomy of avms which will aid us in having a protocol about the avms in particular locations like frontal temporal paratoccipital deep periventricular brain stem and cerebellum and the second concept is visualizing avm as a cone in a box though avms will be of very different shapes it helps to have an idea that it is actually a cone with the surface towards the cortex which is the base and an ependymal surface that's the base, that's the tip of the cone so these eight steps if we divide it will make a kind of patterned approach to surgical dissection and excision of avms large craniotomy wide exposure take care not to avoid the vein subarachnoid dissection initially we may have to go interhemispheric or basal or into the sylvian fissure then recognize and preserve the draining vein till the end identify the feeding arteries then pile dissection and parenchymal dissection is the four sides of the box and then comes the deep ependymal dissection where choroidal feeders choroidal bleeders will be Uh, have to be tackled in a particular fashion as shown by juha's dirty coagulation technique that's one tip which i would want to suggest is using morselized brain tissue around to coagulate and achieve hemostasis so how to manage intraoperative bleeding so that's 
you, our mainstay is bipolar coagulation, top dissection, dirty coagulation I just mentioned. Sometimes for profuse bleeds, we need to use iron thumb hemostatic retraction. And if uh, by chance the main draining vein gets occluded, then we may have to swiftly proceed with the rapid excision, by what is called a commando operation. So these are some tips which I would like to highlight in this brief talk about what we can use as surgical tips. And to conclude, each AVM is unique in its angio architecture and natural history. Microsurgical with no morbidities would be the best treatment option for smaller AVMs. And multimodality treatment is the mainstay of treatment for grade three AVMs. For still higher grade AVMs, masterly higher inactivity and conservative treatment is acceptable option. And visualizing a three-dimensional anatomy of AVM uh, using a cone in a box approach uh, will help in microsurgical excision of these AVMs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I'm just checking the chat to see if there are any questions that have uh, come up. There's a, a, there's a question that in cases of an emergency, do you advocate for removal of the hematoma and excision of the AVM at the same time? As I said, the objective of emergency surgery is damage control and preserving life. So in the process to achieve hemostasis, definitely uh, the AVM would be taken out even um, inadvertently to say, because once you take care of all the feeders and along with the hematoma, most of the times the bulk of the AVM would have come out. Because as I said in the, this phase, the AVM is pushed, the angio architecture is distorted and pushed to one side. There's a high risk that even if you want to take out it in its entirety, it may not be possible. And something, a nubbin is left behind. It may be small or big, which we will know only later. But at that moment when we are operating, our objective is not to excise the AVM in full, but to achieve hemostasis, reduce mass effect, take out the hematoma and preserve life. I completely agree with you. I, I will try very hard to avoid engaging with an AVM, especially in children in the acute phase, um, if I can avoid it and, and control the ICP by removing the hematoma. Somebody's asking about, what about cryptic AVMs? How often do you find? So uh, do that, by that, can you clarify, do you mean AVMs that you're not expecting are there in a hematoma? Yes, hemat uh, when you explore the AVM, AVM, and you find an AVM, which is yeah. occult by angiographically. That is what we yes. call mean cryptic. Yeah. So that's a common occurrence. Like we go in thinking it's a hematoma of, of some other etiology. Like there are some indicators which we have to consider before we go in, like um, younger patients, female age, unusual location of hematoma, and uh, lower hematomas. And the early draining vein, if it is seen in the imaging, these are the things which we have to keep in mind that we may be dealing with. But in spite of that, there are occasions in which we'll encounter such kind of uh, hematomas with AVMs. Recently I had, I opened up even an elective, sort of elective case. I thought it was a cavernoma with bleed in a child. But when I went in, it was actually an AVM. I, it, then the sudden the pace of surgery changes. Once we notice that it's not what we had thought of, then we'll have to tackle in the usual. Once we, the question is about the recognition. Once you recognize it, then the you have to switch gears to deal with it as an AVM. And if it is not amenable for resection at that particular moment, as uh, process said, like we'll have to just come out evacuating the hematoma, achieve hemostasis, and deal with it after a DSA and once the patient recovers later. Hey, thank you very much. I think we'll leave the questions there. Um, and thanks, uh, Professor uh, Chandrachari, for your, your talk. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Messina from Italy. Are you with us, Dr. Messina? Good morning to, everybody, to everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Marano. I will speak instead of Dr. Messina. Lovely. And you're going to speak on uh, collaboration with our ENT colleagues in lateral skull-based surgery. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'll Thank try to share much. my screen now. 
Uh, in what on, on what what name are you there so i can give you the i'm walter marani from walter Mar uh, just just a second from uh, the surgical department of uh, e excellent I'll, I'll just give you the sharing this you should be able to share it now thanks okay i will try again uh, uh, One second, some problem. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Mm. What? Do You see my first slide. Um, don't I can't. Uh, it's not to zoom. Is not uh, showing my screen. Sorry. Uh, no problem. Would it be a good idea to have the next talk while we uh, get the technical issue sorted yeah, out? Yeah, I, I, I managed. Yeah. Oh, you've got it. Good. Yeah. Uh, uh, I need to get out from the reunion. Okay, you can talk with the next one. Okay, I need to go out. Otherwise, they won't allow me to to introduce my presentation. Oh, Sorry. So why don't you, if that's okay, Mr. World, why don't you I will, uh, go out uh, and come back? We, we, we will just, I will, I'll, if I may ask a question uh, on AVM, Mr. Walsh. Uh, okay. We, I, will, I will try to get inside again. Sure, Sorry. please. Thanks. Um, uh, in terms of the, you know, the learning curve for AVM surgery, um, and I think, uh, you know, one once Professor Ugur Ture said, Naren, I spent three years on anatomy dissection before I went into AVM, I felt safe after I was 45. And, uh, uh, and in the old days, the learning curve was tolerated. The, the, any poor outcome with the learning curve was tolerated as saying everyone has to learn. But now the society and the colleagues uh, uh, don't uh, 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 tolerate it, probably rightly so. So at what point, you know, what would you say, how many operations one has to train with AVM before they are ready to fly, obviously it changes from person to person, but in the same time, what's your thoughts on training a surgeon for AVM? Uh, if I may ask Mr. Walsh and Mr. Prasad, thanks. I think it's a really interesting question, Naran. I think the, the first thing to recognize it is, uh, as suggested in the last talk, mm -hmm. there, there are technical nuances to addressing an AVM mm -hmm. that can be learned over time. Mm -hmm. It's not a tumor. Mm -hmm. It's a you're engaging with a disordered physiology, and you have to take account of that as you're operating on it. Um, my fellowship director, uh, Michael Morgan in Australia, mm -hmm. a condition of of completing his fellowship, which was very centered on AVM surgery, mm -hmm. was that at the at the end when we went into practice, we would maintain a prospective database, mm -hmm. and we used that to to publish a paper led led by one of my colleagues in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, several years later, of of all his fellows early year experience with low grade AVMs, mm -hmm. what the outcomes were and whether they reflected um, uh, the, you know, the results obtained by, by one of the largest volume surgeons in the world, Michael Morgan, mm -hmm. using a CUSM plot analysis. Mm -hmm. and, and what that showed was it is possible to replicate the results of the best people in the world mm -hmm. with training. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the people participating in that had a one to two year fellowship. Mm -hmm. So I think that shows um, these these skills can be trained if you have the substrate uh, in, in an institution where where you you have the opportunity to learn on with and in, with the benefit of somebody experienced. Um, whether I, I think this, this the learning curve inevitably is going to be a lot steeper and and more jagged if uh, if you have to find your way through it on your own in your career. So I'm 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 an enthusiastic advocate for um, training early early in the career of people who wish to specialize in, in AVM surgery. I think it brings benefits to patients and, and doctors. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Walsh. Mr. Prasad, could you uh, mention what's your thoughts on uh, thoughts, reflecting on your training? And yeah. Yes, uh, as Professor said, like one thing I need to add is that like AVM is very heterogeneous. Small AVMs and large AVMs are two different animals. Not to be intimidated, uh, particularly for small AVMs. So they can be something which can be tackled with supervision. And those are the 
things which can be learned with the mentor early on in the training. And second thing, in the same breath, we have to mention not to extrapolate your experience with smaller AVMs with the bigger AVMs, larger AVMs, because they are two different animals, as Professor said, like the pathophysiology, how it behaves is grossly different. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So we have no, <clears throat> now got um, Dr. Walter Maran. Can you, can you see my presentation now? Yeah, my yes. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, good morning to everyone again. I'm uh, Walter Marani from the Neurosurgical Department of the Polyclinical Hospital of Bari in Italy. Our presentation will focus on the teamwork we experience in our institution between neurosurgeons and ENT surgeons in the treatment of lateral skull base lesions. The goal of our study is to compare the surgical techniques performance, outcome, and morbidity rate in surgical treatment of lateral skull base lesions performed exclusively by single neurosurgeon to the ones of a joint endeavor of neurosurgeon and otolaryngologists. The most frequent lesion of this region we get to treat in our institution is the acoustic neuroma. For the treatment of this kind of tumors is of paramount importance to choose an appropriate approach. The most commonly employed approach are the translabyrinthine and the retrosigmoid craniotomy. Each one of those has its advantages and its disadvantages. Considering the translabyrinthine, the biggest advantage is the early identification of the fascial nerve in the, into the acoustic canal. Furthermore, in this approach, there is no need for cerebellar retraction, preventing pial injuries. The downsides of this approach are a smaller surgical corridor, a longer learning curve, and a time-consuming approach with hearing loss. The retrosigmoid craniotomy, on the other hand, offers a faster and easier approach with a wider surgical field, but it requires cerebellar retraction and offers a late identification of the fascial nerve. I made some illustration to, for these two kinds of approach. The mastoidectomy starts identifying the asterion, the mastoid tip, and the spinal band. The drilling starts and we can recognize the mastoid cells, the temporal tegment, the mastoid antrum with the incus, and of course, the sigmoid sinus. Sorry. With more deep drilling, we will find the labyrinth, the fascial nerve into the fallopian canal, the jugular bulb, and the superior petrosal sinus. With more deep drilling, we will remove the labyrinth finally, and we'll expose the internal acoustic canal, which will be skeletonized at 270 degrees. On the other side, we have the retrosigmoid approach. In this approach, we need to identify the asterion, which is usually located just below the transverse sigmoid junction, and then perform a craniotomy just behind the sigmoid sinus.
Consecutive patients with the lateral skull base lesions elected for open surgery were included in this study and analyzed retrospectively. The patients were enrolled in two groups, depending on whether the operation was performed from a neurosurgeon alone, group A, or from a neurosurgeon in collaboration with an ENT surgeon, group B. Operative technique, average surgical time, difficulties, and complication were evaluated and statistically compared through the chi-squared test. Thirty patients were included in group A and thirty patients in group B. No significant differences were found between the two groups in terms of size and type of lesions and patient population. A significant difference was found on the surgical approach, showing that the neurosurgeon alone preferred retrosigmoid approach in most of cases, 94.3%. Meanwhile, in group B, transit labyrinthine approach was mostly employed, 81.5%. A significant difference was also recorded between groups regarding average surgical time and incidence of intraoperative and postoperative complications, such as loss of cranial nerve response to intraoperative stimulation and postoperative, transient, and permanent cranial nerve deficits, favoring collaborative work. Moreover, rate of total and near total resection was also significantly higher in group B. No significant difference was found in postoperative infectious and hemorrhagic complication rate. As we all know, skull-based approach such as mastoidectomy can be time-consuming and require a long learning curve. But on the other side, they offer great advantages in terms of tumor removal and the preservation of the cranial nerve. This study demonstrates how the teamwork between the neurosurgeon and the otolaryngologist can reduce the bias on the choice of the approach based on the surgeon. This allows a more tailored approach, which results in shorter surgical time and a better outcome. This is possible because the ENT surgeon can perform mastoidectomy in a really small amount of time. Furthermore, cooperation between different specialists goes beyond that. Otolaryngologist helps neurosurgeon during removal of the intradural part of the tumor and also cooperates in removal of the tumor from the internal acoustic canal. This collaboration during the whole operation with a frequent switch can prevent fatigue, which often can worsen the outcome during long procedures. In conclusion, our study highlights the importance and utility of cooperation between neurosurgeon and otolaryngologist in lateral skull-based surgery, demonstrating that teamwork can achieve a better clinical and radiological outcome in this kind of disease. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping to time given all the technical problems you had. Have we any questions? Well, could, could I ask you a question then? Sure, um, sure. Please. To, what, to what extent do you, I mean, the, there may be an element of selection here in that the trans lab cases are much more likely to have been selected for that approach because, uh, because of the nature of the tumor, not, not yeah. simply because of the preference of the ENT. Yeah, yeah, mostly we, we, we use it. Of course, we tailored the approach on the tumor and on the patient about uh, to preserve the hearing when it's possible or, or not. When they have a feasible hearings, we maybe perform retrosigmoid approach. When they, when they are deaf, we prefer translab. Trans and somebody, somebody's commenting here, the translabs gives you a smaller opening. Um, if it starts bleeding, it can be difficult. Do you any? And somebody else is asking about whether you use endoscopy to uh, to uh, help you with these operations. 
Um, two two separate technical questions there, really, aren't there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Translab is true. It gives, as I said, yeah, it's a downside. It gives you a smaller, a smaller surgical corridor and uh, can be sometimes challenging, especially when the jugular barb is really high riding. But, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but uh, yeah, is it true? Is a, is a, re a real downside. But uh, I think with the experience, it can manage well, also from trans labyrinthine and uh, getting the fascial nerve control since the beginning of the operation can fasten the procedures, I think. Especially if the nerve, main neurosurgeon is, uh, uh, does not need to do the approach, is really kind of not, not have any problem to start the operation, find the fascial nerve and uh, uh, it can control easily. Of course, when the jugular barb is high riding, is a really little bit difficult. But look, look very carefully at the imaging beforehand at the jugular bulb. Yeah. Um, can you uh, stop sharing your screen just now? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, um, sure. Sorry. Uh, and while, while you're doing that, does the size of the tumor matter for determining approach? Yeah, sure, sure. Of course, the the tumor size and the tumor location also kind of matters especially if it goes too high or too media, sometimes it can be necessary to uh, extend the approach with a middle fossa approach or to remove some part or maybe schedules two times operation to remove a different part. But mostly, most of the tumor acoustic neuroma can be well managed from uh, uh, trans labyrinthine or most of them, of course, not all of them. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank Do you. we have Dr. Suleiman with us from Syria? Dr. Suleiman from Syria? Dr. Hamad, do you, Dr. Halia Hamad, you want, is your colleague there? I know Dr. Uh, Sirmos from Greece is with us. Okay. Shall Perhaps we, we could uh, Shall we go to come to, back. Yes. Uh, we go to Nicholas. Do you want to present your? Uh, uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, everybody from Thessaloniki, Macedonia, Greece. Uh, I'm very happy to be here for uh, this second day of this amazing uh, webinar conference. Uh, I'm very happy and very proud to be with uh, great friends as Naren, all the distinguished faculty. I saw before Boris Jurovic from Balkanic region and our friend Bagda Karupanan from uh, India. Uh, may, may I share my screen now? Please, Please. do, yes. And if Dr. Suleiman comes on, we will we'll come back to you if you let me know you're there. Uh, did you see my screen now? It's coming. Yeah. Here you are. Just press uh, slideshow. Okay. Uh, I'm Nikolaos Sirmos from Thessaloniki, Greece, and I will speak uh, about post concussion syndrome disorders in young male professional athletes. Is my research activity. Uh, in the Department of Sports Medicine uh, in uh, Aristotelian University of Thessaloniki. Sorry to interrupt you, but it, could you possibly launch your slideshow to enlarge the slides? Uh, I, I already do it. I don't know why. There's a little lag then. Now it's better? Yes, thank you. Uh, the aim of this study was to evaluate post-concussion cervical spine syndrome disorders in young male professional athletes. Yesterday I, sp I spoke about uh, amateur athletes, but when we have professional athletes, we have to be more careful. Uh, three young male athletes with post-concussion cervical spine syndrome disorders were evaluated. One swimmer, one bicycle athlete, one long distance runner, and the most common disturbances were headaches and dizziness in two patients and fatigue in one, but we have arm weakness in all three of them. Uh, we suggest in all of them, 100% uh, of all three of them, cognitive therapy, appropriate medication, painkiller, and uh, uh, 
and other drugs under neurological uh, surveillance. It is very important uh, our collaboration as neurosurgeons with other medical disciplines. This is very important. And all of them return with safe results in the physical activity after uh, approximately three weeks time, 21 uh, days. Uh, uh, as, uh, as conclusions, uh, we can uh, say that uh, it seems that cognitive behavioral therapy and medication, appropriate medication, could be helpful in these situations. And post-concussion cervical spine syndrome remains a post-traumatic condition that needs uh, accurate evaluation and approach. Uh, if we can make a small uh, discussion, uh, as the literature said, uh, that uh, we can also see the long-term symptoms of post-concussion uh, syndrome may include, and when we have professional athletes, we have to be care about that, a vertigo and dizziness, chronic fatigue, and migraines and headaches, cognitive problems, memory and concentration, neck pain, mood changes and the irritability, uh, sensitivity to light and sounds, insomnia, depression, anxiety, these are just some of the most common symptoms and other effects may accompany this. It is important to note that these symptoms are not the result of damage to the brain, but is the long-term symptoms. And ongoing symptoms are caused by changes in the function of the brain and nervous system that were tricked by the initial trauma. Uh, the symptoms of concussion are evaluated by the SCAT tools. This is the ultimate SCAT-5 tool, uh, all these sim symptoms uh, that we can uh, be aware of that. And uh, if we saw the literature, we can say that the adult sports related traumatic spinal injuries do different activities predispose certain injuries, depends from the beginning of these studies. Uh, this study shows that contact sports, uh, cycle sports, uh, skateboard, uh, ski board and water sports are uh, most related and uh, the objective is that sports injuries are known to present a high risk of spinal trauma. We have been aware about that. And when we spoke about spinal trauma, we cannot forget that perhaps it will be also a spinal cord injury trauma. <laughs> this is when we have a, a, a spinal cord injuries trauma, we have additional uh, hospitalization days uh, in order to manage to perform a good care for our patients. And as a conclusion, we can say that the importance is the prevention. Prevention is very important and we have uh, to have prevention ru rules uh, uh, in all sports activity, especially to professional uh, athletes. Uh, I want to dedicate my presentation uh, in this uh, second day uh, to this man, uh, William Harkness, a great friend of mine, a leading pediatric neurosurgeon figure for the UK, a great person, a great neurosurgeon, and a great uh, human being. We were many uh, good friends, and we will always uh, remember him. We lost him recently, but we will remember him in, in eternity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if, if I may, I'll, I'll add my tribute to William Harkness too. Um, I worked as his senior SHO at Queen's Square. It was one of my first jobs in the UK. And in, in many ways, he um, he helped me start off in, in neurosurgery in this country. And I, I was well, always well, very when, when, to him. When he saw a young colleague, William is always helpful to him. Yeah. Uh, when we, we meet in congresses, we were always together about speaking about future about his project in Inter Sergio and uh, uh, a great loss. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Naren, uh, amazing Congress as always, and uh, uh, we will be here to listen to the other good friends and good colleagues from all, all, from all the, the other part of the world. It's a kind of Olympics of uh, neurosurgery, this webinar conference. Compliments and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Nikos. Thank you, Nikos. Um, um, any questions? Um, uh, Mr. Walsh, do you have any questions? Uh, 
Um, I, I don't. I think if um, I was going to suggest I hand over to my co-chair for the second half. There's one question that's appeared from Professor Sina. Yeah, there is one question. Like, which scale do you use for evaluation from Dr. Sinai? Uh, we are always uh, using SCAP because uh, according to International Federation of Sports Medicine and the other uh, and the Olympic uh, Committee, SCAP is the most uh, effective and the most uh, quick tool to evaluate uh, also on field this uh, this traumatic situation but uh, there are other other tools uh, uh, also available and also effective so, dr Prasad, i think we are going to go to dr ali hamad next yeah we need to yeah is he there uh, dr thank hamad you. is here yeah thank you yeah yeah hi everyone hi so we'll have the next uh, session by Dr. Ale Sunaiman on solitary plasma cytoma of the columbus spine, interdisciplinary management using uh, closing, posterior, opening, and anterior with the Sure. Uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, Dr. Sunaiman is Professor. not here, so Dr. Ali Hamad is going to go ahead with his presentation on uh, pediatric aneurysm. Okay, that yeah. Thank you. So Dr. Ali Ahmad, Ali Ahmad from Syria. Thank you. Symptomatic unruptured pediatric intracranial aneurysm poses a diagnostic and management dilemma. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone. Hi professor. I want to share my presentation. Please let me. I couldn't share my presentation. Yeah, please. Uh, I think now we will be able to share. Oh, sorry, just, sorry. Button. just just like it, make your part of my phone. Please. Okay, yeah, you can. You should be able to share okay. it now, Doctor okay. Hamid. Okay. okay, thank you. Sorry, I will share now my presentation. I have some problems with sharing my presentation. Do you see the share button? I have some, I will share it as PDF only. Sure. Um, what worked before was logging on and off to the call. You might want to try that. There is some problem, I will fix it shortly. Yes, I I find that problem. Sorry. No problem. I was going to say earlier that when I gave my first in-person lecture towards the end of the first lockdown, my first words to the audience were, can you see me? <laughs> I think yes. we've all developed this as a, a, a as a tick during uh, during the webinar era. Mm. Yes, Professor. Yes. Good, sir. If we can go to. So, I'm Ali Habib from Syria. I'm your surgery resident at Shrin University Hospital. I will talk about symptomatic and ruptured pediatric intracranial aneurysm. Intracranial aneurysms are rare in the pediatric population and constitute less than 2% of all cerebral aneurysms. The proportion of ruptured aneurysms in, in patients younger than 15 years is less than 1%. The most common presenting of ruptured aneurysms in the pediatric population is subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
Unruptured aneurysms can often remain asymptomatic or can present with symptoms including headache, seizures, cranial nerve pulses, and focal neurological deficits. Most authors agree that ICA bifurcation is the main location of aneurysms in children with rate of 24 to 50%. In adults, this location counts for approximately 2%. The management of pediatric intracranial aneurysms is controversial. Evidence of the management of cerebral aneurysms in the pediatric population is based largely on experience in adult patients. Our case is a 10-year-old boy suddenly presented to our emergency department with a complaint of severe headache, diplopia, and virtual ptosis. His neurological status was dominated by somnolence his pupils were anisocoric and symmetrically reactive. Meningeal signs were negative. Rest of examination findings were normal. There was no history of systemic upset, trauma, relevant medical or surgical history. His father died because of renal failure due to polycystic kidney disease. Urgent brain CT scan was performed and it didn't show intracranial hemorrhage or other lesions. Brain MRI was also performed to exclude any abnormal condition of the brain. It showed also normal findings. Standard clinical examination and laboratory investigation were done to exclude intracranial infection, toxins, and metabolic conditions. Enhanced CT angiography referred a five millimeter secular ICA bifurcation aneurysm on the left side. The patient underwent microsurgical clipplication of ICA bifurcation aneurysm after 10 days of symptoms. The surgery was done by extended perineal craniotomy approach. Patient was kept under observation for three days in the neurointensive care unit. There were no bury or post procedure complication, and the patient was discharged on day seven after operation. Clinical follow up for the children after one month showed normal results. On the six months follow up, neurological examination was normal. Here we see the post procedure CT angiography showed complete exclusion of the aneurysm from the circulation. Only 0.5 to 4.0% of all aneurysms occur in patients 18 years old of age and younger. For this young individual with unruptured aneurysms that initially present with generalized headache or even seizures, a post-construct CT scan can miss the underlying pathology. Lieber et al. suggested that a large congenital medial defect could be the initial factor of aneurysms that occur early in the life. There are syndromes uh, like Marfan, Inner-Danlos, Neurofibromatosis, and autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. But in our case, there were no predisposing factors for aneurysm such as non-connective tissue disease or polycystic kidney disease and no preceding trauma. The management of unruptured intracranial aneurysm is controversial. There were no randomized trials on which to base recommendations. Decision about therapy need to weigh the nature history of the aneurysm, the risks of intervention and patient preferences. In general, asymptomatic aneurysms that more than seven to 10 millimeter in diameter warrant strong consideration for treatment, taking into account patient age, existing medical and neurological conditions and relative risk for treatment. Incidental aneurysms need to be treated early because of the chance of rupture that are high due to increased period of risk in pediatric patients. In our case, we decide to manage the aneurysm by surgical cleaving depending on above criteria and because it was an incidental aneurysm. In conclusion, 
diagnosis of symptomatic and ruptured intracranial aneurysm is challenging. The next challenge is to determine which aneurysms pose a significant risk of future rupture. The management of pediatric intracranial aneurysms is controversial. Multidisciplinary team is best able to treat such complex conditions. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Dr. Ali Hamad. We have some time for questions. Any questions in the chat? I fully agree with uh, your decision-making process uh, to manage this child with uh, unruptured IC aneurysm, uh, Dr. Hamad. How would you like to follow up this child further? I didn't understand you. Please repeat. Yeah. How would you follow up this child? I followed him by clinical examination and uh, CT scan yeah. after uh, three months. Yeah, you have done one CT angiogram. It showed a good exclusion of uh, aneurysm and probably will do the same periodically to see. Yes. With a family history of uh, polycystic disease. His father is, uh, yeah. was uh, died because of polycystic disease. Yes. Maybe further genetic studies may be required to show uh, that it, uh, he is a ABDK family. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Then no questions. We'll go to the next talk. Do we have uh, Dr. Allah Suleiman? Dr. Ahmed, is Dr. Suleiman or Dr. Muhammad here? Dr. Muhammad is here. You see? Oh, yes, Dr. Muhammad is here. Yes, okay. Okay, so then we'll go to the next talk by Dr. Ali Muhammad from Syria. Strider and Cellaria as initial manifestations of diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Dr. Ali, Ali Muhammad, do you want to uh, share your presentation? Dr. Ali Muhammad? While uh, Dr. Ali Muhammad, can you hear us? Okay. While while Dr. Ali Muhammad is trying to get, uh, can I, um, Mr. Morton, Mr. Uh, Dr. Um, Prasad, can I uh, present you uh, um, as a filler on machine yes. learning for neurosurgery? Yeah, please. Uh, please. Is that okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, yeah. Please. Come back to. It's perfect. Yeah, please. Hello. Machine learning for neurosurgeons. Doctors from so find this presentation useful. This is Dr. G. Surgeon. Neurosurgeon from Bristol. Now then can you please share your screen, please? Unable to see your screen. Traditional computer system have to input the recipe and the exact instructions to the computer. Then the computer would make the soup that we had expected. Hello, now, everyone. Now, okay. let's look at how a machine okay. learning system might be 
making a suit. It messes the, the computer would review several videos and even read cookbooks on how to make a suit. And then from analyzing these videos and the books and the outcomes, it can come up with a suit that it thinks is the best. Now let's schematically review the traditional computer concept and machine learning concept. The traditional computer concept. Can you hear me at all? Data and a program. Yeah, uh, we are, it's audibility is a bit poor, but we are not seeing the video. Oh, you're not seeing the video. Okay, sorry. The data. Oh. Okay, just a second, please. Sorry, beg your pardon. Let's... Sorry about it. For neurosurgeons. Yes. Can you hear it now? Yes, yes, yes. Doctors from other fields might also find this presentation useful. This is Dr. G. Narendran, neurosurgeon from Bristol. The essence of machine learning is to use computers to figure out patterns in data and do it so quickly. Let us first review how a traditional computer system works. Let's say we want a computer to make soup. With a traditional computer system, we have to input the recipe and the exact instructions to the computer then the computer would make the soup that we had expected. However, now let's look at how a machine learning system might deal with making a soup. In machine learning, the computer would review several videos and even read cookbooks on how to make a soup and then from analyzing these Hello. videos and books I will and the outcomes, it would then come up with a soup that it thinks is the best. Oh. Now let's schematically review the traditional computer concept and machine learning concept. In traditional computer concept, you would input data and a program the computer would process them and produce an output. However, in machine learning, you would input the data and output from historical findings. The computer would then try to pick a pattern using machine learning algorithm and output a program. You can then use the program to make future predictions. Machine learning is not new. Even when I was a 10 year old lad, back in the northern Sri Lanka in Jaffna, I heard about neural net. Machine learning is now in vogue mainly because of the availability of powerful personal computers, user friendly machine learning software, and several algorithms for affecting machine learning. Another reason is many vendors including giants such as Microsoft, Apple and Google and NGOs such as Slovenia University are making sophisticated and user-friendly software which allow you to implement machine learning for free. Can we do what we do? Machine Can learning we is complex. Can we do what we do? Can we do without the need for a mathematician or a computer expert. If you would like to make the algorithm 
Yep. Specific. Sorry, there, there is a gentleman trying to zoom it? bomb the meeting. Would, okay, um, I suggest you kick him. Okay, sure. If you want, if you want. To make the machine learning model incorporated into a sleek interface on a desktop, mobile or web app web app, then you will probably also need someone with computer expertise to connect the model to the interface. I'm a Chinese. There are two main types of machine learning. They are supervised and unsupervised. The difference is based on whether the model needs training data and training or not. Supervised machine learning requires training from historical data that includes variables and outcome. The unsupervised machine learning does not require training. There are two subtypes of supervised machine learning. They are regression and classification. With regression, the output is a number, numerical. With classification, the output is, a, is categorical, groups. The options for unsupervised machine learning are more limited. Unsupervised machine learning is mostly used for clustering outcomes into subgroups. Now, let's look at how we could use regression in craniofacial surgery. Children with sagittal craniosynostosis have narrow long heads narrow long heads is called scaphocephaly cranial index is the ratio of the width of the head to its length cranial cranial index is checked before and after the operation to assess how much the shape of the head has changed cranial index is a number so this is amenable to be an outcome in a regression machine learning model. However, as regression machine learning model requires training, we need to uh -huh. input that historical data on relevant variables such as age and operation, video. type of operation, pre cranial index, etc. and Sorry. outcomes of those respective operations. Sorry. Uh, yeah, then the software could use different algorithms to come up with a machine learning model to predict post cranial index in future for future cases. There are many algorithms available. Examples are random forest, logistic regression, neural net. You would need to decide which algorithm is best at predicting from test data that you have not used previously for training. Sorry, all going. Okay. Um, Mr. Walsh, I think I better stop here and see whether Mr. Dr. Muhammad can come in because I'm having technical problems here really interesting uh, session i would love to you want to carry it in the youtube yeah, I'll, 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 I'll carry or carry it on if you want uh, yeah that's definitely okay. nice okay sure new upcoming subject which is coming so rapidly into our lives than what we generally expect with any okay. new technology so if you can go to sure i'll, I'll carry it then okay the classification Machine learning model would be for facial shape recognition, an algorithm that rates the shape of the head. To do this, you would need to initially train the model with photos of heads, head of children, and the average score from, let's say, 10 raters. These are then input into the computer running the 
machine learning software this then produces a model you could then use this model to objectively score head shapes of future post op patients rather than needing 10 raters for each future case now let's look at possible application for unsupervised machine learning as we mentioned earlier unsupervised machine learning does not need training let's say that you have operated on 100 children with scaphoid carefully there is a variation in the post op cranial indices it would be good to figure out whether we can find subgroups based on input and the output inputs and the output this type of clustering could be used to develop grading systems currently there are many softwares out there to help with developing machine learning models many are free and others are commercial let's look at some of the free machine learning software out there all mac computers can use machine learning if you download the xcode which is free then there's a module called create ml this is the max or native machine learning software another excellent and free machine learning software is orange data mining software this is from the university of slovenia it has mac windows and linux versions available there are also excellent tutorials on this on the youtube it is powerful and it is very user friendly microsoft also has a free software called microsoft azure machine learning studio python is a free computer programming software and you can download machine learning modules which are free as well the python systems are very powerful however you will need to know basics of python programming and how to incorporate the machine learning modules into python if you are interested in using python then the book by we ming li uh, published by wiley called python machine learning is a would be an excellent starting point the commercial machine learning software i have used are excel stat and matlab excel stat is user friendly but relatively expensive you could buy it with some discount if you have an academic affiliation however it will still cost you a round trip to from uk to america however it does not allow image or photo recognition technology it is useful if the outcomes are numerical or categorical and it does allow for clustering analysis matlab is a very powerful mathematical software and with its machine learning and deep machine learning modules allow you to very powerful machine learning algorithms <coughs> every type of machine learning the back version of the file maker for night database software allows you to incorporate machine learning model into your database so when you put the relevant inputs in the fields the machine learning uh, software that's incorporated into that database that you had previously developed makes a prediction and enters the prediction in a separate field this is a very elegant solution it only works on the mac version of the file maker not on the windows version 
if you are interested in learning machine learning I would definitely recommend you to visit the tutorials on orange data mining software in YouTube the tutorials are bite size and they are excellent they will make you into a quite a expert in machine learning in this presentation I have only touched on the very basics of machine learning machine learning is a useful tool for doctors it could provide novel solutions to problems until now seemed too complex to untangle machine learning is within the reach of doctors I hope you found this presentation useful thank you and wishing you a good day bye for now that's great thank you very much I hope uh, it went through uh, do you have any questions anyone I would yeah, very interesting session definitely this is something which is it's uh, inspiring to know that it's within the reach of us doctors and neurosurgeons and uh, it is getting indispensable and definitely we need to learn about this machine learning so thank you for this uh, initiative we have taken to educate us neurosurgeons regarding this new uh, upcoming fields thanks Naren for that Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. It's actually, it's amazingly, uh, you know, basically the mathematicians and computer scientists have made it so easy to do it. Uh, I, will, I will run a workshop, you know, in a half an hour, you will be able to actually do it. You know, to be honest, it will only take about 10 minutes to take when, you, when someone takes you through it. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's all pretty much, you know, we drive a car. You know, we don't know the engineering of the car, but the engineers have done it, so we drive the car. We use the computer in the same way. The, the standard machine learning algorithms, they have made it so easy for us to use, and they are all fighting over for us to use it, and they are giving it free because that way they get us into their system. So I will, I will be happy to undertake a, a, a tutor, a live tutorial one, one of these days. That would be nice, yes. Okay. Looking nice. forward to it. Thank you. So we have got Dr. Ali Muhammad. So we can go back to that talk, to Dr. Prasad. Dr. Ali Muhammad from Syria on Strider and Silaria as initial manifestations of DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Dr. Ali Muhammad, can you please share your screen now? Hello, everyone. Hello, yeah. Hello everyone, uh, I am uh, Ali Muhammad, uh, a neurosurgery uh, resident uh, from uh, Syria. I want to uh, talk about the uh, Strider and Syria. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series. Uh, and I am in the manifestation of uh, idiopathic uh, hyperostosis, uh, skeletal uh, hyperostosis uh, dish. Uh, this, uh, also known as uh, Forrester's uh, disease, was first described uh, by Forrester and uh, Roth uh, Quarrel on uh, 19... Dr. Mohammed, uh, if you can share your screen, please. We are unable to see your presentation. Dr. Mohammed, uh, you want to share your presentation? I uh, I have seen. I think I saw your first slide some time ago when, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Went away again. If you can do the same thing again.
Is yes. it okay? Yeah. Yes, yes, it's okay now. Please go ahead. Uh, this uh, also uh, now uh, as uh, Forestier disease was first described by Forestier and Root Squirrel uh, in 1950. It is a non inflammatory disorder uh, with a known allergy which occurs among the elderly. The condition has potential associations with type 2 diabetes, obesity, hyperinsulinemia, hyperuricemia, and hypercholesterolemia. Isolated uh, predominant cervical spinal involvement may occur. The clinical manifestation uh, of a uh, dish uh, are variable. Some patients are completely uh, asymptomatic, while others complain of pain and stiffness. Fa uh, pharyngeos uh, pharyngeosophageal and tracheal compression may result in dysphagia, dyspnea, and stridor. Stridor may, may rarely occur when large anterior osteophytes arise from C2. 2C3 odinophagia and otalgia may result from pressure induced hypopharyngeal ulceration. Uh, the most widely used definition of disease was described by uh, Riznik and, and uh, Niwayama, which involves the following. Uh, one Flowing ossification along the anterior lateral aspect of at least four contiguous vertebral bodies. Two, uh, relative preservation of intervertebral disc height in the involved segment. And three, absence of apophysial joint, pony ankylosis, and sacroiliac joint erosion. Uh, in case presentation, uh, we have a 77-year-old man with a history of uh, type 2 diabetes uh, and arterial hypertension. Was referred to a, a ENT department for sialuria, uh, dysphonia, and stridor, and stridor over one year with gradually progressive uh, dysphagia involving solid food for last seven months. Physical examination and laboratory findings were unremarkable. Uh, the neurological exam was found to be normal. Flexible laryngoscopy revealed a left-sided protrusion in the posterior uh, hypopharyngeal wall. Vocal cord mobility was normal. The left Form, uh, sinus of the hypopharynx was uh, narrowed by the protruding wall and saliva pulled within it. Deflection of uh, barium and a uh, neuroid esophagus at C3, C4, C5 was observed in video fluoroscopy. X ray computed tomography and uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging uh, MRI of the cervical spine demonstrated multi-level anterior cervical osteophytes at C3 uh, to T1 uh, without disc degeneration. The largest uh, measuring uh, 23 millimeter at the level of C3 and C4. Figure one consistent with a diagnosis of uh, DISH. Uh, here we can see uh, a CT scan of uh, the cervical spine demonstrated multi-level anterior cervical osteophytes at C3 to T1 without disc degeneration. The largest measuring 23 millimeter at the level of C3 and C4 consistent 
with a diagnosis of dish. The anterior displacement and a blockage of uh, esophagus due to the enlarged osteophyte. Compression effect of osteophytes with no other abnormalities was found on endoscopic examination. Sacroiliac joints and apophysial joints were intact laboratory tests were normal and MRI didn't reveal soft tissue mass or abnormal signal, uh, signal change. Therefore, the diagnosis of ankylosis bondylitis infection and malignancy were ruled out. Uh, the clinical symptoms increased rapidly, hence urgent surgery using uh, excision of osteophytes performed through an anterior lateral approach. The surgery was done under microscope. We were able to achieve satisfactory exposure through a horizontal incision. I'm able to move to the next slide, is it? I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, were, uh, we were able to achieve uh, satisfactory exposure through a horizontal incision. There were no adhesions with the esophagus and there were no problems with the, the surgical approach. To remove osteophytes, we use a high speed drill. Osteophytes on peak were removed from C3, C4, C5 vertebras, which have the most compression effect. No fusion. Standard uh, suturing was used, sterile dressing. The symptoms uh, improved gradually and the uh, dysphagia had completely resolved after two months. A post-operative cervical X-ray revealed the clearance of the C2 and C3 vertebras from the osteophytes with decompressed esophagus. We can see here a uh, post-operative cervical X-ray revealed uh, the clearance of uh, the C3, C4, and C5 vertebras from the osteophytes with decompressed esophagus. In discussion, uh, diffused idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis dish for steer disease is a uh, condition characterized by calcification and ossification of ligaments and entoses affecting the vertebral column. The level of osteophytes has been suggested to correlate with the uh, presenting symptoms. Lower cervical vertebra osteophytes at the level of C4 to C6 can embank can impinge on the esophagus and the upper cervical spine osteophyte can impinge more uh, on the uh, oropharynx, resulting in respiratory compromise and tridal. Differential diagnosis, bondylite deformance, enclosing yes, bondylite uh, uh, acromegaly, uh, hippobaritheroidism, uh, fluorosis, uh, uh, ochronosis, uh, retinoid uh, trauma, and uh, x linked uh, hippophosphatemic uh, osteomalacia. 
Stridor may be a rare manifestation of the large C2, C3 anterior osteophyte, while point pressure between osteophytes and the posterior uh, cricoid cartilage results in hypopharyngeal ulceration causing odinophagia. Uh, treatment for this is based on symptomatic relief of symptoms. Osteophytectomy alone might be a good option in elderly patients, but regarding the recurrence of dysphagia for patients uh, who less than uh, 70 years old, uh, simple resection without fusion will be an issue. Some studies reported that instrumented fusion not Warranted. Whereas uh, other suggested fusion with instability is apparent. In the case of radiculopathy or myelopathy due to a single level osteophyte, uh, concomitant uh, discectomy and fusion might become necessary. In conclusion, in conclusion uh, I want to say Sialoria and Tridor caused by DISH, rarely reported, but in order to avoid delay in the diagnosis and the treatment, physicians, especially gastroenterologists, uh, ENT, and spine surgeons should be aware of DISH as a potential cause of these symptoms. Resection of anterior cervical osteophytes is considered to be highly effective in symptomatic patients. You can see uh, here uh, the references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. That was an interesting presentation of DISH presenting with um, dysphagia and strider. So, true, that's one of the rare presentations and that can be, as you rightly showed, managed by osteophysic, osteophysectomy, um, which definitely physically removes the obstruction and creates a, a clear pathway for uh, relief of strider. Thank you. Any questions? We have, yeah. We have one question from Dr. Harshad Parikh asking how often or what's the incidence of this in cervical spine? Dr. Mohammed, if you can throw some light on this if any of your references had incidents mentioned or the, how often it is encountered. Uh, that is uh, that is very rare. Yeah. It's quite a rare presentation. So if we can move to the only presentation left of the session from Dr. Allah Sulaiman, if he is there, ready with his presentation. Dr. Sulaiman. I think I can't see him. Uh, 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 I can't see him, uh, um, Dr. Prasad. So I think okay. we have to... So that concludes the session. Do we have any other presentation, Naren? Uh, um, we'll, we'll have a short break, about 30 minutes, then we will have our functional neurosurgery and the neurotrauma session start then. So I'd like to thank um, Mr. Daniel Walsh and Mr. Dr. Uh, Prasad for uh, steering this um, session um, so well. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry for the technical problems that we had, uh, but uh, sometimes this uh, uh, internet uh, does play up. 
but uh, you know, we had a great session and we have got in the afternoon we have got a lecture from dr michael schulder on um, update on uh, the dbs for uh, movement disorders then a two hour session on head injuries um, uh, up to the, the state of the art management of head injuries and then we have got a session on pediatric neurosurgery but it's very general in the sense that it's nine speakers talking on how to improve outcomes so you're all very welcome it will be the same uh, web link so i hope i look forward to um, meeting you soon i'll just check whether dr shoulder is in okay so it should be in half an hour's time thank you very much everyone thanks thank you much. thank you Madam. thank you thanks. very much thanks thank you mr
Hello, Dr. Andrews, can you hear me? Dr. Andrews, can you hear me? Dr. Andrews? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, the, fabulous, you... fabulous. Sorry, my, my computer is <clears throat> brilliant, thanks. Um, do, you, do you want to see whether you are able to share your presentation, Dr. Andrews? Okay. Oops. Sorry, it's uh, the middle of the night here, so. Oh. Oh dear, sorry about that. Not much light here. <laughs> oh. That's a, a backdrop. Uh, yeah, I can share screen. Oh, it says advanced sharing options, only host or all participants. So I guess there should be all participate. No, let me see. Sounds like maybe you need to do something first. Um, I have said, uh, I have given you permission to share. You should be. It's asking who can share only host all participants. That's advanced sharing options. Let me close that again. Um, and let me go back. If you click on the green button. Yeah, it's what I did. Share screen. Oh, okay. What's that. That's good. You're seeing that now yeah. by, you're okay there? Yeah, thanks. Okay. That's brilliant. Good. That's great, excellent. So this will go at, uh, well, roughly one o'clock your time. Yeah, so it will be in cup in uh, in eight minutes, so it'll be. Sounds good, I can. Thanks. Uh, I think this is the problem in the, we have, in terms of the because of the west coast is by the time west coast wakes up usually it's uh, we, in england we are almost finishing our day yeah and uh, and the asia is already deep at night um, it's the uh, west coast uh, i've always been uh, not to put people on the west coast so so we have I haven't invited so many people from West Coast because of uh, I know that it will be in the early in the morning. It's uh, how this uh, how this technology changes the whole yeah whole dynamics of the world, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you've certainly been uh, very active getting people together. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thanks, thank you. We have got oh. Dr. Andrew Reisner here as well. Hello, Dr. Reisner. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you've you've met each other. Yes, I think we met at uh, in. Uh, yes, we've in, met. We've met. I, I think we did. We meet in uh, in Athens, uh, Doctor Eisner. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. Yes. Yes, uh, yes we did. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I morning. It was, it was at the ENS conference. Uh, the uh, it was ENS conference. Yes. Excellent. What are you doing today? Sorry? What are you doing today? Oh, myself. Uh, so, sorry, who am I sp speaking? Is it Dr. Go who's speaking? Yeah, it's okay, but uh, what are you doing today? Uh, so, sorry, I don't know who's talking, sorry. Who's talking? I actually like you today. Where are you from? Just mm -hmm. a second, just a second. Uh, we are having some problems today, Dr. Andrews. 
what do you call i think we, we have had a couple of uh, zoom bomb bombings mm. which is a bit um unfortunate yeah when, which does make life a bit extremely difficult so just brief interruptions or what mm, yeah this is the second one yeah, i'm seeing the screen presently uh, you are seeing you can see your presentation yes it's not too... <sighs> it's Is there a problem on your end? Should it be reloaded? Uh, no, your side is fine. No, it's a, uh, uh, I can't see yours okay, but uh, there has been um, twice interruptions. Um, and if that happens, I have to send um, a new link to everyone. Ah, okay, well. I hope... Uh, no, I guess you'll notify us if that's necessary. Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry about this. Uh... And you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yeah. Oops. Uh, yes, I yeah. so just a few more minutes. Sure. Oops. But it's getting lunch. Uh, I, I thought that we had a, I kept a, a half an hour break, but we finished on time. Um, good. I'm just patrolling Dr. Um, Andrews to see any any other problems that's so. Sure. Good, the time is now one o'clock. Welcome back to the afternoon uh, session of the World Neurosurgery Webinar Conference. We have had fantastic talks. And uh, we have got a uh, three uh, fabulous uh, sessions. Um, we have got the first one is on neurotrauma, and we might get a, a, a talk in functional neurosurgery in the middle of that. That's uh, I apologize for that, but it's my scheduling. And then we will have the pediatric session. I just want to warn all of you from the outset. Uh, um, we have had two. Um, uh, uh, Zoom interruptions by people who uh, were not meant to be in the meeting. Um, if that happens, I will once again try to uh, remove. I will remo remove them, and um, so please bear with me. If there's any further problem, then I, I will give you another Zoom 
new Zoom link and we have to have to go there, but hopefully it doesn't come to that, but I'll keep an eye on it. So without further ado, I want to open the neurotrauma uh, uh, symposium. Uh, this is uh, from uh, our colleagues uh, who are leaders in this field. Uh, the program has been put together by Professor Tariq Khan, I really thank him and all the distinguished speakers um, uh, who have kindly agreed to give this uh, their talks at this uh, session. So we are all really great, greatly looking forward to this uh, talks and Dr. Russell Andrews uh, uh, is going to uh, talk to us about uh, nanotechnology and neurotrauma. Dr. Andrews uh, does not need introduction. He's uh, uh, been a a great contributor to WFNS and education around the world and taught at many of the courses. And he is not only a neurosurgeon, but has been working with advanced technology from, uh, from early days uh, and with NASA and now nanotechnology. So Dr. Russell Andrews, uh, it's a real privilege to have you here and look, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, 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 thank you very much, Naren. <clears throat> I want to uh, thank you for putting together another broad uh, conference that really covers the gamut of neurosurgery. And I want to say at the outset, uh, this, tech, this talk will not uh, assist anyone in uh, dealing with their next neurotrauma patient in the emergency room, but I hopefully give you a look at where we might be in five or 10 years, uh, some of the uh, new techniques that are on the horizon. And I should stress that they're not, um, this is not intraoperative MRI, uh, nanotechniques, uh, kind of like the vaccines we'll talk about at the very end briefly, um, or really for the, for the, the, the world, uh, they will not be terribly expensive. So with that, I'll uh, move ahead. Yes, I need to click to advance. Well, we talk about nanotechnology. If you look at the upper uh, right there, a, a four-year-old child is roughly a meter high. Uh, a red blood cell is about 10 microns in diameter, and then you get down to a virus, the nano level or one billionth of a meter. The interesting thing though, is the technology involves uh, processing atom or molecule at a time rather than cutting things smaller as we do as surgeons. The two big ideas I'm gonna to stress today are one, uh, nano scaffolds as a supporting system for nano repair and modulating neuroinflammation to optimize recovery. And we're all familiar with, uh, this is an example of spinal cord injury, uh, what happens with cyst formation, gliosis, uh, the myelin breakdown, and you need to regenerate the axons. Well, what does the Sydney Opera House have to do with neuro repair? You can see the scaffolding that was put up to uh, build the Opera House. And if you look on the left, there's the Opera House scaffold, and on the right is a bio scaffold that can be used to uh, enhance neuro regeneration. And these hydrogels can be delivered uh, in this, ex this example for intracerebral hemorrhage and uh, a very clinical uh, application in the lab. These are rodents that were, underwent intracerebral hemorrhage and then aspiration of the hematoma and then three treatment groups, uh, nothing being done, saline injected in the cavity or a self-assembling uh, nano scaffold consisting of four uh, um, amino acids that self-assemble into this clear liquid that actually has a very interesting hemostatic process uh, capabilities as well. You can operate through this. Uh, it's kind of like uh, between a gel and water. And if you look at the, just the columns on the right there, um, the, the various treatment groups, uh, neutrophils can be reduced just by aspirating a hematoma, but microglia and macrophages to reduce those acutely uh, requires uh, this self-assembling scaffold and apoptosis similarly is, is more significantly reduced. And the, the bottom line, these animals uh, had improvement in their clinical function uh, a couple of months after uh, the injury when the nano scaffold was injected. Another uh, example, uh, these are uh, rodents who actually undergo, they're made blind by a cut in the superior colliculus. And if you just focus on ENF, that's one month after injury. E being the control, F being where this nano scaffold liquid is injected. And three quarters of these animals actually had functional return of vision. That's pretty impressive. Uh, similar study, uh, this time using uh, manganese to enhance MRI. That's uh, manganese that will co collect uh, 
that's a area of uh, injury. And if you just focus on the bottom, uh, the left the D is just the intact uh, optic tract and sphere colliculus. The center is with the cut and the collection of the manganese in the optic tract at the lesion injury. And then the rebridging with the nano scaffold having been injected across uh, the area of injury. This can also be used in uh, peripheral uh, nerve or uh, uh, potentially spinal cord injury. This is a, a one millimeter gap, or sorry, one centimeter gap. And C and D are these uh, the one where the gap is, uh, it, this nano scaffold is injected into the conduit versus water or saline, I'm sorry. Uh, and you can see the difference in the fiber formation between the two. And this can be quantified as we see here with uh, many more axons formed in this uh, um, hydrogel. Uh, Got to give you a little background on uh, nano techniques. Uh, before we can go, go to the next stage here. Uh, this group took just standard electrodes, uh, tungsten or platinum as we use in DBS, for example, coated them with carbon nanotubes to greatly increase the area, surface area, and they resulted in a decrease in impedance and increase in capacitance, which are very marked. That improves the charge transfer, so you can record much more sensitively and stimulate without causing electrolysis. Uh, but we can go far beyond just the uh, carbon nanotube coatings uh, with these conducting polymers, uh, PDOT and polyperol being the two uh, ones used most clinically. And a NASA group, uh, boy, over a decade ago showed that uh, by coating with this polyperol, you can greatly increase the capacitance and decrease the impedance. And this is several years of work of the NASA group. Uh, these are PC12 cells, which uh, some of you have gotten into the research end a little bit may know that it's interesting from a functional neurosurgery standpoint, they can secrete dopamine in the right conditions. But they're growing on these nano um, arrays, nanofiber arrays, basically carbon nanotubes. And in the bottom left, you see two views uh, without the polypearl coating and on the right with the coating. And these can actually, uh, as you see in the bottom right, they can penetrate the cell wall and you can was actually a whole separate talk on uh, what you might call intracellular uh, endoscopy. You could actually look inside the cell without damaging it. Well, this is an electrode that the NASA is working on with the Mayo Clinic. Um, you can see it's uh, about a tenth of a millimeter in diameter with these six uh, individually addressed pads that are 50 by 25 microns. They can be used for both electrical recording and stimulating. Uh, very precisely, but also recording either dopamine or serotonin uh, neurotransmitters as well. And if you look at the left-hand side, uh, this is a, a hippocampal slice, and just showing you can record with a much lower current threshold from uh, once from CA3 to CA1, uh, stimulate with a much lower current threshold than you can with a standard electrode when it's coated with this uh, uh, nano array with polypyrrole. And on the right, to look at neurotransmitters, uh, standard carbon uh, fiber electrodes really can't distinguish amino acids. Uh, when you have um, dopamine and serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine in the presence of ascorbic acid, which is ubiquitous in the brain, but with a nano electrode, you can really detect if there's variations in the concentration of either serotonin or uh, dopamine. So with that little bit of background, there's a very interesting study that's been done by a group in uh, Beijing where they're taking uh, a very similar uh, to, to what I showed you previously, a, a, a scaffold uh, to inject a current to enhance uh, a recovery of uh, neurons. And this has been well known that the appropriate electric currents can be beneficial, but they've developed, a, uh, as you see in the center, uh, a anode and cathode, the anode having a platinum um, nanoparticles and the cathode, these carbon nanotubes. And in between is polypyrrole hydrogel, basically. Um, and as you see in the next slide, if you look at the upper one, they took, these are PC12 cell dorsal root ganglion cells and showed, uh, as the graph shows, a significant increase in the neurite length um, uh, with the uh, uh, this passing of electrical stimulus uh, from anode to cathode uh, through this uh, nano uh, scaffold, so to speak. And uh, in the bottom, you see that you could actually, uh, there's a 15 millimeter gap 
uh, and we'll show the regenerations you see uh, in this next slide. Um, the top being before applying the uh, uh, electrical current and the bottom being with that electrical current and then graphing at the bottom the increase in the myelin sheath and the average diameter of the axons. But uh, again, clinically, uh, you can see in the bottom right that graph, this uh, sciatic function index, zero is normal function, 100 is basically paralysis in the, in the, in the spinal, uh, in the uh, injury. And there's sig more significant recovery when you pass the current through this array than uh, without it. So moving to an uh, area that some of you may be a little more familiar with, uh, we can talk about stem cells. That's basically getting down to the nano level and how we can enhance that for nano recovery. Uh, first, we ought to look at the sequence of time after, say, spinal cord injury. You get the acute inflammation with the M1 or bad macrophages and inflammatory cytokines. And then later on, uh, there's the M2 or, or good macrophages, microglia, and uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines. And as we see in the upper right, uh, it's really a peak at about a week in the acute inflammation. And this doesn't return to normal until uh, up to two months after injury. And uh, just to bring home this point of the pro and family inflammatory acute phase versus anti-inflammatory. And the question is, what, is the, the, what are the glia cells doing that uh, alter the the situation between acute and uh, chronic situations or pro-inflammatory and inflammatory. Um, as we see here, uh, the acute macrophages tend to come, they're released from the spleen. The anti-inflammatory or later macrophages tend to come from the bone marrow or are locally recruited in spinal cord injury or uh, central nervous system uh, trauma as well. Um, this is an interesting study where they use carbon nano, or I'm sorry, uh, nanoparticles to attach to the circulating immune cells and try to get them to move in the directions where you'll enhance the recovery. And as we see, if you just look at the sketches in the bottom or the illustrations, this is an uninjured uh, spinal cord on the left uh, and showing the uptake of the uh, microglia, microglia in the uh, spleen. You add the nanoparticles and there's uptake back into the spleen. And then um, with the injury, there's obviously some of the uh, uh, macrophages go to the area of injury. But uh, what's important, again, is the clinical function. Um, as you see in the upper right, on the basso mouse scale, where a higher score is more recovery. And you see more recovery with this injection of the nanoparticles to direct the uh, uh, macrophages, uh, microglia in the appropriate directions. We'll turn out a clinical trials in spinal cord injury with uh, stem cells. Uh, the biggest trials, as you know, are in, in China and India, but uh, really quite worldwide over the last couple of decades. Uh, injection usually is intramedullary or intrathecal in about a third of the cases each. Um, most studies have not had rehabilitation in China in particular. They have a very intense rehabilitation. That's probably uh, sadly, that, that may be the main reason they show some modest improvement. Um, there are all types of stem cells, as you know, the neural, mesenchymal, embryonic, et cetera. But one of the questions is how, how does the stem cells result in improvement? And there's this question of exosomes or basically transport mechanism, uh, which we'll talk about in just a couple of minutes, uh, really key to the benefit of stem cells. Um, but as you see here in the clinical trials, there's been a drop off in new trials for uh, stem cells and spinal cord injury, probably because of the very marginal benefit we've seen in the vast majority of the trials to date. So it's been rather disappointing. Situation, as you see here in uh, TBI, is a little more encouraging. Uh, these were uh, mesenchymal stem cells stereotactically injected into uh, patients who had undergone TBI. And as you see here, uh, the Flugel Meyer scale, 100 points for. Uh, uh, motor function. Um, a 10 point improvement is you know, modest. It's uh, clinically significant, but not overwhelming. But they did find that uh, the mesenchymal stem cell injected group uh, has done better. These are in humans. So this is somewhat encouraging. Uh, when we talk about stem cells, the source uh, for mesenchymal, usually the bone marrow. And obviously, we're most interested as far as outcome um, enhancing neural cell growth. 
and the basic technique um, and the mechanisms of presumed uh, benefit from this are outlined here. I won't read through this, um, but you see it's meant to be or intended to be benefit both proximal uh, at the site of injury in the spinal cord and distally uh, various mechanisms. And one of those uh, is very likely these uh, chemokines or chemotactic cytokines that are, can be enhanced by mesenchymal stem, stem cells. Uh, you can see in the upper right, the uh, salt solution control day three and day 14 and the mesenchymal stem cells at day 14, there's considerably less scarring. And you can see the microglia and macrophages clustering uh, both at the injection site, which is near the injury site. But again, in the bottom left, the bottom line is a, uh, this basso mouse scale. There was significant improvement in the animals that had the uh, mesenchymal stem cells injected. Uh, I mentioned exosomes. These are basically transport vehicles, uh, usually a, bi a lipid bilator containing uh, proteins, nucleic acids, or enzymes, and carrying them from one cell to another. They allow things uh, such as proteins to get uh, through the nervous system, for example, or the body. Uh, without getting destroyed or digested. And they're really hit the big time now. You can see they've been exosomes or extra uh, cellular vesicles uh, for cardiac repair, wound healing, tumor treatment, autoimmunity, TBI, uh, even disc disease and COVID. And again, to illustrate the basic mechanism here, you incorporates uh, whatever you want to transport uh, into the, say, the nervous system for repair um, into this uh, vesicle. And one study, which is uh, just ongoing now, is combining lipid uh, extracellular vesicles or, or exosomes in a hydrogel for sustained release of whatever this protein or, say, nucleic acid that you want to deliver into the nervous system. Um, going one step beyond that, just to show you how clever people are getting, uh, this group in Korea, uh, exosome mimetic nanovesicles, basically taking mesenchymal stem cells, fusing them with the membrane from macrophage to enhance the uptake into the area of injury. That's one of the problems, obviously, when you inject a spinal cord with stem cells, is getting those cells to go to the area of injury. And so this is one way around that. And here you see one of their uh, uh, in vivo studies. Uh, in the upper left, uh, the gross injury uh, with um, no treatment and then uh, with the nanovesicles and then this membrane, macrophage membrane enhanced uh, nanovesicles, uh, significantly better improvement. And again, in the basso mouse scale, the best uh, recovery was in that group. Um, I'll just uh, finish up, uh, we're all so in concerned with the uh, COVID situation. You are familiar with the uh, virus and the spike proteins and the mechanism of infection here, basically the virus getting into the cell, replicating um, and then ex ex uh, exocytosing uh, many more viri. And um, the mRNA-based vaccines of Moderna and Pfizer basically are a lipid uh, exosome uh, containing the messenger RNA so you can get it into the cell and disrupt that reproductive process. So this is, uh, uh, as you see in the upper left there, it's just a sketch of a bilipid uh, exosome with uh, messenger RNA incorporated to allow it to get into the, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the cells uh, to avoid the replication of the virus. So with that, uh, I'd just like to reinforce the two main points here, these nano scaffolds that can really guide axonal regeneration uh, quite dramatically, and nanoparticles that can optimize the inflammatory response and improve the stem cell uh, efficacy, for example. Uh, in conclusion, for the younger people who may have some interest in this basic uh, science, um, the NASA group's been very appreciative of people like myself becoming clinicians because they're basic scientists, but they have educational programs and uh, here we see uh, on the top, there's uh, two uh, graduate students from the University of Puerto Rico who spent several summers at NASA Ames and their nanotechnology group. In the bottom right is a woman who was an undergraduate at MIT at the time. They've had uh, Mohammed Rod did his master's thesis work from EPFL in Switzerland uh, for six months. Uh, there are uh, people from uh, Spain, um, Portugal, uh, Finland, who have actually been at NASA for several years now, and some of them actually get jobs. I'll finish with um, 
if you look at the upper left there, this is another person uh, was a young, actually a high school student, Ruchi Pandya, who spent some time at NASA and developed a uh, nano uh, uh, sensor for troponin, uh, presumably for the space program to detect cardiac ischemia in space, but it could work here on earth for a dollar a test. And uh, they want, her project won a White House Science Award a few years ago when just before uh, President Obama finished his term, she was actually uh, paid by her, uh, when she entered Caltech, they paid for her to go to this meeting of EPFL uh, in Switzerland uh, every November. Um, it's a great forum for anybody who's interested in, in learning about uh, nanotechniques for uh, biological applications. And uh, a lot of students there, uh, uh, really a wonderful meeting. And with that, I'll conclude. I've probably gone over time, but uh, anybody who's interested, let me know. Uh, we can get you uh, in touch with the people at uh, NASA Ames who could uh, get you involved in their programs. And again, I want to thank Naren for his uh, wonderful organization. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Dr. Russell Andrews, that's a fascinating talk, and is really, you know, we have to thank you for um, uh, keeping us uh, uh, at in base with these new technologies, because these are, uh, I think, in 5, 10, 15 years' time, how like how internet initially when it started, no one ever thought, you know, we thought it was just a toy, and then started to dominate our lives, and I'm sure this is what's going to happen with nanotechnology and it's important for neurosurgeons to uh, be aware of this uh, and hopefully make use of it um, yeah i just wanted to just say i mean the the, the success of these mrna vaccines for COVID is uh, mm -hmm. a good example of uh, that's basically you know these nano exosomes uh, have really been key to uh, fighting this pandemic Absolutely. Dr. Michael Schulder, you are there. You are keen on uh, technology. Do you have any comments, Dr. Schulder? Uh, you are mute. You are mute, Dr. Schulder. You are mute. No. Uh, ah, thank you for unmuting me. Yes, sure. Um, oh, sure. The, all I would say is that um, for the occasional neurosurgeon like Dr. Andrews, who has the expertise and the knowledge and the patience and the curiosity to get involved in this, this is how to drive neurosurgical technology forward. It takes a long time to, for something to come into clinical fruition, whether it's uh, actually surgical or not. And of course, there are blind alleys that inevitably we go and down through, but we all have to be involved in this and, and embrace this. I, I've, I've had my own share of things that haven't panned out, but I haven't stopped trying. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And the, in, uh, in um, certainly, the, I suppose the functional neurosurgery will be the first one to, to embrace these technologies. Uh, that's brilliant. Thanks. Um, uh, and uh, um, anyone else has any questions for uh, Dr. Um, Williams, if you could just put it on the chat box. Um, the next uh, talk was meant to be uh, Professor Sina, but I'm just going to ask Dr. Sina a small favor. Uh, there's a small, uh, 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 it's my fault in terms of the schedule. I'm just going, to, is it okay, Dr. Sina, if I go with Dr. Michael Schulder's talk? Yeah. Because he's uh, he has, uh, clinical commitment and I had, okay. uh, is that, I, I really am grateful for that. Uh, Dr. Schulter, I'll get you to share it. Okay. Um, let me, uh, right. let me make you, that's it. Okay. Dr. Slavin. Right. Oh, okay. That's so you should, you should be able to. Right. Are you sharing my screen? Uh, okay. How's this? Yep. It's coming. Yep. Okay, so you should see my first slide? Yes, we can, yeah. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Sinha. Thank you, Dr. Naran Tiran, for again, your amazing organization and for the invitation and asking me to give an update about deep brain stimulation for movement disorders. Uh, I am wearing a lab coat and scrubs. It, it is not a prop. Uh, I do indeed uh, have to do some surgery uh, this morning, but uh, that, will not and has not stopped me from, from giving this talk, and I, I'm grateful for the invitation. 
So uh, this is a timeline from a paper that several colleagues and I published in uh, Nature Reviews Neurology last year uh, as part of a series of papers about the history and then advancement of DBS technology. Uh, and this paper, as you can see, was specifically focused on DBS of, of the whole IPG and, and its functionality. So this has been a 74 year process up to now. And if you just look at this, uh, if you're not familiar completely with the history, you'll see this has been an incremental evolution of technology, but hardly static. And even over the last, from the half point of this technology, when DBS really became a practical reality in the late 1980s, there have been many advances since then, and they're going to increase, and the resurgence really need to be a part of that. So just a nod to history. This all began with the coinage of the term stereotaxi by Victor Horsley and the, and the whole concept of what we now call stereotactic neurosurgery and that's his original frame designed for animal experimentation. Uh, Spiegel and Weiss, it took them 39 years later for someone to introduce the concept of stereotaxis into human surgery. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my mentor and then friend, Dr. Philip Gilderberg, who passed uh, last year and really kept the light of stereotactic neurosurgery burning for years when very few people were doing it. And it was because of this. Uh, here's George Kutsias, who won a Nobel Prize for the implementation of L-DOPA as a treatment for patients with Parkinson's disease. And what happened as a result was that functional neurosurgery tanked, uh, as we say, because that was the main indication for functional neurosurgery, which was all lesioning at the time in the 1960s. It was, it was to treat what we would now call advanced Parkinson's disease. So we saw a peak uh, in that in the mid 60s and then uh, almost nothing in the 1970s. And that continued for practically speaking another 20 years. What revived uh, the practice of stereotactic functional neurosurgery was lesioning. And this was a, a key paper and a key project uh, out of Umeå in Sweden, uh, Lori Leitonen, the late Lori Leitonen, uh, of course, the first author, Marwan Hariz, who, who I believe is uh, on the faculty of the webinar, was the senior author and still very active in stereotactic neurosurgery. And they said, well, you know, L-DOPA is great, but it stops working after a while. Let's revisit those surgical treatments. And they went back to the work of Lexell and showed again themselves that pallidotomy was a very effective treatment for pa select patients with Parkinson's disease. Although only unilateral, the bilateral lesioning of the pallidum, like of the thalamus, uh, can be and often is very morbid. So this was going on even while. Uh, Dr. Benabid in Grenoble was really developing practical DBS and, and showed that, that DBS can alleviate tremor in patients with Parkinson's disease and with essential tremor. Then of course, uh, uh, work progressed to include uh, uh, DBS of the, uh, of the pallidum and of the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, so this is what we would today call conventional, so to speak, deep brain stimulation all looked very high tech just a few years ago. This would be with a stereotactic frame, a surgical plan using a surgical navigation station. Uh, in this case, uh, the stealth station, but it could be uh, any other commercial platform. If you have a homegrown platform, uh, that even better. Local anesthesia to allow for patient testing, intraoperative imaging with fluoroscopy and tracking electrodes with fluoroscopy uh, and with physiological feedback and the surgeon involved in examining the patient, that, uh, in this case, me. Um, and we correlate all the information, the microelectric recording, the surgical plan, the fluoro fluoroscopy to confirm that our electrode, uh, our, in this case, our microelectrode is in the correct location. And then we place the DBS electrode there. 
Uh, if you're going to do that under local anesthesia, then doing macro stimulation, especially through the implanted DBS electrode, is very easy to confirm efficacy as well as to rule out side effects. And this is certainly not the time and the place where we can resolve this debate about uh, MER versus macro stimulation. Even after decades, it still goes on. MER and uh, microelectrode stimulation has the advantage of precision and, and really excellent physiology, identifying individual cells um, and uh, precise location of side effects, not overestimating anything, but of course you can therefore underestimate those risks. When you're passing a small nano needle, like, or I guess it's a micro needle, uh, through the brain, there is a risk of bleeding. This has been demonstrated in multiple reviews uh, and single cohort studies that there's a higher risk of a parenchymal hematoma from MER, and it, it takes longer. Uh, so those are the downsides of it. Whereas with macro stim, you, there are great benefits because you can confirm efficacy of placement and avoidance of side effects, but you are identifying areas or volumes so you may overestimate the utility of a location and may decay over time later on. And likewise, uh, you may overestimate the chance of side effects and end up uh, unnecessarily replacing an electrode. So that's where we are in that MER and macro stim uh, debate. And as I'll discuss in a minute, some people have completely leapfrogged over that whole issue. What is somewhat dismaying and surprising looking at the most common movement disorders treated with DBS, namely, Parkinson's disease and essential tremor is that the efficacy of DBS for Parkinson's disease tends to last over many years, which is counterintuitive because it's a progressive disease. Why would the DBS benefit continue to last? Whereas essential tremor, which is, we think, well, it's benign essential tremor. That's also part of its medical name and not necessarily a progressive condition. And yet the efficacy of DBS for the central tremor in almost all studies wanes over time, wanes quite a bit to the point where electrodes have to be replaced or a second electrode inserted and so on. So that's, that is where we are today. There's no question that they work in the short term. The question is uh, over the long term. So <clears throat> I'd like to talk about technical advances in DBS surgery and in DBS technology, starting first with the surgery itself. Again, this may all look very high-tech recently, but uh, we're, we're passing out of that era. So one of the questions that is being examined is the re relative need for local versus general anesthesia. And I confess to me, it doesn't make quite sense because in other kinds of surgery, in tumor surgery, and even in cerebrovascular open surgery, there's a move to doing so th those cases with patients awake, and yet here with uh, DBS where the patients are usually older and debilitated by their condition, yes, even with the central tremor, we're talking about doing it asleep and giving up the advantages of, uh, of awake surgery in those patients. Uh, nonetheless, there are no quite a number of papers now that show that there is no increased morbidity to doing uh, to using full general anesthesia for DBS uh, implantation in patients with PD uh, and ET. The nice thing about this paper here from Rick Sherman's group, he'll be quoted a lot uh, in this talk, is that it was testing one thing, simply anesthesia. And the patients all had MER guidance. There were no other variables, no intraoperative imaging, nothing like that that they were looking at. For. And they did find that uh, it, there was no difference in outcomes in the patients who had a sleep surgery and that their own report of the experience was much better. Now, there are different ways of placing the DBS electrode in addition to a stereotactic frame uh, and moving beyond so-called frameless technology. There is robotic insertion and then there's the use of different imaging technologies such as uh, an intraoperative CT uh, to place them. Looking specifically at the robot, this was a nice meta-analysis from Thomas Jefferson U University, which showed uh, that looking 
over a variety of, of reports that robotic assisted stereotaxy primarily for DBS surgery was uh, very accurate. And what I, I think this is a very nice cartoon that they made because for anyone who doubts the highly technical nature of DBS surgery, just look at this. Look at all these points where something, it, if it's not done right, can go wrong. Your imaging, how you, how you plan your surgery and image registration, et cetera, looking out for brain shift from pneumocephalus, making sure the robot is properly set up, physiology, lead, lead subsidence afterwards. There, this is the most technical surgery uh, practically that we do in neurosurgery. This paper from China looked at outcomes and accuracy of DBS placement for uh, patients with Parkinson's disease using a robot. Uh, and they found that unsurprisingly in the patients who had surgery uh, asleep, the, uh, the surgery was much shorter and the patients recovered uh, more quickly and more easily. Uh, of course, another form, perhaps the holy grail of intraoperative imaging remains using intraoperative MRI. This was the project begun in UCSF over a decade ago and their first report, they showed that uh, in nearly half of the patients, lead placement was done uh, in these patients with Parkinson's disease based on intraoperative imaging. No physiology done, the patients were under anesthesia and they were aiming for the dorsolateral STN. In a follow-up uh, to this paper, uh, the author showed that the clinical outcomes were as good when you do uh, a sleep placement without physiology uh, into the STN for patients with Parkinson's disease. So going against those decades of experience. This paper from Emory uh, is interesting because they compared intraoperative MRI to MER pl guided placement. Of, uh, of electrodes for patients with Parkinson's disease. And of course, the surgery was, was quicker uh, in the uh, MRI-guided cases. And there was no difference in outcome uh, between the, the techniques. The side effects, the need for revision, all were unchanged between the two groups. So this is yet another argument for intraoperative imaging over MER-based physiology. What's uh, interesting in this paper was when they show where the electrodes were located in post-operative MRI and, uh, and, and mapped uh, in this three-dimensional plot, you can see just how all over the place the electrodes are, even with the starting point in the postrolateral uh, GPI. Uh, so it just shows that even with the most care and the most technological uh, uh, beans that you might have at your disposable, there's still quite a good deal of variability in where your electrodes may end up. Now, intraoperative CT was really first demonstrated in a serious way for DBS placement by Kim Virtual and his group uh, in 2013. And they were using a serotome, a small portable CT. And again, uh, just to confirm, um, based on registration to preoperative MRI that the electrode was in the right location. And again, this was done with that MER and the patients were asleep and uh, only one electrode was replaced on an intraoperative image, just the targeting alone was accurate. Uh, the serotome images the brain itself, which is the O-arm doesn't. The O-arm is basically a three-dimensional uh, fluoroscopic C-arm. Uh, but by imaging the location of the electrode and then registering to your MRI, you can confirm with a device like this that your electrode's in the desired location, just like with an intraoperative MRI, but you could argue with a lot less hassle, certainly with a lot less expense. Uh, and the authors show that the accuracy was comparable to a fiducial-based uh, navigation for DBS placement and the errors are well within tolerance for uh, DBS surgery. So again, from this paper of ours from uh, Nature Reviews Neurology, uh, looking, we propose different ways in which the technology of the DBS itself, not the surgical technique, but the DBS technology uh, is being improved and needs to be improved in the future. 
The most obvious of these is the use of so-called directional leads or steerable uh, electrodes, which rather than giving simply an oval stimulation uh, area or uh, a, a VTA around the electrode, you can uh, use the electrodes uh, or the contacts with the electrode to shape and to direct your stimulation field. So this is a very simple cartoon uh, from uh, my friend Rick Sherman, who I said would be quoted a lot, showing the concept of, of steering. It's all very well. You're directly in the STN and you get your typical oval stimulation. That's good. What if you're a millimeter or two outside? You can avoid side effects by steering back into the STN using the steerable electrode. Uh, and it's not simply going side to side or certainly not just going up and down. You can use interleaving programming techniques, multiple levels, and then directionality with really quite complex electrodes with dozens of contacts. Uh, and yet in, in real world terms, when it comes down to it, oftentimes these features may not be used. Uh, the authors looked at the number of times that either directional steering or using a slower pulse width to stimulate uh, was used in their patients. Uh, with various diagnoses, and over half of the time, it was none. They used conventional programming and conventional stimulation. Uh, and this kind of shows how uh, the use of this can be uh, complex to figure out and spread over many different kinds of diagnoses. Uh, and the way to going forward to use this practically, this, this is from a consensus paper organized by UCSF uh, about deep brain stimulation that came out uh, last April. Uh, and it is extremely difficult for humans to plan this in a purely iterative trial by error process. If there's any role for artificial intelligence in functional neurosurgery, uh, this is it, because we're going to need uh, massive data analysis and massive uh, uh, algorithms and looking at, at huge numbers of possibilities to make sense and to make good use out of these more complex DBS electrodes. And here's another wrinkle with steerable electrodes. If you don't put it in the right way, then you also don't know how to steer it. So a group out of Cologne, uh, Dr. Visser van der Waala, uh, devised this algorithm based on the post-operative CT to allow you to determine the orientation of the electrode so you can use the programming capability and the steerability of the electrode. But this is something else that one has to attend to, another technical point with electrode placement. Moving beyond the hardware, uh, the software of stimulation also continues to evolve. And based on our understanding of the physiology of movement disorders, this is also going to uh, continue to change uh, and also will require more uh, artificial intelligence support to uh, allow us to choose the, the correct stimulation pattern uh, and, and uh, array for patients with uh, movement disorders. This includes adaptive stimulation with closed loop technology, first reported out of Oxford, Tipo Aziz group uh, in 2013. The first author, Simon Little, has uh, gone to UCSF uh, in the interim, and this was shown in an animal model that uh, there was a greater improvement actually with adaptive DBS than uh, with, with regular uh, closed loop dumb electrode stimulation. So this is uh, a schematic illustration of how this is gonna work in the future, probably incorporating more than the, the diencephalic electrode, either a cortical strip or, or another electrode uh, in another related target and using the feedback between those two to determine when and how the DBS electrode should fire. Uh, this is uh, a report uh, that uh, the UC UCSF group included in this consensus paper recently. They had a pilot project of patients who had adaptive DBS uh, stimulation. This is really just a proof of concept a study showing how the uh, the data from the system could be read long distance and and uh, altered long distance as well by remote.
programming. So this is where all this is going to go. Uh, you're going to have the implants, which are read remotely. Uh, the complex physiological data is going to be interpreted. And as a result of that, a possible change uh, or a confirmation in the current DBS stimulation will be made. Now, in this case, it happens to be a human, but uh, it is very easy to see how this is going to be done by an, an AI robot. And I'm, I'm not a huge fan of AI automatically in medicine in general, neurosurgery, but it's going to happen here, and it's probably going to happen here first, or anything else in anything clinical that we do. Of course, there are, DBS is still a surgical procedure, and you got to put in the implant, and there are complications that can occur, not in a trivial number of, of instances, and that's why the technology has to involve to, in ways that will limit that, by getting rid of the separate IPG in the chest, and the tunneling uh, rechargeability or longer batteries so we don't have to put the patient at risk for infection by changing the I IPG as well as all of the changes uh, that uh, I mentioned about closed loop and, and more complex programming and stimulation uh, algorithms. So here I'm going to get a little bit polemical. I don't know if you'd call this a fly in the ointment. You know, not at all because lesioning worked for decades and of course, it still does, and, and neurosurgeons doing functional neurosurgery should know how to lesion for movement disorders using a variety of techniques. Uh, but there was this paper, again, by uh, Rick Sherman that showed pretty convincingly in their own single center uh, study that complications are more likely to occur when you do lesioning, in this case, radio frequency lesioning for patients with Parkinson's disease or essential tremor than if you do DBS. I mean, that was the whole original concept of DBS. It was reversible, it was adjustable, whereas when you lesion and you have a side effect, you know, that, that ship has sailed. Again, I, we're not here to adjudicate between the, uh, these two, but you can look at the pros of each. DBS is not ablative, reversible, adjustable in diseases that are progressive, uh, whereas uh, a lesion is irreversible and you can't do it bilaterally. Well, probably not, that, that's in work in progress. On the other hand, the DBS may need frequent changes and it's expensive. If you get a lesion and you get benefit, you're, you're home free, nothing else to do, and there's no expense beyond that surgery. So what, what let the genie out of the bottle of lesioning versus DBS, I would say is magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound or focused ultrasound for short, that seems to have replaced HIFU as a term, initially reported for clinical use by Daniel Jamino, primarily for pain, but this was a controlled study out of University of Virginia, uh, where it, the authors really proved, oh, sorry, this is the, the, the follow-up study from the University of Toronto, a nod to my, uh, my friends who are at the University of Toronto, and it works. You could do a thalamotomy with, with focused ultrasound, make sure the lesion's in the right place with a test before you complete the lesion, uh, and as you can see, this, after three months, there's only a tiny little dot left. And the benefit appears to be fairly durable at this point. But to summarize the facts that we know about different lesioning techniques, and that's in these four columns versus DBS, D, with DBS, we've got a lot of experience. Yes, it's expensive, but it's reversible essentially all of the time. Maybe not if you have a complication from inserting it, but essentially all the time, it is adjustable. You can do it bilaterally. So uh, for, these re for those reasons, for me, DBS is still where we need to go for surgery for movement disorders and other things where we want to modulate the nervous system. So it's a mature improvement therapy for movement disorder patients. You could see the technical advance, the technological advances and technical advances that are going on. With our greater understanding of physiology, the outcomes are get, going to get better with DBS. And sure, lesioning technology has improved, but to me it seems obvious and axiomatic that DBS is gonna remain the mainstay of surgical treatment for people with movement disorders. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you again, Dr. Sinha and, uh, and Naren.
this was a wonderful presentation, Dr. Schilder. The, um, the beautiful overview of the, all the modalities in, um, and the current state of technology. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you got properly introduced, but just for those who don't know, Dr. Schilder is a uh, past president of World Society of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery and past president of American Society of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery, which is uh, probably two highest honors for the uh, functional neurosurgeon to have. He's also an expert in stereotactic radio surgery and many other things, but, but this talk on DBS and the movement disorders is, is an impressive summary of what's been going on for the last decade or two. Now, Dr. Shoulder, will um, the, um, the the question? One of the questions that came so far is that: What's your opinion on the DBS for early Parkinsonism? Do you think there's much room for early uh, stereotactic surgical intervention um, uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease on their early stages? And uh, and if so, then how early should we intervene? I think, from what we know, it, there is not compelling data that no. I, Hold on. We, we pretty much know that biologically uh, we don't prevent uh, worsening of Parkinson's disease by early stimulation. Right? That was completely clumsy. There's no neuroprotective effect of DBS. That's really what I meant to say. Uh, on the other hand, there is pretty good data that patients benefit from earlier intervention in terms of the morbidity of the disease. So I don't think we ha you have to wait for somebody to be frankly dyskinetic or severely bradykinetic uh, to the point of, of near dis complete disability. And once it's clear that their benefits of medical therapy are beginning to wear off, that's a completely appropriate time to intervene. That makes sense. The, the, I, I looked at your beautiful table at the very end about comparison of different modalities and, and it looks like radio frequency still wins in terms of the uh, being least expensive intervention, the uh, with everything else you have to you have expenses of the actual implant and expenses of the device to do lesioning, be that uh, uh, radio surgery or ultrasound or the uh, disposable such as a, a laser thermotherapy. So from that point of view, you feel do you feel like lesioning uh, still will remain an option for patients who? Uh, uh, either fail DBS for a variety of reasons or uh, for places who just uh, um, still are unable to afford the uh, uh, the technology because, you know, the, the, despite all our efforts, the devices we're implanting are still remarkably expensive. Who can't afford it? People in China? People in India? What country in the world where movement disorder surgery is being done is DBS not available? Now, there may be some uh, but they're certainly getting fewer and fewer. And we know that there are Chinese uh, industrial partners who have made these devices much less expensive. And in fact, I was going to address that, uh, Dr. Slavin, because I, this whole idea that, well, we have to teach lesioning so that people in the low and middle income countries can get surgery. I, I reject that out of hand. If DBS is better than our goal is to make DBS available for everyone in the world. If lesioning is better, then everyone should be getting lesioning when they need it. And where, where this can meet is different methods of lesioning. The problems with radio frequency lesioning are well known, and they've been known for 60 plus years. And, and we don't need to, to belabor that point. But if we can make lesions better with focused ultrasound, and we can expand the envelope safely out of the thalamus, you know, the palatal, a uh, palatotomy just approved in the U.S. Uh, to be done with focused ultrasound, or we could do it with lit, uh, or perhaps even SRS, then, then th those are other options for patients. But, you know, to simply say, well, uh, we're fine here in the U.S. and Western Europe and with our fancy expensive DBS, but you there in the third world, you're, you're going to get a lesion. No, I, I reject that completely. And that's wonderful. I, I think I'm old enough to remember the arguments about when DBS was introduced and how it had to find its room um, uh, fighting against very established technology of lesioning. Now, the, the circle kind of uh, um, uh, turned the entire technology around, and now we're hearing arguments about lesioning being beneficial and adva advantageous. 
And it's interesting to see that sometimes it's the same people who are arguing for DBS are now arguing against it. So they, uh, well, do you think that there will be don't uh, remember the history? another move of pendulum where technology will be so attractive that people will say that even best focused ultrasound candidates will still get DBS if it's so uh, uh, individually tailored and, um, and less invasive? That's uh, well, uh, first of all, that you, that's why we have to know the history. Right. If you want to know where we're going, we've got to know where we've been. And there are people now who, you know, who don't know the history and thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. DBS. But wow, lesioning. That's so cool and high tech. And they have no knowledge of, like you said, the swings uh, of the pendulum. But to answer your, your question, uh, the short answer is yes, especially as DBS gets, DBS gets more sophisticated. Uh, if you want to have a long-term benefit and the least chance of a of an irreversible side effect, yes, I think even if you could have a thalamotomy or a focused ultrasound pallidotomy, even if it's bilateral, uh, I want DBS for me and my right. family. I, th I think something that you you probably briefly touched upon but uh, didn't explore very much is that as mo most surgeons we do have a deep hope that eventually all the invasiveness of our interventions will disappear. And the, uh, and I can see time maybe, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years from now when people will say, can you imagine in 2021, they actually were drilling holes in the person's head and were implanting these wires that were stimulating the brain when we can do all of this just by attaching the sticker to the forehead and, and getting the same stimulation through non-invasive means. Um, That's but, great. But, really still far away. I mean, as far as I understand, the, the non-invasive stimulation is not as uh, robust and precise. And, and, uh, but do you think there, there's a hope there? Do you think we'll be, um, we'll be still doing DBS uh, in the future or there will be some more um, uh, futuristic solutions for this? In the short term, the futuristic solution is going to be that, that small micro DBS implanted device that just sits in the head and that'll be, you know, the battery will be lifelong or it'll be easily rechargeable like your Tesla's in two minutes, uh, uh, you know, and it won't be a burden on the patients to do that. And uh, it'll, it'll involve something else, ECOG or, or some other electro to allow for adaptive feedback and very, and it'll be AI controlled, very sophisticated way of controlling symptoms. And perhaps even the Holy Grail in PD, maybe it'll treat free gate freezing and 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 a tax and and gate ataxia, which our current DBS doesn't do very well. So that's in the short term. But decades later from now, when signal amplification can get better enough, and maybe it will be totally non-invasive. But that's going to be true of lots of things happening in in surgery, and the neurosurgeons will find other ways to keep themselves busy. There's but another I just question want to that say, came up came up in the chat box about. Uh, how about stem cell implant in substantial nigra, or, or for that matter, anywhere else in the brain? Back to the future, right? It, it's been done. I mean, I mean, what I'm trying to say that the, uh, the, the, the idea of cell transplant in general has been around for maybe at least 25 years, if I remember correctly, and, they, uh, and, and maybe even 30. And, and at that time, the results were impressive but they were never impressive enough to beat the effectiveness of DBS. And this effectiveness of DBS kind of uh, inadvertently became a reason for, you know, for, for everything else not to be widely accepted. So do you think that there's a new studies about uh, use of stem cells, dopaminergic producing, or, or any other uh, you know, genetically engineered cells uh, uh, will okay. um, be augmenting DBS or being an alternative to it? What's, what's your take on it? Maybe. But you know, we know from that trial from from the late '90s that uh, what was it, the early thousands, that the uh, dyskinesias resulted from the cells overproducing dopamine. Uh, that's the, I mean, that in a sense the trial showed efficacy, but uh, not effectiveness in a way. Plus, uh, the cells they, they can't just be little dopamine factories. They have to establish connections, uh, and and all that involved, and, and that has yet to be proven. Um, I'm a little wonderful. skeptical that that kind of biological solution is going to be the answer, but maybe. And if anyone who's uh, who's uh, attending here today is working on that, please 
go for it. But in the end, the biological solution would be better than a technical solution if it works. Right. And, and ultimately, I think it, you are correct, but that somebody probably have to compare them side by side to determine which one is better, right? Because so yeah. far, this has been done on, yeah. patient, on different patients, and, and it's hard to extrapolate results, making them identical. I think Naren had a question uh, to you as well. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, probably Dr. Slavin had mentioned it. Um, it will be a quick one. I, 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 I used to go to uh, functional neurosurgery about 25, 30 years ago, and then last week, I went uh, to see one of my colleagues doing DBS for dy dystonia, and uh, you know it's now become space age surgery with forty thousand pounds kit. And uh, you know I just went in the middle of the halfway. I said thank you, bye. I will go and do my shunts. And the thing is that uh, you, you know I, I appreciate that you are keen that the best best medicine should uh, be available to people in developing country. But even in developed countries, it's so hard to fund DBS. Uh, so is there a middle way until, until technology is available? But I, um, any thoughts on that? Thanks. Yeah, we got to, we have to make it, we have to get up. Well, either, whether it's done in university centers, which would be, I guess, ideal, or we have to convince our industrial partners that uh, they'll do at least as well if these devices are less expensive. Then you get into questions like, uh, what about bilaterality? What if, you, what if you just place unilateral devices like unilateral lesions? I mean, this has been studied in Parkinson's disease. It's not as effective, but maybe with more uh, sophisticated stimulation and waveforms, et cetera, we could revisit that, that sort of thing. But you, you know, you, you got to look at the way things progress. Uh, DBS is routinely available now uh, in the US. I'll bet in Canada 20 years ago it wasn't, but it is now. It is in Western Europe. It was you know, a fantasy 20 years ago uh, in India and in China. And now it is routinely done in both of those countries, uh, which represent two fifths of the entire world's population. Um, so yes, it, 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 and it, it is being done in many other places of the world where it would have been considered impossible not that long ago. And I think we owe it to our patients to, to push for it if it's better. If it's not, if a less expensive alternative is as good or better, then we have to acknowledge that and move on. Thanks. Thank you I think, very I think much. That's a great point, Naren, because the, yeah. uh, the 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 idea that functional interventions should take it should become a priority in terms of the uh, society attention and medical attention, because you know as as population gets older, we're going to see more of degenerative diseases sure. requiring our treatments, and therefore to have technology that is widely available and safe and effective. Um, uh, will probably become the, uh, the dominant topic for the next uh, few decades. So I think the, the fact that, you know, in the past we were concentrating on something that would affect younger population and uh, ignore the needs for uh, um, uh, geriatric uh, functional disorders, uh, this is probably going to go away. We're all going to get older. We're all going to need um, um, attention to our movements, to our memory, to our cognition to pain, to many other things that, you know, functional neurosurgeons can help with and to have the devices that are ubiquitous, um, widely available, less traumatic, more effective. This is something that we should concentrate on. So for younger generation, I think that's a great thing to worry about because, you know, it's, it's, it's very much conceivable that many other things will be eradicated with advancement, but the aging will be a hard one to beat. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shulda. It's a real honor and privilege to have you here. And I, once again, I want to introduce Dr. Slavin, uh, who will co-chair the, the neurotrauma session with me. Dr. Konstantin Slavin and I go back now almost 26 years. And, uh, uh, and Dr. Slavin is now professor of um, neurosurgery in functional neurosurgery, past president of the American Neuromodulation Society and now Vice President of the World Federation of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery. So it's a great honor to have him and he has got, uh, he has got a deep interest in neurotrauma as well. So I'm going to, thanks Dr. Slavin, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Professor Sina. Professor Sina is a senior professor of neurosurgery and chairman of the Jaipur 
postgraduate medical center department of neurosurgery there. He's very active in head injury and uh, has, uh, he's present of many societies in India and in uh, Australasia. And it's a real honor to have him talk to us on penetrating head injuries. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, it's okay. Can you is yes. it visible? Yes, it is. So, Thank you, sir. So, so thanks, uh, first, Dr. Darren, for inviting me for this very prestigious uh, meeting of World Neurosurgery webinar. My topic of presentation is prognostic factor in uh, craniocerebral penetrating injuries. And all we know that they are very devastating and lethal injuries in the TBI. And penetrating uh, injuries are very common in warfare and gunshot penetrating injury are very common in wartime and developed countries. While in, in developing and underdeveloped countries, low velocity penetrating injuries are more common. Uh, in our state of Rajasthan, we have a lot of sandhumes and entire personal assault by all these weapons are very common. And sometimes the patient come these weapons in situ. And uh, so as I told, they are increasing. So it is very important to deal these injuries. And uh, there are different causes. We all know any sharp object can cause penetration in a civilian and in war field, they are the common causes of injuries. They can be low velocity, painting head injury, where there is a fall or hitting of head against a sharp object, or high velocity, especially in war time, because of gunshot and missile injuries. Velocity is a very critical factor for destruction that uh, differentiate the low and high velocity. And uh, degree of tissue injury, uh, is proportional to quantity of energy delivered. As far as the dynamics are concerned, in low velocity, there is a absence of significant impact force. So there is a usually good recovery. While in high velocity, there is a cavitation and shock waves that cause more cerebral damage and poor prognosis. We must know pathology before we manage the, this type of injury. Because in pathophysiology, they can be primary impact and secondary impact. Primary impact is due to direct injury by penetrating object, and three waves are formed. Primary waves, because they produce because of direct crush injury by the projectile resulting in permanent cylindrical cavity. While the secondary waves, they are generated because of the radial expansion of the brain uh, and then contraction that causes the secondary waves and the temporary cavities, and be, be during this procedure, then can be a uh, negative subatmospheric uh, pressure generation and draw of the, um, uh, this material from outside the wound. Tertiary waves, they are definitely very uh, of high pressure, maybe go up to the 100 atmospheric pressure, but brevity of these waves is only for two microseconds, so they don't cause much injury. So primary impact, increase the potential of cerebrovascular injury either by direct or indirect uh, um, waves. This is just a uh, diagnostic position because uh, I want to give because there's a, so many residents are there uh, in this webinar. This is the permanent cavity and this is the temporary cavity because of radial expansion. So secondary impact we know uh, cause the raise of ICP which uh, start in six hours, maximum is 48 hours, and persist up to seven days. Cardiopulmonary uh, changes, they are because of the rostrocordial displacement of the, uh, in the difference of because of the pressure gradient across the foramen magnum in, from the supratentrial compartment and cause of the herniation of the brain stem or tonsils that cause all these cardiopulmonary changes. This is just a small video. This is a low velocity, absence of dynamic forces waves. So it causes a fracture in all, but there is not much harmful effect over the brain. Bullet injuries uh, can be high velocity and low velocity. High velocity bullet injury, they cause a lot of pressure gradient difference in the supratentrial and across the forearm magnum cause the brain stem and tonsillar herniation 
and instant death. While in low velocity, there is a gradual, there can be hormone effect, but they are gradual and less. They cause a lot of hemorrhage, this is a, uh, this is a permanent uh, cavity and herniation, it's a slow process which can cause delay the all these problems. This is just a video. This is a collet and recollect and causing the hemorrhage, primary cavity and deleterious effect over the brain. Coagulopathy is another important fact, uh, things which uh, have seen in the, this type of injuries because of brain thromboplasty. There is a, we see usually a platelet number and agreeability decreases, which start in two hours and maximum it remain up to the six hour. And in a study, it was found that 71% of survival and 94% of non-survival have some or other form of the coagulation disorders. So now we come to the prognostic factor. They can be general factor. They can be specific factor. Specific factor may be related to weapon or radiological factor. General factor, as we know, in all the TBI uh, advances, poor prognosis, GCS, less GCS, poor prognosis, high potential on admission, poor prognosis, dilated unilateral or bilateral uh, pupillary changes, poor prognosis, coagulopathy, I already mm -hmm. mentioned, high ICP, which start in two to three hours uh, and uh, cause further uh, mm -hmm. ch challenges. Major vascular injury because of the direct or indirect waves may cause a pseudo aneurysm formation or injury to the vessel wall can cause poor prognosis. This is just want to show that there is a multi lobar involvement here, and uh, here there is an eloquent area involvement which lead to poor GCS and poor prognosis. Associated multiple injuries are very common because patient usually they fall after the injury, so they can have the spinal or associated abdominal or thoracic injury. So subtle attempt is a very close injury. So they have poor prognosis because of greater yaw or revolving of the um, this bullet um, around. So there's a greater show which is have a, a more deleterious effect over the brain. Then general prognosis factor, uh, it can be the uh, incomplete dural closure, wound descents, leakage of the CSF, passing through the air sinuses, they're all things which complicate the uh, penetrating injury. Like here, just see there's a foreign body and got infected and which lead to the poor prognosis. Then other general uh, prognosis factor, seizure. We see seizure very high incidence in these injuries, maybe up to the 50%. And in Vietnam, it has been seen that uh, uh, all the seizures and tapetic were given, but uh, their role in delayed prevention of seizure is not much. But because of the high incidence of early seizure, we must give anti epileptic to all the patients. Delay in effective resuscitation. Children, they behave better than adults. And examination early uh, within six hours, diameter of entrance less than two centimeter, no exit wound, definitely has a better outcome. Now we come to weapon related factor. Uh, we only all know about the internal and external blasting, but most important is wound blasting. Missile with greater yaw, yaw means uh, rotation along the long axis, is more cause more fragmentation and deformation, which is associated with the severe injury and poor prognosis. Close range associated with poor prognosis because of greater yaw. Velocity, as I told, is the important factor. But deformation and fragmentation is very important for the uh, destruction and poor prognosis. Trajectory is very important. Uh, projectile passing through the eloquent area definitely have poor prognosis, as I showed in the previous uh, my slide. Trajectory passing to thin skulls like temporary, uh, temporal bone, air sinuses, because of more complication, they have poor prognosis. Strikes at 90 degree cause maximum injury. Sometimes we see the tangential wounds. They are known as gutter wounds. They just recollect the uh, penetrating object from the surface. It, there is no uh, penetration. But the sh sh waves, they pass up to the dura and brain and can cause contusion and dural tears 
and but their outcome is usually good. An exploded missile because of their toxicity and delayed detonation should be removed. Then migratory projectile, which we see sometimes inside the ventricle, uh, in liquefied necrotic brain tissue, in hematoma, because of the heavy weight, they migrate from one place to other place. Sometimes we see infection because of this, and that can cause hydrocopras or abscess formation. So uh, some, sometimes they split the white matter and cause a lot of neurological deficits. So this is an example of weapon related factor. This is the, in the ventricle, there is a, after some time, uh, migration to the opposite ventricle and cause hydrocephalus and patient uh, had a poor prognosis. Now, weapon should not be removed uh, at the site uh, or in zigzag fashion. If it is removed, it should be removed in the same plane of trajectory in the OT. If it is removed in the uh, site of scene, it causes poor prognosis. Then radiological factor, all we know that multiple lower involvement, ventricle hemorrhage, the systems not very visible, large ICH, cerebrovascular injury or pseudo uh, aneurysm, they are all associated with the poor prognosis. Then if there is a lateral penetration, they have worse prognosis compared to anterior posterior. Sometimes in CT, we see that trim track sign is a hypodense in middle and surrounded by hyperdense because of blood, it is a of poor prognostic sign. Now, just I want to tell a few facts. The size, shape, and penetration is very important. And I mentioned before, acid, if removed uh, at the site, it is hope for poor prognosis. Then vascular injury association is seen uh, in 30% of cases with 17% mortality. And in, in um, these injuries is more common if there's a transorbital uh, penetration with high mortality, 30%, which is more seen in children because of the fragile orbital plate. This is just a pseudoneurysm. Now I want to share a few of my patients. Uh, they are sorted by uh, X. This is a long handle. We couldn't do the CT scan. So plain X-ray is showing this all battle, uh, this X inside, and we remove holding the this handle so it doesn't fall during removal. And this is after uh, one year, this is a gliosis and patient um, discharge and having buried with one children. This is another patient of the assaulted by X. And um, as I told, they are low velocity injuries. They cause more local destruction, but outcome is usually um, good because of absence of uh, shock waves. This is the another patient assaulted by sickle and uh, we couldn't do the CT, only the su superficial injury was there and patient improved. Self-inflected pentane injury, we are very common in a manic depressive disorders pa patients. And this is the example where patient hammered the seizure over the just vertex. And uh, this is the scan. There was superior sinus uh, injury which we could uh, control with the, our manuals and patient improved after surgery and discharge. Children, uh, in children, it is very uncommon. This is a patient assaulted by a caliper from his fellow, but there was no um, uh, injury to the vessel in silver fissure and in a CT angiogram. So we just removed it and patient improved. Sometimes conservative approach can be adopted. As we see here, there's a fall of child over the metal strip and number of the nails they enter inside and serial CT were done and patient was under close observation and patient improvement discharge. This is another patient of metal uh, inside the brain. This is the wooden piece. This is very interesting case because uh, if we go for CT and we don't have HT, then it just look like a air bubble. So if we suspect injury by wood, we must go for the CT scan uh, and for the uh, diagnosis. So this is after removal and patient improved. This is another patient fall of stone over this. This is the stone inside removed. Now we come to the high velocity penetrating injury. We know after first of all, because of the pushing this uh, efforts, uh, the irrigation with sulfur, uh, early transfer, anesthesia, 
antibiotic and very tight closure, good closure of the dura and bone. The there was improvement in the outcome with radical deprivation. So mortality improved from 54% to 28%. So this is our, our patient uh, injured by the bullet. Patient don't have any, uh, was not having any neurological deficit. So just we left it as such. This is a sometime problem uh, where this retain splinter or fragments. So our philosophy is observe and follow up. Treat meningitis there. Shunt, there is a hydrochloric then do shunt. If there is a CSF leak, repair the leak as per the patient condition and site of the uh, CSF leak. So this is another very interesting case I want to share. This uh, patient was assaulted by pellets in the both orbit and in later it was seen one. So it shows that identification, identical infection of this pellet on the both orbit and patient was not having vision. So we just left, left as such. This is another interesting patient I want to share with you. Uh, this girl 12 year fall from bicycle and handle of the bicycle injured uh, the left orbit and patient after two days presented to us with headache and vomiting. And uh, um, CT scan was done showing this is ICH and this is a bone fragment, which we see here. And uh, this is an angiogram version. He suspected the aneurysm before. So this is the aneurysm. This is the bone fragment here. And when volume rendering image was done, very beautifully showed the aneurysm in this uh, here. You can see the very close artery. And this is a, um, this, uh, a bone piece. We discussed with our neuro intervention about the uh, intervention or surgery. So we finally decided to clip this aneurysm. So this is the aneurysm surgery video. This is a bone fragment here. And uh, just we are searching for the aneurysm here. And uh, then everything went nicely. When, uh, so when we search the aneurysm, we just during them because of manipulation, the aneurysm get dislodged from the trend artery and there was hole and bleeding from the vessel and we tried to coagulate it, but uh, we couldn't do. So we finally planned to put a mini clip and we put a mini clip and we could uh, control the bleeding. And so this is the bone piece and this is a uh, aneurysm. And this is the post of CT angiography showing the good distal circulation and the patient was intact and discharged on eighth day. So just I want to tell that uh, the painting injuries are very devastating and lethal injuries increasing every day because of the interpersonal assault or terrorism and so many other causes and their management should be taken care nicely. Early transfer of the patient is very important and good closure of the dura and scalp and then the imaging and diagnosis is very important. All we know in management of their uh, as a critical care, uh, under critical care. The, regarding the radical deprivation or um, congenital deprivation, the, recently the Lebanon, Afghan, and Iran war has shown that conservative deprivation is sufficient and does not give equal result as the radical deprivation. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, I, I finished. Sure. Um, Constantin? Yeah, that, that, was, that was a beautiful uh, collection of cases. I don't think I've ever seen this many penetrating wounds uh, with uh, both uh, you know, um, uh, gunshots and, 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 and missiles and, and access. I mean, I've seen a share of, of uh, wounds uh, here in Chicago, but, but this was very impressive summary. And, uh, and I you. think your <laughs> points are very, very well taken in, in terms of the immediate uh, uh, approach, direction of uh, removal of device and so forth. I think these are very common sense things which are not very obvious every time. So I'm, I'm glad you put this all together. I think, I think people who will be watching this uh, um, uh, in the recording will probably 
get even more points as, as they get through the second time. It's 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 very, very nice summary. The question came up while you were speaking about the uh, um, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, when to start and when to stop. And, uh, and, and the same with anti-epileptics, um, uh, what would be the indication for that? The, there are some other questions in terms of CSF leak and duroplasty, but let's go with antibiotics first. Yeah, uh, we generally uh, give the very simple antibiotics, ceftriaxone and uh, amikacin, because uh, in our institute, we know we have the uh, low middle income country, so patient can't afford very high um, uh, cost antibiotic, but they work very nicely, the ceftriaxone and uh, amikacin. And if Excellent. there is an infection something, then according to CSF culture or wound culture. That makes sense. How about the anticonvulsants? Uh, anticonvulsants, uh, uh, again, same thing. Phenytoin is very cheap and good uh, results. So we use phenytoin, but uh, if it doesn't work, if there's a seizure, then we use nowadays the levetiracetam. We add. We add. Do you do it prophylactically or you wait for patients to develop some kind no, of No, 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 no. We give we all patients, we give uh, prophylactic antibiotic and we continue it for a uh, few months and then we go for the EG to, uh, and um, monitoring and if EG says uh, normal activity, then we stop. That's wonderful. There's also um, a question about the um, uh, spinal fluid leak. The, uh, yeah. Do you wait and see until something happens or do you take them to, uh, no. to, um, to re-surgery? Do you drain them or do you repair it? What, what's, what's your approach when you do see so, it? Yes, what? yes. Uh, first, we observe one or two days. If it continues, then we put the, uh, as per the patient condition, uh, we put the lumbar drain, if, uh, even that. Uh, but generally, nowadays, we avoid this because by putting the lumbar drain, we are communicating supratendral to spine, both compartment for infection. So we, we don't prefer nowadays. We again go and repair because now the glue and all the things, they are so good available in the market. So we can repair directly without any with good results. It mm -hmm. makes sense. And the last question came about the, the what do you use for duroplasty? Is it autologous? Um, uh, mm -hmm. Allografts, uh, watertight. Um, how how do you how do we manage this? Generally, we take autologous. We use autologous, but now we have a lot of things in, in market. This gel foam and gel, dual gel. There are so many things are available, and it is supplied by our government. It is free, so we if, uh, we can't take uh, the autologous. Then we use them. There's a question from Dr. Andrew. Reisner, uh, hello, Dr. Reisner. Um, he's now the chairman of the WFNS Neurotrauma Committee. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Sina, Dr. Reisner is asking what, uh, 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 he was asking about the tetanus. Uh, uh, so what antibiotics do you use and do you routinely give tetanus shot? Yes, we use, give routinely uh, tetanus. And as far as antibiotic, I already mentioned you, we use the septaxone and amicacin, which is, easily available and very low cost. And it works in the very nice in our setup. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sinha. This was a fantastic talk. Um, for want of a time, um, we'll move to the next talk. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Um, Corrado Icarino. Uh, Dr. Icarino, if I've got it right, is from University of uh, Palma in Italy. Once again, he is active in the WFNS uh, Neurotrauma Committees, and um, we are really looking forward to his talk on um, chronic uh, management of chronic subdural hematoma uh, with the middle meningeal artery embolization. I I have thought about every possible thing in the whole life that could change, but I never thought chronic subdural will will be in danger of neurosurgeons losing it. So, Professor. Uh, um, I carry no really looking forward to your lecture. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You hear me and you can send presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this invitation. Congratulations for this uh, webinar conference. And uh, my topic is the middle major artery embolization for chronic stubdural hematoma. So the uh, background, we know the formation of a chronic subdural hematoma is based on presence of 
uh, inflammatory cascade and uh, uh, androgenic factors uh, uh, with the formation of uh, membranes and capillaries. And these membranes will be filled by uh, exudate fluid and blood in a vicious circle. So uh, many, many others uh, published how uh, many mediators uh, has been observed in the uh, have been observed in chronic subdural hematoma, uh, mainly proandrogenic factors and uh, cytokine and uh, chemokines. All these factors um, uh, has been uh, have bringed uh, by um, capillary network vascularized by middle meningeal arteries. Uh, moreover, uh, more than 20 years ago, um, has been uh, Mm, has been observed uh, uh, through this histological study how vascular structure uh, between dura mater and outer membrane of chronic subdural hematoma originated from branch of uh, MMA. Moreover, more recently, in this paper has been uh, demonstrated how uh, the diameter of uh, MMA uh, in the side of chronic subdural hematoma is larger than the diameter of MMA of contralateral site. And in this study, in, this, uh, in subgroup of 18 patients where uh, MRI angiograms has been performed occasionally before the formation of subdural hematoma, uh, is, it was possible to observe how in the same patient before formation of chronic subdural hematoma, the uh, menin middle meningeal arteries has, have the same size. After formation of subdural hematoma, the uh, homolateral arteries was larger. So uh, it's so clear the close relationships between uh, hematoma and middle meningeal arteries. And, uh, it's, uh, and so uh, in the, the background, the rationale of the study, the rationale of this treatment is that if you close the uh, uh, MMA, you can stop the supply of chronic subdural hematoma. Uh, chronic inflammation and support of uh, uh, cytokine and angiogenetic factors. Uh, the techniques is uh, a simple technique. It takes about 30 minutes in a regular, uh, regular patient with a normal artery patient uh, uh, through selective catheterism of the MMA. Uh, moreover, another background is the observation uh, one year ago about the limits of long-term steroid strategy uh, that the group of Peter Hutchinson uh, uh, through the uh, multicenter randomizer controlled trial uh, demonstrating the um, serious adverse effects of the chronic use of hematoma and so uh, chronic use of desametasone. Uh, so the the steroids show it to have um, uh, efficacy to reduce the recurrence, but are uh, closed uh, related with uh, more serious adverse, adverse events and also unfavorable outcome. But this technique, the embolization, is not so uh, new because the, the first paper is about 20 years ago. And uh, since the beginning, until now has been published about uh, 736 patients treated with this technique. The huge, the most recent huge series is 154 uh, consecutive embolization published uh, this year. The indications are not so clear. Uh, the, um, there is no uh, clear definition which patient. For sure, the technique is just for a, a subsetting of patient with chronic hematoma and patient with few symptoms, especially under antithrombotic therapy. So. Uh, the mo most part of the, this, the published patients has been have been treated uh, to prevent surgery in patient uh, with this hematoma. So uh, the, the indication is a standalone uh, embolization. Uh, 
mobilization used as a first approach. Another part of uh, uh, patient um, has been treated uh, has prophylaxis of a recurrence after first, after first surgery. And uh, one third of a reported patient has been treated after first recurrence in order to prevent further recurrence. Of course, due to the rare um, occurrence, uh, just less than 5% of total reported patient uh, has been treated after second surgery. Anyhow, the overall failure is reported uh, less than 6%. So this is one of the first patients that we treated uh, due to uh, the very, um, uh, very uh, critical condition, uh, cirrhosis, uh, thrombosis of the portal vein, thrombocytopenia, coagulopathy. This is the uh, spontaneous hematoma. And uh, after one week, uh, the patient developed a thrombocytopenia with 3,000 white blood cells still asymptomatic with unchanged CT scan. So we decided to treat uh, with embolization to uh, reduce the hemorrhagic risk in this kind of patient uh, taking in consideration the white blood cell counts. Uh, this is the follow-up after two weeks, uh, there is uh, unchanged CT scan. Unfortunately, the patient died uh, four days after this last CT scan for liver failure. Uh, this is the typical uh, patient uh, with, uh, treated with a barrel for a chronic subdural hematoma, hematoma. And all we know, uh, uh, we, we observe how the postoperative course of this patient can be uh, uh, eventful with uh, some subacute rebleeding, with uh, some uh, slight uh, different uh, um, behavior of the uh, thickness of the uh, hematoma. And uh, of course, uh, uh, taking consideration that the patient is awake, is autonomous, we do not anything usually, but uh, if these patients are uh, suspended the anti uh, aggregant therapy, uh, and uh, often they never start the antithrombotic therapy, just use of steroids. Uh, in this case, uh, as usual, uh, in after three months, the patient developed a slight uh, neurological uh, signs uh, with uh, autonomous uh, recovery. Uh, and this episode can happen also uh, later, as in this patient, uh, after five months, uh, develop a new critic episode with uh, rapid recovery of uh, uh, palsy uh, of uh, upper limb, left upper limb, aphasia. So for this reason, we decide to treat with embolization and uh, start antiplectic therapy. And this is the post-embolization course with a stable uh, um, uh, behavior of the uh, subdural hematoma. So the patient, due to the closing of uh, uh, arterial supply, um, can start the DOAC. Uh, and also reduction of antiepileptic therapy. So comparing the two uh, radiological course uh, is interesting to note how after embolization is more stable. So which indication is, uh, I repeat, still not clear in um, literature? Uh, we can consider indication like in this patient, a female, a 70 years old, fall intubated on scene, but after 12 hours, this is a CT scan, uh, and uh, due to this unchanged uh, situation, uh, we extubate a patient with uh, uh, you know, Glasgow Coma Scale of 13. And uh, uh, when, uh, during the follow-up, we assist uh, two weeks post-trauma, the uh, chroni uh, uh, chronization of the hematoma, so we decided to uh, perform the uh, MMA embolization uh, to avoid the prolonged clinical course. And we see how after three weeks, we have the resolution of the hematoma. Or other indication is uh, like in this patient after one uh, treated for bar hole, this typical patient 
all patients with the pacemaker uh, and uh, uh, recurrent falls for progressive left lower limb impairment. After one week for the first surgery, new fall and episodic left hand myoclony, but no EG anomalies. So, so due to the uh, thickness of the hematoma and uh, um, clinical uh, condition, we reoperate the, the patient. But at this time, we uh, also uh, performed the uh, embolization as a booster. I mean, to avoid uh, another recurrence and to protect the patient for uh, ev um, eventual uh, further fall. And this is the course, radiological course, as how we can assist a progressive uh, decrease of the thickness and the normalization of the midline shift. And this is the, the situation after three months after post, after the second bar hole. But the, the, the question is uh, um, how to uh, define the indication and how to define the cutoff value. Uh, for example, this patient with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, old patient with uh, uh, DOAC for chronic atrial fibrillation, uh, um, very um, serious uh, uh, heart comorbidities and has this uh, situation with the middle line shift 6.8 millimeters and uh, quite three centimeters of thickness. Uh, so we embolize this patient and this is the situation. After three weeks, we assist a good uh, reduction of the thickness. Or uh, in this other patient with, with a bilateral hematoma, seven millimeters of middle line shift and uh, uh, 20 millimeters of uh, thickness of right side and 17 millimeters of thickness in the left side. Uh, also for this patient, the uh, um, radiological course was a, was a good radiological course uh, with a, a progressive reduction of the uh, thickness and resolution uh, after three months after embolization. So uh, the advantage to treat in this way this patient that maybe we can uh, start more promptly the reuptake of anti-aggregant of DOAC or antithrombotic. Uh, so the conclusive remarks is uh, that we are uh, still to define radiological and uh, inclusive criterion. Uh, maybe uh, we we can take in consideration more midline shift than thickness. So we can take in consideration the um, limit of uh, midline shift, even if we treat also patient with seven millimeters of midline. The clinical uh, inclusive exclusive criterion uh, of sure all the patient treated are with a very slight um, motor deficit and uh, very slight, just uh, confusion, but uh, um, no uh, evidence of uh, uh, frank palsy or paralysis. And for sure, one of the advantage of this technique is the promptly reuptake of antithrombotic therapy and anti-aggregant. Anyhow, uh, due to the uh, very huge series in uh, literature uh, of patient, maybe, uh, now is time for a randomized controlled trial for this subsetting of patient. Of course, the embolization is not an alternative of bar hole in all patients, but just in this uh, palsy symptomatic patient with uh, um, old age, with the uh, problem due to uh, heart failure, com heart comorbidity, um, with need of uh, anti-thrombotic and uh, anti-aggregant therapy. Thank you. That's a wonderful talk, Dr. Carino. Thank you very much for, for sharing this, uh, this, this thoughts and these results. The, um, you know, in our practice, we routinely use uh, MMA embolization now for chronic subdurals. And, uh, and on, normally we do it after intervention to decompress the brain, but, but recently we started using it as, as a main intervention. So when the patient does not have neurological deficit, we embolize MMA and we observe the subdural to disappear over time, which is very impressive, I must say. I don't do endovascular interventions and then the vascular colleagues of mine, they are really 
happy to do this because they feel like it's extremely uh, uh, useful intervention. The question I, I had for you is whether or not you feel that the, uh, there is any room for doing prophylactic MMA embolization in the patients who may have just a hint of subdural but not symptomatic is there any um, reason for us to intervene early before they become symptomatic to prevent something in the future? And if so, is there any risk in embolizing middle meningeal arteries? I'm sure there's a reason the arteries exist. So we embolizing them freely, but is there anything that happens to patients that we need to be aware of as a result of that embolization? About the risk, uh, we start uh, these practices uh, in, uh, in this center just one year ago, but I know other centers where the practice starts more than two years ago, or three years ago. And to be honest, I never see any uh, com, uh, side effect except the impossibility to perform embolization. I mean, there is some patient where the artery is so uh, kinked or there is, a, they, the radiologists observe a reflux of the microparticles. And so sometimes in order less than 10%, they cannot perform the embolization. But I have no, I, I never observe any uh, complication like uh, ischemic complication, hemorrhagic complication. About, about prophylaxis is what we done in that female of 70 years old uh, he, he, uh, she was symptomatic for the trauma, but not for the hematoma, because he was, uh, uh, he was uh, seen on the scene and he was intubated on the scene. So he take immediately severity BI, but after 12 hours, he recovered promptly. Uh, so in that patient, we perform a prophylactic uh, embolization before that he start to change uh, chronic Ill, chronicization uh, and uh, a long uh, CT scan follow up. So for that patient where uh, we need to uh, reuptake promptly, for example, the antithrombotic therapy, I think that there is a room for uh, prophylactic uh, um, embolization. And this is the way because uh, I think that we start uh, randomized control a trial because so we can assume that the risk is acceptable risk. There is a question from um, uh, Naren about uh, the, uh, the need for multiple CAT scans to follow up the progression of the uh, hematoma. I mean, I noticed at your slides that you have sl uh, images three months, four months and, and longer after the procedure. Um, uh, what's your usual time course for a radiographic uh, follow-up and, and how much of this is, is done routinely uh, for patients who are minimally symptomatic? So we, we can discuss about medical issue or medical legal issue. Among us, uh, medical issue, uh, I think that uh, just one CT scan after um, uh, two months in patient that needs to restart uh, therapy. Uh, for example, I think that the immediately post-operative, I mean surgery, not even embolization. Immediately post-operative CT scan could be unuseful if the patient is good because honestly, if the patient is good and we, we see a little bit of hematoma, nobody of us touch the patient because it's good. So, so we, we, we perform the CT scan for the judge, not for us. Uh, it's clear, it's normally. Uh, of course, uh, when we start to, to embolize, uh, maybe we we done some CT scan more, but uh, now we appreciate that usually the disappearing, the normalization of the uh, of the brain, I mean the disappearing of the of the hematoma, start uh, about well, between the second and uh, after four and six weeks. So maybe we, we are starting to reduce the, the CT scan uh, before uh, the for after procedure and three months. Thank There's you. a question uh, about subdural membrane. Uh, uh, Do you see the subdural membranes disappear over time? And it is an embolization, so we, we do not open the, uh, the patient. So we don't really know if the subdural membranes are still there or gone. No, I mean, I, I would assume that 
without blood supply, they're probably going to involute over time, don't you think? The, the, the theory that the membrane should uh, involute because uh, the theory that we stop the uh, bloody supply through meningeal artery, so the inflammatory cascade, the cytokine that forms the membrane and uh, capillaries should stop it. And so the membrane should disappear or at least to remain some uh, uh, fibroblastic uh, membrane, not, not more vascularized membrane. Uh, so there was a question from the previous uh, speaker. Dr. Singer had a question um, about the uh, cost effectiveness of this. Is there any comment you can give us? I think the cost effectiveness uh, start to be effective also when we restart uh, the, um, the restart the, the therapy and reduce uh, the uh, hemorrhagic or ischemic complication in operative or not operative. Uh, patient. I mean, uh, the, we uh, perform this embolization, why? To prevent recurrence and to uh, rest, reuptake uh, more promptly the uh, uh, anticoagulant and antiaggregant therapy. When we delay the therapy, we uh, spend for this patient because, because we well, to, to restart the therapy, we have to be sure that there is no blood, no chronic subdural hematoma. So uh, we, we, we perform a lot of CT scan before to introduce once again the UIC or warfarin or ACA. Uh, so, uh, sure. uh, uh, sorry for interrupting. I, after this question, uh, we need to move on because of the want of time we are now one hour delays my um, so prof please finish that answer please uh, please uh, you're happy thank you very much Naren. thanks for reminding yeah. us about time uh, thank you. Uh, dr Corina, the last question we have is is about mass effect when when you have patients we presenting with mass effect from subdural hematoma do you suggest going straight to embolization or do you plan to do intervention first and then embolize what what's your algorithm if you take in consideration that the patient should be operated, so operate, don't, <laughs> no, no doubt about this. Uh, the, the embolization could be a booster of the surgery or a prevent, uh, operation. Uh, so, and this is the real reason because uh, we have to do the randomized controlled trial because I, we start uh, to embolize patients with, with more, much more thick uh, hematoma. We start with uh, no more than three centimeters, and now we are embolizing more than three centimeters. We start with no more than five millimeters of shift of middle line, and as you note, the, uh, the last two patients have uh, seven millimeters. So maybe it's much more important, the clinical condition, back to the mass effect. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Naren, would you please move on to the next speaker? Thanks. Dr. Thank Carino, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Can I please introduce Dr. We are going to uh, move to Dr. Laura Lippa and Dr. Uh, Gupta will come at the end. Dr. Laura Lippa, could I please ask you to share your presentation? Uh, you should be able to. Dr. Lippa is neurosurgeon at Livorno um, in Italy. She's very active in head injury, both at EANS as well as in the WFNS. She's also member of the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Committee. So we are looking forward to very yes. important talk of us um, on the education. Uh, would you be able to share your talk? Uh, uh, I think so, yes. Thank you. I think you can see it, uh, can see it now. Uh, not I yet, hope Dr. so. Not, 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 not yet, Dr. Lipa. Not yet. No. Let me see. What about now? No, no. Just a second. I don't know why he tells no. something about Zoom. It says you're not allowed. You should be able to. Yep, it's there. Okay. Now. Good. Yes, Thanks. It's there now. Perfect. Do, okay. Dr. Lipa, is it okay if I give you a um, a, 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 a alert at about twelve minutes. Uh, oh, of course, I will be. I will be short. I will be short because. <laughs> no, this, take your this... time. But the fifteen minutes <laughs> and five. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. 
So I just wanted to um, give a, a tiny heads up about education and neurotrauma. So I'm I'm not uh, I'm not the the one among us that has much more to share than all the others. But um, as a, I don't know, youngster in in neurosurgery and in neurotrauma. So what I've uh, what I've been through is that. Uh, neurotrauma was a neglected child during my education. So what, after I did a research fellowship in Siena, um, I struggled a lot uh, with um, education in neurotrauma. So that's something that I would love uh, to be able to, um, uh, to avoid for our residents. So we know that this is a forgotten epidemic. We know all the uh, morbidity and mortality causes. We know the difference between high income and medium income um, countries. We know that we have a, a significant uh, amount of difference in um, output in research and trials because of different um, resources and time and, and, and it's, it's a constraint of um, clinical duties and population and uh, the population we serve is completely different and resources. So while we have most of the uh, most of the trauma uh, in the low medium income countries, we don't know uh, as much as from uh, their own part of research. And most of the trials come from the high income countries. And this is something that we have to correct. Um, about neurotrauma education, the, um, the point is that if we have heterogeneity of growth uh, for so many reasons. So we don't have focused on neurotrauma uh, programs or teachers are less focused on there is lower caseload on volume and or we don't have time to focus on research or the resources and the equipment is scarce in all the different phases of neurotrauma. So when there is heterogeneity of growth, there is also heterogeneity of care. And this is something that we as neurosurgeons now, uh, we can shrink this division between the two things. Um, and this is up to us. So we have lots, lots of education initiatives going on right now. So we're planning lots of things from both from the Neurotrauma Committee in the WSNS, a core curriculum project, fellowship and grand rounds. I hope everything will be uh, out there soon. Uh, from the ENS part, it, there is a crash course in neurotrauma in planning coming next year. Uh, there are lots of resources out there in the web and lots of uh, resources that we don't know because they're not very well sponsored us, but Global Neuro has done an amazing job in the development and of a uh, core curriculum course, which is very well uh, packed. Uh, of info and so uh, it's something I, I strongly uh, recommend and all the other resources out there that need to be listed and publicized please do send it to me uh, I would love to be um, somehow um, an enzyme and publicize them more um, neurotrauma education is not just our issue so uh, Professor Yacarino um, told me when I was a resident, the best way to treat a patient is to grab that chair in the ICU and talk with the anesthesiologist. So this is something that sticks with me. And so this is, this is actually a patient's best friend, the time we take to take, talk about the trauma with the anesthesiologist. But um, this is very important. We developed um, a consensus conference and a best medical practice in Italy with the anesthesiologist. There is um, something big going on with the CBIC. We, know, we all know that. But we also have to think about outreaching. So just not the OR or the hospital, but TBI is a system problem. It's, a, it's something that we have to, uh, to deal with um, on a systemic way in policies as well. So I mentioned Think First because in the last cycle we worked together in Pakistan and there was the beginning of the, the chapter in Pakistan, which was a huge success. Um, so I strongly recommend that we as neurosurgeons engage more in neurotraumatology. It's not that it's the, the thing that 
still rested in tent, uh, but as much as any other topic, it's not uh, it's not any tiny little difference uh, less difficult that we uh, develop local protocols and that we construct, we can build new automatology fellowships. Um, and I stress the concept of interdependency as a system. So lots has to be done with together with rehabilitation, with pre-hospital care, and to enhance protocols in this sense and reach out for collaboration because the education is the key to success. Thank you. That was a wonderful summary, Dr. Lipa. That, that, was, that was great kind of uh, uh, presentation underscoring the importance of education and the wide availability of the courses. And I'm glad you're doing this because I'm, I'm sure there's, there's big need in people to know what's going on, particularly now with everything done remotely and virtual education is becoming a norm. Uh, I, think, I think the fact that you, you're popularizing this and spreading the word is, is extremely important. The, uh, the, what do you think will be the next uh, uh, big task for the education in neurotrauma field? So the next big task, uh, I think, is based in each, in each association. So since we're not sure that we can gather together anytime soon uh, or that we are always uh, thinking about, we'll be able to, I think we have to stay to act local while staying connected. So we can shrink the division between uh, the different approach we have in trauma. Um, the Global Neuro Core Competencies course or what we're planning to do with the WFNS and the ENS is something that, uh, that it is aiming to, to reach out for residents and to allow them to be um, more uh, taken care of in the term of education. I think the next step will be for us to reach out to them. So for us to build something long lasting, um, some repository also possibly of videos and, and teaching material and uh, live, live guidelines, living guidelines. Because it's so, it's so, I don't know, ever changing as a, with the technology that we need living guidelines with this. Thank you, thank there, you, Doctor Lipa. Three questions that came uh, one after another. But can, uh, can um, sorry, Kitten can is it okay if because of the time whether Doctor Lipa would kindly answer them on the chat box? Is that okay, Doctor Lipa? Of course, perfect. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Much obliged. I'm um, um, just going to so next speakers. Professor Tariq Khan, Professor Khan, uh, would you like to share your presentation, please? It's a, it's an honor to have Professor Khan with us. Professor Khan is the uh, was the former chairman of the WFNS Trauma Committee, and uh, he had uh, uh, been active in neurotrauma and continues to be active in neurotrauma in Pakistan, Asia, and around the world. He has been a motor engine for neurotrauma and uh, in fact uh, this uh, program of neurotrauma of this WF, WNWC is uh, put together by Professor Tariq Khan. So thank you very much Professor Tariq Khan. Uh, I look for, looking forward to your lecture on spinal missile injury. Thank you sir. Uh, hello everyone uh, Naren, thank you very much for inviting me here to this meeting. Um, I think I'm having a bit of difficulty trying to That's okay. uh, share. Um, just give me a little time, please. Sure, no problem. Can you see anything at all? Uh, not no. yet, not yet. You see the green button? Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I, I, I'm seeing that, but uh, this is just a, a new laptop, and I'm, I'm got confused here now. <laughs> That's all. Yes, yes. 
Uh, is there somebody else who can speak and I, I can just try and sort it out? Uh, or if you give me two minutes then? Sure, I can give it. No problem. Take your time. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we can probably ask Dr. Lipa to answer some of the questions sure. while we're waiting. Yeah, that's a good um, idea. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lipa, are you st still uh, around with the computer? Yes, sure. Yes, the, the question we had on the chat box is whether or not you feel that education for uh, uh, low and middle income countries should be the same as for uh, high uh, income countries. Uh, should be, uh, <laughs> if not the same, even, even better. <laughs> So the, 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 the very problem of the education for low income countries is that it's exactly what the, the TBI is happening. So <laughs> we're being educated with every possible technology available, but it's, we don't see what they see. So... That that's very true. But uh, the follow-up question to that was, are there any neurodrama fellowships available uh, with worldwide access? Working on that. <laughs> We're working on oh. that. So uh, still, right now, at this moment, uh, um, I think in the panel, there are people who are teaching in the um, core um, course of the global neuro um, organization. So, um, there is also this kind of this kind of neurotrauma education available. So the global neuro the global neuro uh, core curriculum education, it's a wonderful course. So I think um, Professor Carino is still there and teaching and thinking this and this, and Professor Rubiano as well. So yes, there are resources available, but the the fact of moving around from country to country. We, sh we want to build on this concept in the WFNS. So hopefully soon, more <laughs> intriguing news about this. And I think that's a good time for us to, to mention that in March of next year, the, there's a plan for a World Congress of Neurosurgery in Bogota, Colombia. And I'm sure there will be a lot of educational and exchanges uh, on neurotrauma through World Federation. And, and yes. maybe that's the opportunity for us <laughs> to meet in person and, and talk about this in more detail. Oh, there course. was one yes. uh, question or maybe even more of a comment about uh, the importance of pre-hospital care and yes. training to the first responders. I'm sure you've Absolutely. seen this in, in your practice when patients come uh, perfectly managed or completely mismanaged. And, and that's something that we as neurosurgeons <laughs> have to deal with. Exactly. So this uh, in, in uh, 10 days, I will do uh, neurotrauma fundamentals for our region. So for, for pre-hospital care. So because what I want to, to, to ask and to tell them and to thank them for is that my patients are first their patients. So whatever comes to me has, has come to them first. So they are the first step and it's they're critical. There is possible even much more critical than we are. So what we have, it's an outcome. It is not definitive because we have rehabilitation later because we're lucky enough. We're in the high income countries level. So we have rehabilitation later. So, and we have pre-hospital care. So why would we not be at our best in this, in this kind of, yeah, I do a professor of this, yeah. It's perfectly, I do agree. Hospital care is uh, and training is important, it's mandatory, and it's up to us, I think, as well. Well, that's wonderful. And I think, I think you brought an interesting point because it's it's uh, it's what we do is in the middle of the treatment because there's a lot of treatment that needs yeah. to be done before <laughs> we get to the patient, and there's a lot even more treatment after we're done with them. I think Dr. Exactly. Singer's presentation showing patients standing up and moving their extremities after devastating injuries with gunshot wounds and open penetrating things that that results of good rehabilitation things just like this just don't happen from us fixing the problem there's may, my, many other people involved in getting the patients better and it's important to to pay attention to this because otherwise you'll do perfect intervention and the patient will not improve so that will be all exactly. for nothing so, so exactly. I think this entire yeah. continuum is 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 great opportunity for neurosurgeons to take a lead and maybe educate everybody around or maybe create some infrastructure because if we don't do it nobody will do it exactly i i, I where, where do i find yes <laughs> completely agree with you 
here. No much controversy here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. The, once again for this beautiful efforts. I think the importance of uh, having the the dedicated system for education, starting from residency and then going through practice. Um, I know there they had some some plans to have some more the advanced exchanges for people in practice to talk about their uh, innovations, maybe changes. Um, to, to kind of introduce new modalities such as embolizations and, and the, the other aspects of trauma care. This is something that I believe the, the societies will, will continue to take leading role. <laughs> I, I, I will ask Dr. Khan if he has, has his presentation. No, I'm, ter I'm terribly sorry. I'm, I am having some big difficulty. You can carry on and if later on this time, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do it. Well, we, we feel your pain. It happens to all of us. So don't feel yeah. bad about this. It's, uh, I'm sure you will figure yeah. it out. Um, I'll, I'll uh, sort Trent, it can we move along the schedule or are the, um, um, let, let me see if Naren can unmute himself and ask, uh, tell us what, what, what we can do next. So we can, what we have is that uh, Dr. Gupta is just going to um, log in and he will give his talk while Professor Khan uh, <clears throat> gets online with his presentation. While we, while Dr. Gupta is uh, getting uh, ready. Can I ask Professor uh, Reisner, who's the incoming uh, chairman who has just taken over from Professor Khan on what's his plan for the WFNS Neurotrauma Committee? Professor Reisner, uh, would you be able to comment if you're there? Oh, I'll just unmute you. Dr. Reisner, thank you. Yes, um, good morning, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, thanks. Thank you for unmuting me. First of all, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction and, um, uh, and welcome. Uh, the short answer to your question is, um, yes, there's plenty on the agenda. Um, as I think everybody on this committee knows, I have two wonderful co-chairs, one being Laura Lipper, who's just spoken, and the other being Andres Rubiano, who's uh, not with us this morning. Um, our big focus is, as Laura suggested, on, on, on education, um, resident education for both the um, uh, high income and the low and middle income countries. Um, rather than shoot from the hip, how about I just say that there's a lot in the works. Stay tuned and you'll be hearing from the WFNS certainly within the next few weeks. Thank that's, you. That's that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, we should have Dr. Gupta with us very soon, any minute. Thank you very much, Dr. Reisner. We are looking forward to um, um, the uh, you know, your team taking over from the last team, which has been um, um, very productive. I'm sure things will move forwards. And and uh, there's a lot to, to be done in the neurotrauma because you know, we just saw the talk from Professor Schulder, we have you know, neurosurgeons are someone who, if we like gadgets and if we like glory, you know, we do gravitate. I remember when I started neurosurgery, brain tumor surgery was gadolectomy and no one wanted to go and do brain tumor surgery. Then suddenly all the gadgets come now, you can't, people are fighting to get into neuro-oncology, neurosurgery. And the um, and, uh, same way <laughs> with the neurotrauma, I think, as much as it's part of the problem of the society, it's probably part of the problem of the neurosurgeons as well, if I can be harsh about it. What do you think about consultant-led operations for neurotrauma? You, you know and I know that junior residents, middle residents are led to do surgery in most parts of the world, including Europe. And uh, do you think that the outcome will be better if it is consultant-led neurosur neurosurgery operating rather than, uh, you know, learning, young people learning their trade on their own. Thank you, Dr. Eisner. If you, if you could just share that point. Well, let me just probably just... Uh... I, I think it's not fair to put right Dr. Eisner on the spot with this, but uh, Aaron, I think you're right. It's, it's important to, to, to have supervision for these procedures, but at the same time, you know, they, I, I learned by operating on urgent situations, and so I'm sure you did too. And uh, so I think... I think it's important to have this uh, availability of senior people, be that senior residents or fellows who can supervise junior staff um, and, and, uh, and, and not just learn as you go, but be well prepared for this type of interventions because it could be you and me laying on that table with a Absolutely. head injury. So, so it's, it's, not, it's important to have this organized 
and done in a quality fashion. This is not a training opportunity. This is more of the life-saving intervention. And I think the neurotrauma um, uh, is still a large aspect of everyone's neurosurgery. So whenever you're on call, even if you do only vascular or oncology or spine, you will be seeing traumas coming your way. <laughs> And people will be calling neurosurgeon just by virtue of your specialty, taking care of this patient. So, so it's something we cannot give up, something we continue to, to excel in. And I think to have nice people at the helm of societies to, do, to be in charge of education is always important. So, and I think it's uh, uh, time for Dr. Gupta can, to jump in. So. Sure. <laughs> Dr. Gupta, do you want to say, Dr. Andrew Rice, yes. I, I, I own your microphone, sorry. Uh, could you please comment? Uh, do you have any comments on that uh, in terms of whether it's consultant-led? No, yes. I just logged in. I missed out the earlier conversation. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm talking Dr. Reisner. Uh, Dr. Reisner, do you have any comments? Yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Slavin. E everything you said is so true. And uh, let me just state the obvious about trauma. You know, it's, it's just such a huge problem everywhere in the world. Um, and for us, it's just such a um, wonderful is not the right word, but such a fantastic opportunity that we have to really make a difference um, um, regardless of the uh, income of the country. I just know even in our institution, just by, as Laura said, act locally, connect globally, just in our institution, just by forcefully introducing evidence-based guidelines, um, we improve the mortality by 40%. Um, and, you know, if you think that in any way I'm being big headed and saying, gosh, that's great. What a great job you did. Just the opposite. What I'm saying is what a bad job we did beforehand. And, um, there's so many opportunities that just being one, uh, the other part of head injury that I hope that we will focus on for the next two years is concussion just in the realm of head injuries that has been. I won't say neglected, but perhaps needs to be brought to the forefront a little bit more because there's so many opportunities to educate primary care doctors, pediatricians, EMS, et cetera, on how to appropriately manage children who have concussions. Thank, Thank you for you. this moment to allow me to say a few words. Thank you very much, Dr. Reisner. Dr. Deepa Gupta, do you want to please share your presentation? Yes, I will. Thank you. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to... I introduce uh, Dr. Deepa Gupta, who is uh, a colleague as much as, 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 much as a friend. Uh, he's at the old uh, Indian Institute of Medical Sciences in uh, New Delhi. He's uh, a dynamo of new Indian neurosurgery. He's passionate about uh, neurotrauma. He runs the old Indian Institute of uh, Neurosciences um, uh, a conference on neurotrauma. It used to be an annual conference that I used to go. I'm sure once everything is settled, I think he even I had it earlier this year as well. So look forward to your talk. And he's a pediatric neurosurgeon as well. So look forward to your talk, uh, Professor Gupta. Thank you. Thank you, Narin. Thank you, uh, WFNS uh, Neurotrauma Committee for giving me this opportunity. At the onset, I want to apologize for being so uh, kind of uh, on and off. Actually, I'm traveling to Ghana for to assist the local team here for the craniopagus spin separation. So I just landed today and there were some security issues with the president of South Africa visiting this hotel. So I'm really sorry. Uh, uh, Nareen has asked me to talk about uh, the ICU and the medical management in the, in the pediatric head injuries. If I have to summarize my entire talk of 15 minutes in one uh, sentence, all I can say, what I have learned over the last uh, two decades of my practice uh, this is for the younger uh, people out there. You know, the strict adherence to the any guideline, let it be your local, regional, uh, come evidence-based guideline or a brain trauma foundation guideline. At least in my experience, it has really improved the outcome in my group of patients significantly. Now, we all understand, we have been saying it, that children are not small adults. Well, rightly so because their oxygen requirements are quite different. Their water needs, caloric needs are very different. They usually don't manifest with the hypotension. If they can sustain up to 30% of the blood loss without any, uh, you know, without any manifestation being there, except for the tachycardia. Their positioning in the ICU needs to be uh, by uh, astute uh, uh, kind of interventionist or by the, by the nurses because they have a large head, short trachea. You know, there's always a risk of dislodgement of the endotracheal tubes and so on and many other things. So all I want to say is that children, 
children, they require special care by a special team. 2019, uh, we have a uh, new <clears throat> brain trauma foundation guidelines for the pediatric population. It was long overdue. Well, the guidelines probably may not be so robust, but yes, the evidence now what we have in these guidelines is definitely much more stronger, though it is not so solid enough uh, to say, yes, we have got level one or level two. If you look at all these guidelines, uh, you know, all these are level three recommendations and uh, the regarding the ICP monitoring, CPP thresholds, neuroimaging, hyperosmolar therapies, you know, the backbone of neurotrauma care is all centered over mannitol and hypertonic saline. And for the last many, many years, we have been wondering if there's any single randomized controlled trial or a nice decent publication on the role of mannitol uh, in pediatric traumatic brain injury. It is just not there. The steroids, which had a level one evidence of not to use, now it has been pushed to level two, uh, level three now. So the only thing positive I would say is that the level two recommendation as of today is that hyper uh, the bolusis the bolusis of three percent hypertonic saline uh, has been recommended for improvement in the ICP control. Leave apart that everything has got weaker evidence. The conundrum on mannitol, blood sugar values, libera or aptoin persists because there has been no recommendation as of today on the pediatric TBIs. We do have nice. Uh, uh, self-explanatory uh, flowcharts on different ICP pathways, CPP pathways, and Hernician pathways, and how to manage in the in the in the background of uh, general ICU care in this uh, neurotrauma patients, a special group. And uh, there are some recommendations for giving barbiturate therapies, moderate hypothermia, and hyperventilation in select group, especially more so when the child is uh, not reflect, uh, not responding to the conventional measures. So all this actually requires a very uh, dedicated and committed ICU care, I would say. Well, for me, uh, the, the what really changed my practice was uh, my interaction with Seattle group, especially Monica Vavilala and other people, wherein I really learned the, the usefulness of adherence to the uh, guidelines. Monica Vavilala in their center, they just use very basic uh, PICU indicators like maintenance of cerebral perfusion pressure more than 40, enteral nutrition within 72 hours, avoidance of hypocarpia, maintenance of normal temperature or avoidance of hyperthermia. So when they actually started noting this by PICU integrators in their traumatic injured children, they found the outcomes improved by almost 6% just by a mere 1% increase in the clinical practice indicators. And subsequently, the authors, the, 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 all the doctors who were present in the ICU, they started adhering to these guidelines more and more. It increased from 64 to 88%. So this single study actually give a very strong message that in case you have a multidisciplinary, dedicated, uh, committed care to your patients, the outcome definitely improves. So this underscores the importance of ICU care in this population. I'll give you just two very basic examples. On the top, you see one child, a case A, who was managed by one of my colleagues in 2009. The child came with a traumatic brain injury. He had a GCS of uh, 8 by 15, intubated, ICP was 15. The CT, if you see, it looks grossly normal. Like cisterns are seen, there is no uh, ventricular effacement, and there is no parenchymal lesions at all. I think within two hours, the ICP rose to uh, 40, and immediately the child was rushed to the decompressive connectomy. And yes, the child was discharged and came back with some cranioplasty issues and uh, was subsequently lost to follow. Now, the same case, when if the same case presents to me in 2016 after my interaction with the uh, uh, various uh, newer developments in neurotrauma care, I understood that all these children, they have got something called as a vasogenic phenomena. You know, when you look at the ICP, it is not the numbers one should be looking at, it is that the ICP trend one should be looking at. And the ICP trend, if you just zoom in the images, you will see these are more of a uh, kind of a disturbed or uh, deranged cerebral autoregulation base. And these are more of a medical phenomena and they can be very well managed by conservative treatment with the uh, intensifying your uh, decongestants or even the barbiturates. So as of today, my, my practice of decompressive tenectomy has decreased significantly. I would say to the tune of almost one sixth or one seventh of what I was doing once upon a time. We have noted that the ICP monitoring and the placement of catheters does help in lowering the hospital mortality, though it did not have any significant benefit in uh, at three to six months follow-up in the outcomes. So this was our observation. 
and yes icp monitoring has become uh, one of the standard of care i would say in severe traumatic brain injury in the children in fact recently we include, concluded uh, 1000 cases in the adapt study that is approaches and decisions in acute pediatric tbi uh, where all children who were admitted in the icu and had icp monitoring in place they were the basic minimum inclusion criteria which is required so this underscores that icp monitoring is there to stay irrespective of what the level of evidence we have as of now this was another child who actually needed to be operated but because the child was unstable and his gcs of 4 we decided to manage him on conservative his icp was high and he had multiple issues of coagulopathies and other other issues so we decided to manage him on uh, phenobarbiton coma and uh, we gave him for two days and subsequently tapered and the child uh, responded well and uh, this is the protocol of the barbiturate coma which we are following at our institute and we keep the psi to less than 12 in majority of our patients and phenobarbiturate is usually preferred having said that barbiturate coma is not something which can be given in any and every icu especially in the distant setup because it has its attendant risk of uh, hypotension requiring vasopressor therapies hypokalemia and hyperkalemia and of course increased incidence of infection so all these things have to be noted by the people who are uh, practicing uh, barbiturate therapies now coming to the adapt study uh, which was the study which looked at various uh, parameters of the hypothesis to prove or to disprove the first question which we wanted to answer whether the csf diversion of the ebd we all believe that you know in a patient is having a raised pressure uh, you put in a ebd drain out some csf and you have got better outcome and in fact this is the recommendation in the newer 2019 guideline also however when we looked at our data of uh, almost 314 cases we noted that the difference was not significant so in fact in our study there was no beneficial effect of invasive csf diversion on outcomes in children with severe tbi and probably because this btf guidelines are living guidelines they are likely to be updated based on the results of the adapt study second thing which we commonly talk about is like hyperosmolar therapy what to give whether should we give hypertonic line or 20% mentol again we found that 3% hypertonic line bolus reduce icp and increased cpp however mentol only increase the cerebral perfusion pressure overall effect of the both hypertonic line and the mentol were modest and they were not different during icp crisis greater effects were observed with 3% hypertonic line so the trend was more towards uh, i would say a hypertonic line however when we did the adjustment for the age for the sex for the traumatic for the severity of trauma ais and various other parameters after adjustment the, the difference in the icp and the cpp control was not significant but there was a definite trend especially in the unadjusted values there is some role of using uh, advanced monitoring like uh, cerebral microdialysis in select group of patients in fact we had done a study on looking at uh, the various parameters like looking at the importance of cerebral hypoglycemia and i always had a doubt in my mind you know if there is any because many of these patients they don't respond after correction of cpp you know we have been talking about rosner's concept and lund's concept for uh, uh, taking care of the cerebral perfusion pressure so in fact many patients with a with a high uh, lactate pyruvate ratio of more than 25 some of the patients actually responded to the raising the blood pressure some did not and the reason was many of these patients they go into something called as a mitochondrial dysfunction and that's a distinct group uh, it's a it's a it's a, it's a type 2 uh, vespa um, type 2 lpr elevation where in the pyruvate level there is a mismatch between the lactate and the and the pyruvate level so you can actually distinguish these two groups because the management is different in these patients hypothermia per se actually has fallen out of favor you know we all know about this cool kid study uh, wherein there was no definite benefit uh, shown but still in patients with a refractory hypertension and even in this uh, new 2019 guidelines now what to give whether you want to give uh, barbiturates or you want to give hypothermia or you want to hyperventilate i think you just have to play around with the jigs and puzzles and sometimes uh, when you have got nothing to uh, lose and uh, some many of these patients i do end up uh, giving them um, uh, two or more therapies at the same time to help in their outcomes we have got newer advanced tools in the icu nowadays which are very useful 
we have developed a special protocol and uh, because i think every institute should have uh, their protocols these protocols can be based on brain trauma foundation guidelines they can be based on evidence based practice they can be based on regional practice because not many centers in the world they will have access, access to the expensive icp monitors brain tissue oxygenation monitoring so i think we need to monitor our uh, guidelines based on what resources which we have and uh, based on that we have uh, kind of developed our own protocols and uh, we are following those protocols as you can see this is a busy child uh, receiving hypothermia or uh, receiving barbiturate coma uh, with a number of monitors which are there in place to monitor the child so to summarize i would say that the uh, the, the 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 importance of icp uh, the importance of icu care cannot be uh, undermined uh, i feel that a multidisciplinary approach using standard care pathways is associated with improved outcomes the icv monitoring is there to stay and it helps in the improved outcomes in the children csf drainage though actually we did not get good results or a kind of a definite values in improving outcome however i would say that uh, it remains optional and uh, in case uh, somebody is very competent and capable to put csf drainage evds in uh, these uh, children i would say there is no harm doing that the overall effect of both hypotonic saline and mannitol they are quite modest and they are not different but during icp crisis definitely greater effects have been observed with 3% hypotonic saline compared to mannitol and lastly i think the barbiturate coma in select cases helps in improvement of the outcome and in fact uh, my personal observation is that many of the decompensatory connectomies which we are doing in this children uh, we have been able to cut them down to significant levels especially in patients having just diffuse brain swellings with high icp uh, without any significant or uh, sizable parenchymal lesions thank you dr gupta that was wonderful summary um that was uh, very impressive to see what's going on now and what the, how the guidelines are helpful and and having protocols it, it makes perfect sense uh, there will be some questions for you in chat box, and I think, for interest of time, we'll ask you to answer them if you don't mind directly uh, to the to the to the. Uh, I'll, do I'll do that. I'll do that. I, I had a question for you from from our experience. You know, the it, it always puzzled me that you know the people probably have different perfusion pressure at baseline. I mean, people who are chronically hypertensive probably require a little bit more uh, blood uh, pressure to perfuse their brain, and people who are living with low blood pressure probably do not need the same numbers. Um, are, is there any trend toward individualization of uh, CPP management, or are we still doing exactly the same number for everybody? What's your thinking on that? <laughs> More or less the same numbers. In very young children, I would say infants around 40, uh, older children around 50. Adults, I usually go for something more than 60. So, you know, the, the problem is in the ICP. Despite uh, I'm despite me talking about ICP waveforms, but majority of us we just end up looking at the ICP numbers only, and then we draw some in, indirect conclusions about the CPP. So if you ask me honestly speaking, how many of the clinicians or including me are actually uh, really targeting the CPP based therapies? I would say they are handful. That's a very honest confession. That, that, that's that's very that's very interesting to hear. I mean, we've, we've been really focusing on CPP for forever, but but I think you're absolutely right. It's it's a, it's not the routine practice, and I, I I notice that in many places people just watch ICP number as it is the most important, and it's it's a it's it's interesting because this this attempt to persuade community to pay attention to CPP has been around for probably thirty years, if I'm not wrong, and it's uh, yeah. it's still a difficult stereotype to overcome. I really appreciate your, your your answering questions and 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 please look at the chat box. I'm sure there's plenty of very interesting points Thank you raised so there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Gupta. So um, I'm um, pleased to uh, inform you that Professor Khan uh, has um, is now technically all ready to go. Professor Khan, as I said, is the one who put together this uh, um, uh, neurotrauma symposium. So thank you very much, Prof Khan. He's a doyen of neurosurgery and uh, uh, neurotrauma around the world. So looking forward to your uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Allen. Thank you for inviting me. Sorry for uh, this problem. Uh, so I'm going to talk about spinal missile injuries. Uh, previously, my friend uh, uh, Sinha spoke about cranial missile injuries. Uh, this is where I work in, in, in Peshawar, Pakistan. <clears throat> so basically, you must remember that there are different types of uh, missiles, like low resolution injuries, high velocity injuries, and then of course, blast injuries and others. 
and the low velocity are handguns and they have riflings and they have a slower muzzle velocity of 700 to 1400 uh, feet per second. Uh, whereas the high velocity are the ones which have got uh, rifled barrels and their uh, muzzle velocity very high with a very high kinetic energy. And as was said earlier on that they have a yawing effect where the bullet tumbles uh, and it develops a cavitation area. And if you look at this diagram, it will really, the size would increase to up to 25 times of the normal size um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the original bullet because of the tumbling effect. <clears throat> the incidence has increased uh, dramatically. Uh, it has become 13 to 17% of traumatic spine injuries and the management uh, is still not exactly very clear at times. Uh, as this uh, paper suggests regarding the strategy for diagnosis and treatment, and it talks about that there's little information on the management of the lesions, uh, and we need to discuss regarding whether what should we assess uh, in the spine and in the patient uh, to make sure regarding the spinal injuries from a missile. Uh, and the important things are the stability, the compressive extrusion, the accommodation in discal space, and the contact with CSF of the missile. <clears throat> of course, the management remains the same, basically ABCD, uh, antibiotics plus anti-tetanus, wound care, care of other injuries, and two questionable uh, management criteria regarding steroids, question mark, highly, and surgery. <clears throat> we use, since we know that a majority of these organisms are staph aureus, we use broad spectrum antibiotics, cephalosporines, uh, with metronidazole, and of course, anti tetanus is given to the patients. <clears throat> now, the use of steroids, there were some studies done. <clears throat> and if you remember PVSD, we used to use methylprednisolone, dexamethasone quite a lot. Uh, and it's today it's said that it should not be used. In fact, it can increase the rate of complications, especially infections, if steroids are used uh, in these patients. When is surgery required? Uh, surgery, uh, previously every firearm injury was operated on. Uh, when I came here to Pakistan in the early 90s, there was a lot of firearm injuries, uh, Klashenkov uh, injuries, and everybody would be operated on. There would be a lot of pressure from the relatives also to operate on these patients because of the bullet lying there. So the important factors are if there's a bullet in the spinal canal, if there is CSF leak, if there's a spinal instability, or if there's gradual deterioration of the patient. And the same is said of in this uh, article in the Asian Spine Journal, that if you have an instability, or if you have CSF leak, or if there's a, a, there's a, there's a bullet in the canal. Um, then another article, gunshot injury of the spine, it says that Surgical treatment is associated with a higher complication rate than conservative treatment. Therefore, the surgeon must know the treatment limitations uh, uh, and recognize which patient will truly benefit from this surgery. I just want to give you a small experience of ours of 42 cases in the last five years. Um, and we had mostly young patients, less than age 35. Um, Majority were male patients, where the injury mechanism was majority was low velocities, and uh, majority again were in close range injuries. Uh, so mostly were uh, pistol weapons shot, uh, not the Klashenkov one. The Klashenkov ones actually, or the high velocity ones, would uh, damage many other organs, and uh, probably by the time they would arrive, they would be dead, or they may not arrive from the scene of uh, where they've been shot. Um, so we looked at the arrival blood pressure and uh, majority uh, had a low blood pressure of 110 because of loss of blood um, and other reasons. And of course, the patients with a lower blood pressure had a higher morbidity and mortality. And the SPO2 majority had greater than 95. The levels uh, seen were most of the patients had a thoracic injury uh, and followed by lumbar and then cervical. We looked at the TDIC score, uh, but, we've, but we found in other papers also suggested 
that the TDX score really does not help. And you know, and the TDX is regarding the morphology, integrity of the posterior uh, column and the neurological status. And this would predict the outcome in spinal injuries. But it was found in this paper uh, and even otherwise that both the TDX uh, and uh, the Dennis systems did not really provide very good prognostic information in, in spinal missile injuries. Uh, uh, this is the Dennis classification, as you know, and it talks about compression, burst, seat belt type, fracture dislocation. Interventions, as I said initially, when uh, when I came back to Pakistan in early 90s, we were doing a lot of uh, decompressions, and now we are going more and more for conservative management uh, because of that. And uh, the interventions were spinal fixation, uh, decompression, and debridement of the wounds. Uh, many different types of complications. Uh, <clears throat> meningitis was seen quite a lot. Uh, ventricular uh, uh, ventilatory dependence was seen in patients with cervical injuries. Of course, pulmonary embolism, bed sores, etc., were also there. Uh, and uh, patients who had cervical injuries were the ones who were on the ventilation, and uh, there were many numbers where greater than ten days ventilation was required. And of course, tracheostomy was required for that. And the duration in ICU again, and these were the patients mostly of cervical spine injuries. Mortality uh, uh, was, was, was uh, low, and uh, the mortality seen mostly was in the cervical injuries, uh, as would be obvious from the injury in the cervical region. Um, and the length of stay was uh, less than five days, in majority of the patients. Three patients expired, 26 were satisfactory, and 13 had poor outcome. Uh, some of them had to go home on uh, home ventilation as well. So in conclusion, spinal missile injuries are more in young males. Dorsal spines are most commonly involved. Ventilator dependence due to respiratory failure is commonest in cervical injury trauma. Surgical selection is very, very important now, and use of steroids is not very helpful. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Dr. Khan. It definitely was worth the wait. So <laughs> I'm glad you were able to get it through. So, okay. uh, the, um, in general, though, the, I mean, I, I was interested to hear your comments about fewer injuries from Kalashnikovs. Is it because just fewer guns or because, you know, you uh, people are becoming more precise and the victims are just not coming to you anymore? Yes, as I, I said, was well, that the Kalashnikov injuries, because there are many uh, injuries other than the spine, they, they get abdominal injuries, they get vascular injuries. So by the, I, I, we believe that they do not arrive uh, into, uh, uh, into the hospital from that. Uh, so, so that is why. And the pistol wounds, the low velocity wounds are the ones uh, which uh, do less damage and, and they are able to arrive into the hospital in time. The, um, in, in terms of the, the same question that we had before for cranial injuries, do, <clears throat> what's, what's your choice of antibiotics when, when you do this and, and how long you keep the patients on them? So as I said, if, uh, if you look at the uh, literature, this is Steph aureus is the most common uh, organism and so um, the cephalosporin third generation with metronidazole uh, are there and I think you need to put them on until the wound obviously heals at least for two weeks uh, you, you have to do them and and that sepsis is one of the as I said earlier sepsis and meningitis are the main uh, problems which can can occur from these sort of injuries. Do you have any experience with local application of antibiotics uh, at the at the end of your debridement? Yes, uh, we we do wash them with different antibiotics, the wounds, and uh, uh, really not sure how helpful that is. It is, but uh, it's like pouring holy water, you know, it may help. Abhi zam zam. Oh, yeah, I think if you have holy water and you can use it for this, that's, that wouldn't hurt. I mean, there, there's whatever we can do to, to help these patients is definitely worth it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm impressed that somebody has the same thing about antibiotic powder. Uh, so I guess I'm not the only one thinking about this. The, uh, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's fascinating. Obviously, there's work in progress. And I'm glad that you were um, uh, and will still be remaining at the, at the helm of the Neurotrauma Committee because it's a, 
it's important to get this information out and, and get people trained in terms of how to do it in the right way in the right speed and uh, and with the right concentration. Uh, I have handed over to Andrew Reznor, so he's the new chair, and I'll be assisting him in any way he, he wants me to. I'm sure Dr. Reisner will be counting on your support and help, and uh, as there's a lot of events are planned already. So that that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank I you. would encourage you to answer the questions on chat box, and I'll give it back to Naren for introducing the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Khan. I will, I will come to the end of the session and thank you again. So now I, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Maximilian McDonald. Uh, Dr. Mac, Professor McDonald is an emeritus professor uh, at the uh, Department of Neurosurgery in Kiel and he's still active neurosurgeon uh, with a very big interest in rehabilitation as well as in functional neurosurgery. He and Dr. Slavin have been the functional neurosurgery doyens of the LISERF. Professor Ma Maximilian McDon has taught on all of our courses uh, uh, for the last four or five years. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McDon. Looking forward to your lecture on rehabilitation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. No, and so kind introduction. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, yes. that's so it seems to work. Finally, I've had the problem previously also. <laughs> so I should talk about neurorehabilitation after trauma. As you all know, prevention is better than therapy. That's a typical Pakistan picture. Thanks to Tariq, who invited me a couple of times, and uh, Salman Sharif, who invited me a couple of times to Pakistan. But neurorehabilitation is mandatory after all of these injuries. So I hope it will, I will continue. So the optimal path of a neurosurgical trauma patient, obviously acute care with a car accident here that should be taken care of by the emergency doctors, emergency staff, and that's very important. But Laura Lippi told us then get optimal therapy, got optimal rehabilitation to, to come back to social reintegration. That's the optimized way we would like to have all our patients going, but unfortunately that's not the case. A neurorehabilitation and its purposes, the patient's pass going home. I should talk a little about neurosurgery and neurorehabilitation and rehabilitation concerns in patients suffering from traumatic brain injury. It's very important. We not only have to watch about the motor functions, but we do have to remember that neuropsychology is also a very, very important outcome after acquired brain injury, vestibular rehabilitation, and many more facets of this entire business. Uh, of the very, very, very delicate system, which is disturbed by trauma should be taken con uh, care of. Uh, after a patient suffering from traumatic brain injury, comprehensive physical rehabilitation is also mandatory. Very, very important. So major goals of neurorehabilitation are that the patient should be enabled to, to perform again and show activities toward activi attractive aims, reduce em emotional burdens and show more activities again to give support to all patients with disabilities to arrange and the relatives as well. It's very important to arrange with a new situation to develop a new kind of uh, identity if it's necessary, which is in contact with the past, but also looking forward. Uh, the, some kind of quality control follow, year, follow up after two years after discharge has been published a couple of years ago in a group of patients being age 34 years, length of stay half a year, not only all the time inpatient, but in this uh, setting prior to treatment, about 70% were unable to work after treatment, only 6% remained unable to work. So it's very good, uh, good treatment algorithm, which can be achieved. People are getting older and older, so the age is the main risk factor. Trauma patients are different. Uh, increasing rate of older patients with profound disabilities over the next 30 years, 70% is getting an enormous increasing direct cost, indirect cost will occur. What is important also, also in this setting of our group, globally only 3% of individuals who need rehabilitation really get it. I'll show you some pictures afterwards. 46 countries, 40% did not have established rehabilitation programs among those who had been asked a couple of years ago. Lack of routinely collected data of disability is one of the problems in low income countries, limited information about the needs of persons with deficit, different understanding of disability of politicians and healthcare and macro level policy and planning that all needs to be taken care of. I don't want to go because of the time. Rehabilitation, neurorehabilitation is a design of learning the situation. Neurorehabilitation is a design of situations to train the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves to become functionally as normal as possible. So like 
walking on various grounds. It's 100 years old, more than 100 years old. It's one of the starts. And uh, so nowadays, uh, 100 years after the first picture, there was the International Classification of Function, ICF, Functional Disability and Health. Activities are in the center of all the goals which we want to achieve for the patient concerning his health problems, participating in normal life, personal factors need to be considered as well environmental factors, body function and structures as well. So it's a lot a lot of to do. Now we have this context sensitive uh, context of uh, neurorehabilitation. We should focus on all day activities, useful action, reasonable tests as dynamic evaluation compared to previously used standardized tests, flexible target oriented learning. So we have to incorporate the patient in uh, taking care of what he wants to learn. He needs to be oriented to participation activities and not only inpatient all the time, but outpatient as much as possible. And the entire team participates in narrative reconstruction. Uh, re construction. So we have development of strategies which orients on activities, participation and resources. At the beginning of a rehabilitation program, it needs to be discussed with the patient to, himself what is realistic and his relatives as well and a smart strategy specific measurable achievable relevant should be and targeted should be aimed for when he is integrated in neurorehabilitation so neurorehabilitation immediate starts after the injury at least after surgery and early rehabilitation in neurosurgical ICU is very important. And then we send the patient to the neuro rehab unit. So the question always arises where does the new rehab unit needs to be located, hospital-based, which is very good because you can take care of all the complications which may occur, shunt, occlusion, cranioplasty, dislocation, infection, whatever, versus outpatient neurorehabilitation or both. I think hospital-based with good neurorehabilitation is that the ideal situation because the problem way of short ways. Monitoring vital parameters in the neurosurgical ICU, including basal stimulation, allowing the relatives to ICU as much as long as possible. That's standard of care in uh, southern countries, but in northern and western countries, it's a little bit more difficult. And then prepare the patient already in the ICU for the neurobilitation like having not only look at the sky, the white wall, but uh, look at everything, get basal stimulation, get him with many activities. And then we have to grade the patient to, to develop the sequence of treatment. There's a bottle index, early bottle index, and the index of daily living, leading to eating, control of bladder, and all these things, which can be measured in 100% means independent. We have these different phases in Germany, Europe, uh, acute phase, and so on. They are really defined by four weeks, by eight, less than eight weeks. So we have a patient go on on a certain certain level of uh, steps, and uh, which is paid by the insurance companies. And uh, they go from our unit, they go rapidly to such a unit, which is a dedicated team of many specialists. And you see that the one patient has two employees on average. So that's a group of dedicated people, which is very important for them. And then comes the phase B re neurobilitation. So from one study like uh, pool 10 years ago, high age certainly has a high risk of dying, high points of GCS respectively, Bartix index, uh, represent a reduced risk of dying within the five years. Following impairment, obligatory surveillance, mean uh, ranking scale of two to four, modified ranking scale is two to four. Communication disorders, this all needs to be taken care of. That's it. Well, sorry, what happened? Sorry. So predictors of employment outcomes at one year pre-injury status, employment status, label of education. Sorry. That's all important to know, etiology. We have lost your uh, presentation. Oh, too bad. I So I have to see how I come back again. Thanks. You cannot see anything? Uh, we can see you. And the beautiful that's bad. That's a no good thing. Sorry, I have to see. I can, maybe I can try again to some more. I go back again in this, uh, sorry. I'll be back soon. Better? Yep. Okay, so I go switch over again to this. Uh, so in the causes of spinal cord injury, obviously we do not have so much uh, gunshot wounds as Tariq Khan uh, told us, but we have causes of spinal 
court, injury to work, traffic, diving, and other trauma. And no trauma is getting more and more because of this old population. So the patients are taken care of very well in our neighborhood in close to Hamburg. And they do all kinds of exercises in the setting and they go get all kinds of additional th therapy like this walking mill. And finally, such a patient can come out uh, after tetraplegia, walking, uh, being able to, to guide his wheelchair only by his mouth. Uh, he's on breath, con breathing control and everything. He seems to be happy yet, but he doesn't know what's going to happen on for his future life. So we have to take care also the social economic environment. What is very important, which we, what we learned intensively when we had this uh, trauma committee a course in, in, in Peshawar, thanks again to Dr. Prasad Khan, Neurorehabilitation Pakistan style supports the patient. And I was mostly impressed by this. It's not our disabilities seen from the patient side, it's our abilities that count. And we have to support them, support them to become as much as possible active, active, active. So they need to get the grip client-centered approach, gain context, intentional interaction, partial participation, improve the goal setting. That's all very important. Speaking from a rich country, but that's uh, true for everyone, severity of traumatic brain injury, the basic always physio ergotherapy, basic stimulation, and then only come the uh, more sophisticated things like regional TMS or invasive uh, brain machine interfaces, which are the very last resort for some very selected patients. Technological advances are certainly on the market coming out. Brain machine interfaces are more and more important. You see here like working and then learning to walk with such an exoskeleton, they're much more in direct simulation of the, of the spinal cord, for example, in paraplegia patient. But one always has to be very careful what is really good for the patient. Like here, example, post-stroke rehabilitation devices offered via internet a study coming out from, from Peru. They found that only 35% of the devices had an RCT that proved efficacy for rehabilitation purposes. So don't buy everything, don't sell everything, don't ask the patient to get these and these devices and they are really, unless they are really well, well taken care of. Problems of uh, resources, that's not so much for our countries, but we're also coming into this area, but mostly for low and middle income countries, money spent on your surgical intervention. And then they need some money to go for rehab, mon some money for independence and some money for wheelchair accessibility. And if you see such a picture, which I owe to my friend Kashia Fadawi, a dedicated occupational therapist from South Africa, Cape Town, if you see such a thing, that's very difficult for a patient with a wheelchair to get along in such a township. And increasing the burden of the disease is if the breadwinner is left disabled. So it's very important. What we also have to take in, into account, the problem of manpower and your surgeons, your rehabilitation is they are well distributed. They are in a mass uh, distributed over Northern hemisphere, but it's very difficult to have sufficient number of neurosurgeons getting better. When I compare the situation to 40 years ago, when I started neurosurgery, now it's really making big progress due, also due to the World Federation of Surgeons. But if you look at these uh, figures, ranks of educators, occupational therapy educators, again, a slide which I know took from Kashefa. There are many educators in South Africa as in all OT programs combined. So you see South Africa is an exemption, but otherwise in many, many of the other countries, very little possibilities to get a good physiotherapy, to get a good occupational therapy. So we have to work on it, to join forces between the World Federation Neurosurgeons and Neurorehabilitations. Thank you very, very much. Some ideas about neurorehabilitation. Thank you future by, of our patients by research, human patient caregiver intervention, tailored neurorehabilitation, maybe for these countries because uh, mobile phones are there on the market, training on machine robot for repetitive tasks, if this possible assistive strategies and so on and so on. Ethics of neurorehabilitation restore the autonomy of the patient. That's the most important thing and keeps the family alive and uh, surviving. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Professor Medron. Thank you very much for sharing this because it's uh, something we 
which is generally aware of, but uh, I was not, I did not know all these details and that was very impressive to see. And I think your information about the study from Peru about internet-based uh, things are, is very it's eye-opening. A uh, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a mess, no? <laughs> yeah. and, and that's what we see. I mean, we see all this advertisement and which is, uh, is either completely uh, not helpful or sometimes harmful because it consumes right. resources and distracts patients from more effective treatments. Correct. So I think to have somebody who is uh, um, involved uh, enthusiastic uh, and capable is is very important, and I would encourage random, random, uh, all the random, colleagues random. worldwide to find somebody who is who is just that in their locale, and then try to work with that person or that team, because that will improve the outcome of your patients. Otherwise, everything you do will be for nothing if patients don't get proper rehabilitation afterwards. Right. So I think it's it's uh, it's, it's it's important that we pay attention to this, and I appreciate Naren's efforts to make this in a very logical way because. I think it makes sense for us to start with with most devastating injuries, talk about the management of patients, and ultimately end up with near rehabilitation. I think it was very, very interesting session, Arena. I want to thank you very much for putting this together and the Neurotrauma Committee of WFNS who contributed to the program and provided speakers. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful to see all this happening. So uh, I think my part is over. So I, 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 I would uh, give, give the... If the um, uh, the, the, my turn to, to Naren, and, and, and I will encourage everybody to stick around for the for the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Konstantin, uh, uh, Dr. Slavin. That was a fantastic uh, uh, chairing of the uh, uh, amazing session of neurotrauma. Once again, I thank Professor McDonald and all the speakers for that uh, important session that we had. Um, uh, I couldn't thank more for Professor Tariq Khan for, for putting this a neurotrauma program together. Thank you very much, Prof Khan, and looking forward to working with you in years to come uh, and actively. Thank you very much. So this takes us to uh, us to the, the important and final session, uh, uh, which is pediatric neurosurgery. And uh, this is a general session, so it doesn't matter whether you are a skull-based surgeon or a vascular surgeon or a neurotrauma surgeon, uh, you will find this very useful because this is on how to improve outcomes. So uh, I will just see whether uh, here we have got uh, a co-chair uh, is Professor um, uh, Helio Rubens Machado, a doyen of uh, pediatric neurosurgery, one of the founders of the modern pediatric neurosurgery in um, Brazil, which is a very active pediatric neurosurgery community. So it's great to have Professor um, uh, Ruben Machado to co-chair. Like before, uh, Professor Machado, I'm going to introduce the speakers and if you could please take the discussions through. Um, um, for want of time, I moved my talk to the end on centralization. Uh, and I want to start with Professor uh, uh, um, uh, or Dr. Mutas Habel. It gives me distinct privilege and honor to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Habel. Uh, Dr. Habel uh, is a, a plastic surgeon uh, who uh, is a pioneer in plastic surgery as well as craniofacial surgery. He is the editor-in-chief of uh, the, the premier uh, journal for craniofacial surgery, the Journal of Craniofacial Surgery for the last 35 years. And uh, uh, he... Uh, is going to talk to us about uh, the most important thing about uh, you know outcomes in cranial synostosis. So, Professor Habel, uh, just to let you know, for any of you ambitious neurosurgeons, including me, um, Professor Habel has publication over nine hundred. So, anyone wants to compete with that, you are welcome to. Dr. Habel, thank you very much. Good morning. Do you Good hear morning. me? Yes, do you, absolutely. Do you, do you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, fantastic introduction. I was wondering if it was really me, but I said maybe he's talking about me. <laughs> it's such a great honor for me to be with a group like you. As uh, you mentioned, I am a plastic surgeon and I do primarily craniofacial surgery. And craniofacial surgery does not infringe on neurosurgeons because it does not deal with the brain. We only deal with the vault, with the bone, pericranium, and skull. So this way, we, we remove the whole thinking that those craniofacial surgeons are taking our specialty. We are not. Mm -hmm. And whenever we work, 
uh, from the days I was in training at Harvard till now, I always have a neurosurgeon with me uh, and I always have a neurosurgeon giving me advice about the brain that we are trying to manipulate. Saying all of that, I'm going to start. Craniosynostosis is a very uh, uh, interesting disease. It's a congenital malformation. It's a big bag of worm, and, and many people confuse it with a lot of other things. Some of them have regular surgery. Some of them have unnecessary surgery. But the important thing is that you have to understand the differential diagnosis when you see those patients. We are certainly working on improving the outcome. The third party want to reduce the cost. They want less complication, which are really a problem because that costs a lot of money. And the clinical improvement improve the structure. And so I am bring that structure all the time. So nobody will call it cosmetic improvement because it's a structure for those growing children to have a near normal structure, improve the function and have a quality of life. I will go to that last one a few times because that is an important aspect, the quality of life that we have to deal with as we are going. Historical background. This goes all the way back to Virchow in the 1800, followed by Harvey Cushing, where he wrote in his book, if you do strip craniectomy to improve imbecility, that surgeon should be disre disreputed. So we have to be careful what we do in whatever we do in order to improve the structure and the function of the patient. We already have guidelines of care. And I think our friends from the Netherlands has published already a couple of supplements uh, that they have uh, stress that it is important and imperative that we have a, a guidelines of care when we work with the, uh, with the patient. Then when we look at the outcome, we have short term, which is 90% of what is in the literature is short term. We have long term and we have permanent and we are back again on quality of life. That's what we are working on now to see what quality of life those patients have. Are they getting a PhD? Are they becoming uh, a professional? Are they having an achievement? Are they having an improvement? These are the important things that we have to look at. Craniosynostosis is a syndrome which we leave away this time because that's very complicated. That will take me about two days of going over the syndrome. The non-syndrome is what we are really focusing on, which means there is a single or a double suture that is closed. And then there is the formation of plagiocephaly. And the, the Australian people have really very nicely developed what they call a Mercedes-Benz sign. If you have a positive Mercedes-Benz sign, the patient does not have synostosis. And this is where the two lambdoid and the sagittal meet at the porion, and you see that very nicely open uh, sutures, but the patient at this point really have severe deformity and that deformity in the formation of is due to softening of the bone with the new advice to put the patient on their back, the bone, the bone flatten the head, scoot up the front part of the head and make the patient look as if he really need a lot of work. That one does not need surgery, that need that needs supportive therapy, what we need to do. Craniosynostosis, all you want to know, but you're afraid to ask. The journal Craniofacial Surgery in the last 35 years have 280 paper. We are instituting on the engine artificial uh, intelligence. So you don't have to look at every paper if you want to look at the appearance, if you want to look at the IQ, whatever. PubMed had done times that and all had artificial intelligence instituted into all those papers. So it is not essential that you read every paper that is there, but it is essential that you are familiarized with what is going on. So craniofacial surgery, scalp, pericranium, bone, 
and the dura. This is all, they are all above that area as scalp and pericranium and the dura. Outcome depend on how those structures are put in the appropriate way in order to be able to have the patient grow a normal life, a normal appearance, perform his regular sport activity and do whatever they want to do. There are standards of care. They are available everywhere. Uh, guidelines of care with benchmarks. Uh, most of them came primarily from the Netherlands and we have published them as a supplement and they are available for all of you. Uh, and we are going to make all of those papers available for your group. I already talked with the group in our publisher and we're gonna make all of that information and education available to the crew with no cost. I, I, I think that will be a great thing. The diagnostic criteria in order to determine what you have is a 3D scan. And it is very essential that a 3D scan is available. And I think the time where we do x-rays and try to struggle with the x-ray, whether or not there is synostosis, is far gone. What are the sur surgical procedures? I'm not here to discuss which is better and which is not. Suturectomy, Jim Goodrich wrote a very nice editorial. Uh, I, you all know Jim Goodrich is fantastic friend, and we lost him with the COVID. Endoscopic strip is primarily taking the bone out initially. Now they are using orthotics. Orthotics are two forms. There are a dynamic orthotic and there are a static orthotic. So when you do a dynamic orthotics, you are really squeezing or squashing the brain or scratching the bone after you cut the outside so that you can send the shape from a banana shape to a more normal shape. The silicone strip by Dr. Shilito was a great uh, use in the 45, and now it's no more used because if the long uh, term, you have to sit down and pick up all of those strips from the brain, and they are really cumbersome and dangerous. Total scar remodeling is still to be the outside outstanding procedure today, and the pie and the pie procedure that came from the group in, uh, in, in uh, the Northeast, I think this is uh, accepted. You take a big pie from the back and then you put the patient, uh, allow the patient to expand uh, laterally and, and the reduce anterior posterior diameter. What else do we have? We have distraction osteogenesis. If you look at the last, uh, I would say two or three years, you see a lot of paper using distraction, and that's really the pioneering in that coming from Japan. This is how we are living in a global community. Whatever well known in one area around the world is known all over the world. That's what we are striving for in education. The one who benefit most is the patient. And then we have the springs that came from Sweden. And you see that came from Sweden. And now it's adopted by almost a lot of people who know how to use a spring, how to manufacture a spring, and how to apply the spring. And of course, the orthotics continue to be a major thing that we all need to know about. What's the practice today? We see the patient with a craniofacial surgeon. We see the patient as a team, the, the plastic surgeon and the neurosurgeon work hand in hand together to give the best possible outcome. Physical exam and look at the flat spot on the patient. Diagnose with the proper tool and 3D scan today is the standard of care. Every patient, we submit them to 3D scan and they are short cut, not five millimeter cut. They don't show you anything. They are one millimeter or one and a half millimeter cuts. So you can have an adequate delineation of the problem that you are dealing with. Always recommend to work together to give the patient the best outcome. Whether they decide to be, uh, you want to work on, on a spring, you want to work on, on uh, a total remodeling, 
or you want to work on distraction, it's a, it's a surgical one, but a surgical decision, but you have always to follow the patient long-term and short-term. It's very it's a, essential. And you, we have to evaluate the patient structurally and functionally. A cognitive development evaluation. We initially used to do uh, the cognitive development. We used to do the Denver test. Now we do the MOCA test, which is a Montreal test. It is important to follow those patients to see if, is, is their brain working or you just did an exercise in futility. You just took the bone out, throw it out, and then you tell the patient, come and see me when they are uh, 50 years old. We are working now on quality of life metric. There is no re report on that. And I think that I was asked that question a couple of times. We were going to start the working on the quality metric. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, pandemic came in such a fast fashion that this is now on the uh, back burner. Uh, once the, the stuff is gone, we are going to use a... Uh, a total evaluation on a global phenomena with all the global surgeons, with all those who do a combined team approach and see what is the two important aspects in the evaluation of outcome, function and the structure. And that's really very important that to keep in mind. And I think I'd like to make sure with, with my talk today, that you know that a teamwork is an absolute essential for working together with patients with craniosynostosis in order to achieve the best possible outcome. Now, do not mix those isolated craniosynostosis with the other patient that that have uh, other aspects, uh, especially the formation of plagiocephaly, which should not be operated on. And also with syndromal, they are a, a big different one. I, I still see till today, after 45 years in practice, I still see patients who come in with a cruise on an apron and they have the bone removed totally and thrown out. And, and I have to sit down and work and see how I am going to go ahead and manufacture bone that was thrown needlessly. Bone is very essential. Bone is important. Bone is inert. So when you throw the bone away, you cannot come and bring somebody else's bone in because it has a genetic constituent. It has a rejection area. And therefore you cannot put an allogenic bone into the area where the patient have lost all this bone. And just, just about a few days ago, uh, I was called uh, that uh, a diagnosis was made uh, of a patient. Uh, it seems to be from overseas. They want to send it, of course. They cannot come here because of the COVID. Uh, I think it, it, it sounds like a cruise on. And the surgeon there told them, all you have to do is take the bone and throw it out. Uh, I think this practice should stop. And I think the only way it stops is by education. And that's why we have so many papers on educating people who work in the field. And in our hospitals here, it's a team approach. We always work as a team, the neurosurgeon and the plastic surgeon. I hope that really it took all my time out. Uh, and if you, have any, uh, uh, if you have any question, I'll be glad to, to answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Machado, could you please uh, chair that discussion time? I have to tell you before, before we start, uh, it's an honor for me to be with your group. I, I am really, I, you won't believe how happy I am, uh, even happier than when I, I gave a, a lecture about reconstructing the uh, bone to the, the neuro, uh, Neurosurgical uh, Association. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Habal. Um, Professor Helios, uh, uh, Professor yeah. Machado, did uh, you want to? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nari. This uh, was a fantastic uh, talk. Uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Uh, Mutas, uh, which uh, you, you showed us uh, several techniques that are currently used around the world for craniosynostosis. Which technique do you think should not be applied to uh, a child? Strip 
craniectomy should be abandoned, it's whether it is direct, whether it is endoscopic, whether it is, if you want to use an orthotic, dynamic orthotic with the strip, that's fine. But remember, when those who are using the strip, the dynamic, they are taking two strips from the each side. So when you push the head anterior posterior to decrease it, it widens up. There is nothing more devastating for a family that they bring their eight-year-old who is want to play football. And our football is the most popular sport in our area. They have to wear a helmet. And when they had a strip craniectomy, they really doesn't change anything. So what you do is that poor patient cannot fit in any helmet which is available in the market because his head is so big, so long. So that's really a, a, a psychological problem for the child, but he wants to play football. Well, well, there's nothing I can do because once they are old, you cannot go when they are old and start working on them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Professor Machado, is it okay if I ask you a question? Um, uh, Dr. Habal, uh, uh, first of all, you know, it is our privilege and honor and pleasure to have you. It's, uh, you know, we are uh, absolutely delighted that you said yes. And thank you very much to make papers available to the group, to the neurosurgery research group. Uh, one question, I know this is a rather profound question. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, why has, why has craniofacial community, including neurosurgeons and craniofacial surgeons, not done enough functional outcomes uh, studies until now and do you think that the same reason that they didn't do it will be the same that we will not be doing it for the next next uh, foreseeable future do you see how we can overcome that thank you uh, i think this is an outstanding question because if you really live which i did all those years because the the way the functionals of the neurosurgeon does is they go ahead take a piece of bone, toss it in the garbage, okay? And a lot of the surgeons that I have visited around the world, they don't follow the patient. The nurse takes the sutures out. So they do not see what's happening. As we got involved with the craniofacial, there was a lot of so-called interference with their territory. This is a neurosurgical, I, in my own hospital, there are some people who say, this is neurosurgical. What do you have to do with it? We know how we all our life, we take the bone and throw it out. Well, I said, well, Harvey Cushing in 1908 said that this should be disreputed. Oh, I don't read his, his book. He doesn't know what he's doing. So the problem is primarily when the plastic surgeon started working with the neurosurgeon, which primarily came in New York with Dr. Converse, and Dr. Ransahoff, Joe Ransahoff, came in, retired in my area, and he told me a lot of stories. You will make your hair go and uh, become falling down more than my hair falling down. And then the, uh, the other aspect beside that, I worked with Dr. Uh, Murray, who was a plastic surgeon at Harvard, and uh, Kisley Welsh was a neurosurgeon. We always are together. Dr. Shilito, we always together. Actually, the paper that you look at and the uh, on the journal website which is the first hypertellurism that was publicized that in, it's in the journal website and you can open it and it's free anybody can see yeah the neurosurgeon there worked with uh, hand in hand with the, with the with me as a plastic surgeon so this is where the problem is to have to change the culture and make sure that the culture change is working together make us better once you have that and that's really the motto in our journal if you open the first page in january issue you see that right there working together make us stronger so this is the future of craniofacial surgery a neurosurgeon and a plastic surgeon working together thank you thank you very much dr dr habal uh, i'm sure we'll have further conversations in subsequent meetings thank you sir um, so now it gives me the pleasure to again um, invite Dr. Deepak Gupta. Uh, Dr. Keith Gupta wears two hats, uh, a pediatric neurosurgeon as well as interest in head trauma. 
Uh, and so uh, Dr. Gupta is going to give us a talk on how to improve outcomes of pediatric head injuries in low middle income countries. Um, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Professor Gupta. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you, Naren, for inviting me to deliver this talk. Uh, well, if you uh, look at very closely, almost 85% of the world population, they stay in the low and the low middle income countries. Uh, most of the SARC nations, India, South Africa, China, and many other nations, uh, the whole of the Africa, they come under this uh, low and the low middle income countries. Now, we all know that the, the traumatic deaths and the damage to the productive years of the life, in fact, more than 1.3 million years, life years are lost from the TBIs globally. That's the data as of now. In my country, in India per se, there's one death from traumatic brain injury every three minutes. And probably I'm understating it, but because that's the data that we have in the statistics. From very limited data that is available in the literature, out of the 85% of the world population within research countries, most of these cases, they have got two times odd of dying or having disability from traumatic brain injury, severe TBIs. Less than 20% of these patients are able to have good outcome at six months. That, I mean, I'm just quoting the literature what we have as of today. Now, if you ask me, is there any literature on the outcome improvement statistics or data or means in pediatric TBIs? I really could not come across any. The only data which we may have probably in time to come is from the ADAPT study because uh, the ADAPT study did include uh, Cape Town and India as two uh, PI centers wherein large, almost more than 10% of the data was contributed. And the analysis of uh, the socioeconomic impact on the outcomes is currently under study. At my center, over a period of four years, uh, we did an epidemiological study in children out of 16,000 cases, we had almost 5,000 admissions uh, in the pediatric age group. And uh, we had a mortality statistics of less than 8.6% in our data. And uh, I believe, uh, as I mentioned in my previous talk, our mortality statistics have definitely improved and they reflect improved healthcare in our society or maybe in our center because it is a level one apex trauma center of the country. Now, if you look at the health infrastructure, you know, the, as per the WHO guideline recommendations and what is actually available in most of the nations in the low middle income countries, there's a huge disparity between what is available and what is the current deficit, both in terms of available bed and the healthcare facility utilization. There have been very limited scanned publications in the adult group wherein various authors from Sri Lanka and our center, they have shown there is a big economic divide in outcome following severe traumatic brain injuries. And of course, the outcome is definitely worse in the severe TBI patient that has been shown by few authors. Now, there are very few unique issues with the low middle income countries, I believe. As Professor Franco Sarvade in most of his talks, the past president of WFNS used to say, 89% of the published papers in TBI, they come from US, Canada, Australia, Japan, and Europe. And where the incidence of head trauma is approximately under 20%. So when we, from the rest of the world, actually either do not publish or our work is not considered to be public for worth publication uh, by majority of the journals for reasons which are still unknown to me. The second thing I personally believe 80% of the neurosurgical workload is trauma. However, less than 8% of the neurosurgeons are purely dedicated to the TBI care. And I think these are the biggest gaps uh, which we have not been able to fill up so far. And that's, what, that's one of the key reasons why the, we have not been able to improve outcomes uh, in the low middle income countries and the low income countries. Now, this was a, uh, you know, we often talk about the abusive head trauma being very common or the easily diagnosed and uh, treated in, in uh, high income countries. But <clears throat> I believe abusive head trauma is uh, quite common in low middle income countries also and is often missed. This was a young child uh, who presented to us with history of repeated head banging by the father and he had a very low hemoglobin 
and so we did a emergency dcs and brain bulge he had a cardiac arrest intraoperatively however he was revived and made it the reason i put up this slide is to show that now the care uh, the multi modality and the multi specialty care in the traumatic trauma centers even in low middle income countries have improved to a level or a stature, stature where even even if you have a cardiac arrest intraoperatively you can actually reverse and these children can actually go back home and as normal children to the society one of the key paper which challenged the concept of uh, the guidelines being suited for the high income countries and uh, not adaptable uh, to the low middle income countries was the best trip trial by uh, randy chestnut and there he showed that the the imaging based uh, management of the raise pressure is uh, giving you as good results as a uh, icp uh, monitor based evidence now how to improve outcome in low middle income countries or to put it in a different way how we improved our outcome in india and how we improved our infrastructure i would say that the first thing which was a uh, game changer for us was i mean we had many trauma centers in our country i don't say that the trauma was uh, not being looked after in our country but what actually happened as a initiative of government of india we actually began with a true level 1 apex trauma center in 2007 only and after that there have been many many centers which have taken up our model and uh, the outcomes in their centers also has improved significantly now we have uh, dedicated neuro trauma and pediatric care teams we have atls protocols in almost the whole of our country in various centers we do various trauma quality improvement uh, assessment programs and uh, we keep on analyzing our uh, uh, results and patients timely fashion and all these things small small things which we have made in our practice system they have improved the outcome for sure now this child i i i you know i showed it in my previous talk also the only thing i want to say that such a child a 7 year old child coming to you with uh, a gcs less than less than 8 and if you put in a icp the icp is on the higher side now there are only two options either you subject them to a decompressive which i think is much faster quicker or you subject them to intensive multi modality monitoring so the same child if the goes to the high income countries wherein you have got access to all the multi multi modality tools like brain tissue oxygenation monitoring and uh, in icp monitoring which can be continued and of course other advanced icp tools of course you would like to subject this children to <clears throat> multi conservative management and uh, most of these children they actually come out but when the resources are limited in such cases i think it's always wiser to do something which can save life and which can be decompressive connecting also now icp monitoring we have been often talking about they are pretty expensive uh, different countries have got different prices i think it roughly cost something like 500 us dollar or so so what we did at at our center was uh, we started re sterilizing our icp catheters by eto and uh, we could use it up to three times and some patients four times there was a drift of approximately 1 to 2 mm uh, in second and third uses which i don't think makes much of a difference now the only issue which people talk about is what is the risk of meningitis so we did study 100 cases of uh, intraparenchymal icp catheters and uh, there were just hardly any only five patients in the series two in the new catheter and three in, three in the reuse group who had meningitis so the difference was not significant and uh, so this is one way we have been able to break down the cost of intraparenchymal icp monitoring to almost 1/4 uh, the original cost we also brought in the concept of uh, starting bedside uh, ct scan uh, in fact a uh, few years back we published our data of 10000 bedside cts uh, because what you, and, and the cost of one ct which we extrapolated was coming out to be approximately 20 us dollar per scan or approximately 13 rupees to 1340 rupees the mean time for performance of the ct scan was coming to be around 11 minutes and uh, it truly came out to be a bedside tool actually many of the patients in uh, such countries they actually die while they are in the corridor on the lift especially more so when they are on some either on running a medicis ventilator or any uh, kind of a, they are on vasopressor throat uh, vasopressor support so to prevent that i think uh, this is something which really really helps in saving lives now the biggest killers i i believe to improve care in low middle income countries are non availability of dedicated committed icus lack of dedicated neuro neurointensivist 
absence of icp monitoring and there's always an inertia to change in the practice many people like to stick to what they have been practicing for almost decades uh, which actually have not evolved in consultation with the newer guidelines in fact if you look at the impact study uh, which was carried out by andrew mas et al uh they they did observe differences between the centers which were actually greater than expected by chance alone and they kind of concluded that efforts are redoubled recently to ensure standardization of treatment protocols between centers so what they wanted to say and what the inference from the paper is that if you improve your treatment protocols definitely the outcome are likely to improve so i think uh, the reinforcement of the guideline attendance in the icus is something which is really required and one needs to revise standardize the treatment protocols and uh, there is a definite need from shifting of the decomposing connectivity to medical treatment and non structural uh, diffuse brain swellings in many of the patients we carried out this uh, collaborative head injury uh, guideline study so called chirag study uh, almost uh, i think 6 or 7 years back and it was a very simple study wherein we just looked for various standard brain trauma foundation guideline parameters adherence in the two centers one center was my center and second was seattle in harbor view medical center and what we noted was something very very impressive with the increase in the adherence rate from 65 to 75% there was a two fold higher discharge survival we always presumed that uh, in fact we were blinded to the data and i always thought the outcome in the seattle group is likely to be very good as compared to our country however our outcome or actually 1% higher or better as compared to seattle this goes on to say that if you stick to the very basics and st- and practice uh, standard guidelines you can actually make a big amount of change in your patient outcomes and similar observations came out from the pegasus study also so do protocols or guidelines make any difference i am reasonably convinced yes it decreases the out- out- it improves the outcome for sure now we do have a new guidelines brain trauma foundation guidelines but i think many of the parameters are not practical or kind of easily adaptable to the low middle income countries and uh, i think uh, in adapt study we have included few uh, lmic nations and uh, we are currently in the process of analyzing the impact of uh, this uh, distribution of the head injury in various nations with with the outcomes we noted in the adapt study uh, in contrast to what is available in the literature there was a decrease mortality in children less than 4 years of age Abusive head trauma was not associated with the increased mortality. These are the few protocols which we have devised for our center, and we have circulated to the other uh, nations institute, and uh, they are actively practicing it. I think we are just not discussing on the preventive pre-hospital care and rehab aspects, and uh, this is something which need to be done in most of the nations, uh, especially more so in the low middle income countries, because. Uh, what i personally feel and we also got this data from our chirag study many survivors of head trauma they actually die after discharge because there are hardly any rehab services existing in most of the developing nations so to summarize i would say that uh, one needs to strengthen the pre hospital rehab services in low middle, low middle income countries severe tbi outcomes are definitely worse in the low middle income nations as compared to the high income high income countries and adherence to guidelines based practice tailored to the resource availability is very much needed to improve outcomes collaboration and standardization of treatment protocols is needed to improve outcomes and i think one needs to uh, whatever the guidelines classifications tools are laid down in, uh, by uh, for they are much more accustomed and tuned to the high income nations they need to be validated and they need to be adapt- adapted for the low to middle income countries thank you Thank you, Doctor Good, for excellent talk. I have a question for you. We, you know, uh, our countries we share many problems. We, uh, uh, you have a huge population, and we in uh, Brazil, uh, that's exactly the contrary. We have a, a huge country, so uh, there are many disparities between uh, regions, different regions in the in our country. Uh, but that's one thing that uh, I was very impressed. Uh, you said that 
the, the big problem is uh, lack of uh, ICU or, or neuro, neurointensivist or you know, ISP monitoring. What do you, could you tell me about the, the, the education of the neurosurgeon? Because uh, uh, not many neurosurgeons uh, like to do uh, trauma, mainly the, the, the severe trauma cases. Uh, don't you think that we need to increase the training for uh, uh, at least for pediatric neurosurgeons to uh, uh, better uh, treat this uh, kind of uh, patients? Absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail in the, at the right spot. Uh, even amongst the neurosurgical residents, neurotrauma is the last in their uh, kind of, uh, but, uh, but I think it's a bread and butter of the neurosurgeons when you go out in the practice. Uh, majority of the people who are in the, in my country at least, uh, those who are in uh, kind of a private practice, they are catering to the trauma patients. The way we are doing is that we are kind of training as many doctors in different part of the country as much as possible. And now there is a recent initiative by government of India. What they are doing is because uh, there are certain uh, patches in my country where there is no neurosurgeon. So what they are doing is those doctors who have done their general surgical training for three years, we ask them to have a six months to one year training in a neurotrauma center. And if they are able to do decompressive connect me, removal of the extradural hematomas, I think they are going to make a significant impact in the outcomes. This is very, very controversial. Many of the neurosurgeons, uh, they don't like this idea. Why are you training general surgeons with three years experience in general surgery into neurotrauma care? But then we must understand uh, like in areas, far off areas where the, for 300 to 400 kilometers or 200 miles, there's not even a single neurosurgeon. In such areas, like in military setup, I think it's always better to have somebody who can do bare decompressive connectomy or take out the extradural hematomas to save life. So there's a lot of disparity between the availability of the neurosurgeons, the commitment to the neurotrauma, uh, which is a big, big hindrance to uh, poor outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you have, have you uh, evaluated the results of uh, treatment in this uh, non neurosurgeon uh, uh, statistics? So, are, are they treating the similarly as, uh, as we do? No, it has not been approved. There have been many controversies attached to it. It is uh, just a recommendation from the government of India, and uh, this is still under discussion. But I am aware that uh, a few uh, surgeons, especially in the military setup, they are actually doing it. So it has not been officially approved. And I think it's an, an excellent idea. Nari? Back to you, Nari. Thank you, Professor Machado. Uh, uh, before we move to the next uh, lecture, I just want to say thank you very much to Professor Gupta. He just landed in Ghana to separate a craniopagus twin only a few hours ago, and I have managed to we have managed to get two lectures out of him. So I hope he gets a good rest. Uh, but he has already managed to have. Uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate um, your commitment to neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery, and to our listeners. Thank you, sir. So we now move to uh, Dr. Todd Hankinson. Uh, Dr. Todd Hankinson is a professor of neurosurgery uh, at the Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the Denver Children's Hospital. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Hankinson and his colleagues about seven years ago and had a wonderful time in Colorado. Uh, he has uh, many interests from um, craniopharyngioma to dysraphisms, but um, uh, he always had an interest in outcomes uh, in neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery. And also now I'm at Oxford, I'm glad to say like Dr. Hubbard used to be in Oxford that uh, Dr. Hankinson, if my memory is right, he was in Oxford at some point. Thank you very much. Dr. Hankinson, looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Naram. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for, for inviting me to, uh, to present this. I, 
This presentation is really uh, sort of just a primer on clinical outcomes research and, and background and process for people who uh, may not be really familiar with it as an entity or are interested in uh, pursuing it during their career. And so it's not one that, that has a lot of uh, really cool like videos and interoperative pictures, but um, it'll hopefully just give a little information on uh, some basics. So just in terms of defining what outcomes you know, research is, it's actually a huge umbrella term that can encompass a, a, an enormous number of types of research methodologies and approaches. And uh, in a lot of ways, it includes everything except for basic science research and some, that, some integration happens there as well. But the idea conceptually is kind of looking at the effectiveness or the outcomes of interventions that are performed in the biomedical sphere. So those could be health services, Devolved uh, to a large extent to uh, public health efforts. It can include things like cost effectiveness analysis, um, health status analysis, looks at disease burdens, uh, implementation studies, and I'll and I'll explain some of these a little bit more as we go along. But uh, to me, one of the important things to think about is that outcomes research is really a huge area. But but just like basic science. Uh, it still ha requires the same type of investment in time and skill set and sophistication if you want to lead, you know, really significant cutting edge outcomes research. One of the areas where outcomes is really nice and attractive, I think, for neurosurgeons and clinicians in general is that in some ways it's a little more flexible and accessible than basic science research can be, which allows people who don't have the uh, time bandwidth interest to make it the focus of their research career to still be involved with uh, solid research studies and also to learn how to really interpret the literature in a sophisticated way. So in terms of the relevance to neurosurgeons and, and you know, I would posit surgeons and medical people in general, uh, why would we be interested in clinical outcomes research? Well, it's obvious we're all clinicians, right? And we have an interest in how our patients are doing, how the populations that we treat are doing, and how the things that we dedicate our careers to doing manifest for our patients down the road. And so we have this inherent interest in, in these types of questions. Also, we have access to the data that drive this work. We, in a large uh, way, generate those data, right, in the patient contacts that we have. And so we're very much naturally integrated into outcomes research. Uh, the logistics of it feed into that as well, <clears throat> because unlike laboratory research, in outcomes research, you can potentially uh, do work you know, from your computer, you can do work at times when it is possible and convenient for you. And in some circumstances, you can do work in snippets of time where, um, where you have gaps in your clinical workload. So it can be a little more flexible in that way if you have sort of the skills and infrastructure in place to, to work on it. And that makes it, I think, more accessible to clinicians. And lastly, there's a lot of opportunity for clinicians to be involved in clinical outcomes research because even among people who are career dedicated to outcomes research, there is a huge effort to find collaborators who are really informed and leading in the clinical sphere. And so there's tons of people who need the types of skills and information and insights that we have by virtue of our clinical skills uh, to try to dovetail into these types of research efforts. And partially related to that, it's a little bit easier, I think, for us to learn the language of outcomes research and be dialed into outcomes research than it can be to some of the esoteric things that you see in some of the basic science spheres. So just to give some quick background on where clinical outcomes research started and how it's evolved, and this will just be uh, very brief, but really you could trace it all the way back to people like uh, Semmelweis who are looking at the larger results of groups of patients. And it's the idea that you're trying to observe the results, not of your individual patient, but coalesce information on multiple patients in, in order to try to improve the care that you're giving. And, you know, he was doing this in the context of, you know, purpurial fever or probably group B strep infections in uh, women who had just delivered babies. And he would look at different clinics and try to correlate the outcomes with different ways that people were treated. And as people started doing this and looking at results of populations, what was quickly identified was that there could be huge variabilities in practice without really clear differences in results. And that could happen sort of on the individual patient level, on the community level, you name it. And that really prompted people to investigate, you know, why is this and what's being done differently and does it matter or not? 
And so those are really where some of the basic seeds and foundations of clinical outcomes research come from. And that's quickly evolved, especially over the last you know, 50 to 75 years. And so as things moved and became more sophisticated during the 20th century, there was the incorporation of not only sort of patients and their caregivers, but also payers who were involved in this and healthcare executives who were um, involved. Sorry, I was just checking something in the chat there. Um, and when that happens, you start to get public health uh, implications. And that's why a lot of uh, high level outcomes research really falls under the sort of public health sphere and public health umbrella. And a lot of people are trained in public health methodologies uh, in order to do this kind of work. And what's happened even more recently is with the explosion of computing power, digital health culture, things like that, there's been a ton of opportunity and methods development and data resources that have become available to conduct these types of research studies. So the uh, options for pursuing clinical outcomes research have just exploded and become enormous. And so you can really tailor it to the questions and methodologies that you're interested in and the questions that you really want to answer. And uh, that gets back to that sort of huge umbrella that encompasses clinical outcomes research because there are so many different ways you can approach it and uh, work in that sphere. And you know that can include anything from uh, EMR data that's generated at your local hospital on an individual patient level to you know huge databases of epidemiologic can, um, data generated by you know, multinational groups like the WHO. So just a, I'll go through just a couple of quick examples of, of methods and tools and, uh, and data sources in the next couple of slides uh, without belaboring them too much. So you can have anything from a methodological standpoint, from assessment of individuals' well-being and satisfaction with their care, using survey tools, using more quantitative functional scales and things like this. You can include things like really sophisticated economic analyses, so cost effectiveness, cost utility, and these things can happen on the level of uh, entire countries or multiple countries looking at the efficiency of different pharmaceutical regimens, for example. Uh, that's been one of the really common approaches is to guide policymakers with regards to what medications are most efficient, not only from a clinical efficacy standpoint, but from an economic standpoint. And then you can get into things like decision analysis, where you're quantitatively uh, looking at decisions people make with probabilities of different outcomes to figure out, uh, given that uncertainty, what may be the best uh, way to approach a given problem. And implementation science is the study of taking uh, an, an innovation that has been shown to be efficacious and looking at how that actually disseminates into the community and is, and is actually used. And this is an entire area of research, which is really fascinating and interesting because, you know, what good is knowing something new or having a new way to approach a problem that works if nobody can actually use it. And then in terms of looking at some of the data resources that are available, again, these are, this is just a very small example of the multitude of resources that you can think about, but there's everything from sort of administrative databases, which are often from governments and, and insurers that can give you really large volumes of data that tend not to be particularly granular, um, but can be used really effectively, especially for hypothesis generation or kind of epidemiological research to slightly more detailed clinical databases that can give you uh, individual patient level data, but may be a little harder to access or may not have the same volume of, of patients to registries that um, include things like um, publicly supported cancer registries or um, individual research groups who compile registries and put them together and do longitudinal work or do retrospective work from the registry data. And those can be uh, customized and be extremely useful and generate tons of interesting insights uh, to data that's collected in the course of clinical trials and, of course, census data that comes from governments that looks at um, big uh, epidemiological research as well. So kind of with this in the background, knowing that there are tons of data resources, there are tons of different methodologies, and it's really applicable in whatever way a given researcher may want to do it, you, you can sort of ask yourself, okay, well, what do I want to do that might fall under clinical outcomes? And then I can choose how I want to approach it. And I just happen to use the, um, for obvious reasons, the sort of example from, from the Colorado Outcomes Research Center of some of the cores and um, research support infrastructure that they offer to sort of think about how I want to approach a given problem. So 
I'll talk a little more about biostats in a second, but it's really, in my view, the foundation of all clinical outcomes research and almost on any level, uh, you need to have some biostats familiarity and ideally some training in biostatistical interpretation and studies uh, to do anything. Um, but then you can say, okay, well, what are the questions I wanna answer? Do I wanna do economic analyses? Do I wanna move in that direction? Do I want to do, I in particular have been interested in some qualitative or mixed methods research. Um, so do I want to do that? And you can pick based on what your interests are methodologically or clinically, how you want to approach a given problem or problems over time. So to go back to that idea about biostats, um, I really think that pretty much anything that you do in clinical outcomes is built on a foundation of at least a basic understanding of biostatistical tests, methodologies, and their strengths and weaknesses, and how to analyze data uh, statistically, and how to interpret data that other people have analyzed, and their stats. Did they use the right test? Did they interpret it in a way that is robust and makes sense with it, what the data actually say? So one of the nice things about this is that... Um, not only are some skills and biostats really readily usable to, in many different contexts, but learning this uh, material is possible for people in any environment. And I think that, um, you know, Dr. Gupta spoke a lot about distinctions between, you know, what's available in low and middle income countries and in some higher income countries. And I think that learning biostats can be done remotely. It can be done using online resources, uh, even if you don't have an institution that's running like coursework and biostats for physicians and things like that. So this is material that is really accessible and I think very important when you're looking at doing this kind of work. And so then when you think about how would I want to integrate outcomes research into my career as a neurosurgeon? I just kind of roughly bend this into a few different general groups. Uh, they're, they're pretty, um, you know, nonspecific, but I think help conceptually. So um, you can look at things like a lot, what I would describe as a longitudinal academic approach, which is to say that I'm going to get advanced training, usually including an advanced degree in clinical outcomes research methodologies. And this is gonna be the real main focus of my research career, which is gonna be a huge part of my career in general. So you're really dedicating your career to doing clinical outcomes work at the highest level, and you're committing to it by doing advanced training. And um, what that will then allow you to do is pick how that, you know, the details of that training in terms of what methods you're interested in or what questions you want to answer. So you can do specific focus in clinical epidemiology or in comparative effectiveness or decision science, but you're getting really advanced training and you're going to ultimately be integrated with the outcomes research community, both locally and probably at other institutions and with collaborators who are in neurosurgery and other fields. And I think one of the really great examples of people who have done this falls from the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network. And um, these are just four of the investigators there, all of whom have advanced degrees in outcomes research and who apply them in a lot of different ways. And uh, Professor Kolkarni, I think, is going to speak uh, next about applying some of these skills in the context of randomized clinical trials and, and outcomes. And um, I think this is one of the really cool examples in pediatric neurosurgery of people doing really sophisticated, cutting edge clinical outcomes research. And that's really based on the fact that they've dedicated their careers to it. And interestingly, all four of these people are Canadian, but you don't have to be Canadian to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, the next sort of tier and where I would actually probably put myself is more of kind of like that informed investigator group. And that may be someone who doesn't have an advanced degree in clinical outcome studies, but who has still done some didactic work to learn methods to really approach it, who has a group uh, who they work with, collaborators they work with and are really interested in, in uh, this kind of work and spend a significant amount of time thinking about both methods and study design, um, but maybe just don't have quite that depth of, um, of experience and education as somebody who's, who's a little further into it. And uh, on that level, I think you can still do uh, really cool, sophisticated, high-level studies, uh, especially working closely with collaborators who do have sort of a really full-time dedicated career focus in outcomes research. And then the third group, I would say, um, you know, for lack of a better term, I call it sort of an educated consumer plus, which is someone who has uh, done some work 
to learn statistical methods, potentially other things, who reads the literature with a focus on really understanding that and on how other people are publishing uh, outcomes methods and to make sure that the studies that they're publishing are, um, are valuable and are done well. Uh, and also has looked and, and found access to experts who, when needed, can help from with things like study design, analysis of data for when you want to do your own work and you need people to help you make sure that that work is as strong as possible. So sort of with that general framework, you think, OK, well, how do I get started doing this? I'm interested in doing outcomes research. I'm interested in looking at certain patient populations who I may have direct contact with. You know, what do I need to do? And uh, what I would say is, you know, sit back and look at, okay, what's your work environment? Where are you? Are you in an academic center? Are you in a purely clinical center? Are you in a place that has characteristics of both? And that will help you figure out what resources you have available and what direction you may want to go. You know, are you a junior person who could potentially really invest in a career long focus and outcomes? Or are you more senior and that's not something that you have the time or bandwidth to do, but you still want to increase sort of your sophistication in this area. And again, so as a result of those type of questions, what are the resources available? And what are your goals? Like, do you want this to be the thing that helps drive you through academic promotion? Or are you really focused on, I just want to answer specific questions to try to make care better for my patients and for other patients? Uh, or do I just really want to be able to interpret the literature in a more sophisticated way? And then of course, you want to think about what area do you want to focus in? What am I interested in? What, you know, gets me up at, uh, in the morning to help work on this kind of research. And so when, if you're somebody who falls into the sort of, I wanna dedicate my research career to doing this, what I would say is you really need to look at your institution closely and you're gonna need a lot of support in order to get going and to keep going. So you're gonna need um, commitments from your department, probably from your school of medicine, if that's the environment you work in, if you're in some kind of other program uh, for, time protection, which I can't emphasize enough. You can't do this kind of work or any kind of real research work if you don't have time dedicated to doing it. And, um, and also you're probably, if you're on this level, you're going to need financial support because the time you take out to go get a master's degree or a PhD obviously is going to require a significant amount of financial support from your department. And if you're lucky, you may still be early enough in your training where that's something that's really uh, that's easier to do and more natural. If you're already at sort of the practicing faculty level, you may have to, you know, force a way to figure out how to make that happen. And, you know, this is just examples of like basic stats coursework and the types of things you need to think about here on the, on the right. And then Dr. think about in your, Dr. Dr. Han yeah. Hankinson, uh, two to three minutes. Uh, yeah. You have got thanks. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll move through a little bit faster, but we're almost done. So then think about who your mentors are going to be, what coursework you want to do. And, um, Ultimately, you're going to need some kind of funding support, probably. I highlighted the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute because uh, it's a, uh, a federal-focused institute that, that supports uh, clinical outcomes research. And then if you're in the more informed investigator level, maybe you don't need to do quite as much in terms of your uh, didactic classwork and things like that, but you're still going to need time. You're still going to need some financial support to help you um, have the time and develop the skill sets to do this. And then if you're more on the um, sort of educated consumer uh, plus level, then you're definitely going to need time and you're going to still want to, if you can, uh, learn basics of biostats so that you can interpret the literature appropriately and then use it when you need to when you're designing your own studies. But you're also going to want to find um, collaborators and people to work with who can help you along as well. And I just put up the, uh, anyway, so you say, okay, well, now I'm getting started. How do I get projects done? What do I need to think about in terms of the projects I'm doing? And, and what I would say is try to start off early um, to early on to try to start by keeping things really simple, simple questions, limited scope. Um, you know, you're not going to cure cancer with your first research study. And so um, try to keep that in mind and try to follow through initial projects all the way to completion to demonstrate to yourself and to those around you that you can uh, finish a project, make a contribution, and then you'll be able to move on to the next one. And you can slowly build in terms of your sophistication with your experience, and that will garner support from those around you that you need support from. 
And so for a brief overview, what I would just say is, you know, outcomes is a really wide ranging, but really flexible area of biomedical research. And as a result of that, you can really gain skills that you use in the way that you want to and answer the questions you want to answer. But you can't um, ignore the fact that you have to make a commitment and you have to get some level of training if you're really going to do outcomes research uh, of a decent quality. And uh, it's a little bit more amenable to a clinician's schedule and lifestyle than basic science tends to be, which I think is part of why it's attractive to a lot of people and um, why it's a really useful thing to think about and approach. And again, just like anything else, time is really your biggest asset because you need it in order to invest in doing quality work. And these are just some of the people who helped me along in terms of either supporting, you know, getting me off the ground or mentoring me, teaching me or inspiring me to do outcomes research work. And thank you all very much for your time. Professor Machado. Thank you, uh, Dr. Engelson, for your excellent talk. You gave uh, uh, the directions for us, for neurosurgeons to do, uh, to follow uh, and to get uh, studies in outcome, uh, good studies. I, I would like to ask you a very short question. Uh, what is your advice for, or, or in, the other, in other words, uh, what are, what are the, the common mistakes that uh, neurosurgeons uh, should avoid in doing uh, this uh, starting uh, outcome studies? What do you think? Um, I think that the two biggest mistakes are probably underestimating the, um, the time that you need to invest in learning how to do things and, um, and the commitment that it takes to do good research work. I know some of the people who are non-surgeons that I've worked with um, have had problems with surgeons whose schedules are so demanding, thinking that you can sort of just send some data to a statistician and generate a, a clinical outcome study as a result of it. And, and so that's a pitfall that I think can be best avoided. Um, and, um, and I think also bringing in experts early on in the study design phase in terms of, you know, I have a question I want to answer bringing in a st statistical expert or a methodologist early on to help design the study and not getting through three quarters of the data collection and then finding out that there are things that you're not doing properly that really limit the amount of information you can glean from your research study. So that ends up wasting a lot of time. So I'd say those two things, mm -hmm. um, not underestimating the time and skills required and bringing in uh, other people and collaborators early on in the study design um, stage. Thank you. Larry, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hankinson. Look forward to your, your support and help with any of our projects that we always plan for the listserv as a group. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. So now it uh, gives me honor to in, uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Kulkarni, Dr. Kulkarni. He's a professor and vice chair of uh, Division of Neurosurgery at the famed Sick Kids in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Kulkarni is uh, contributions to pediatric neurosurgery cannot be un, cannot be overstated he with dr kessel have been pioneers in um, in uh, um, randomized control study evidence based medicine and really have put, put uh, pediatric neurosurgery in the forefront of neurosurgery and probably clinical studies as well and uh, this is uh, dr kulkarni has long career ahead of him still. So, you know, he, he'll be one of those seminal neurosurgeons that will be looked back at. So it's an honor to have Dr. Kulkani. Thank you, Dr. Kulkani. Looking forward to your talk. Great. Thank you very much, Naren. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this uh, today. And this is a topic that I really like to talk about, about randomized trials, because I think they are, um, they're very important. We don't have a lot of them in pediatric neurosurgery, and there's good reason for that. And that's what I'll, what I'll talk about. But I think we're, we're at, a, at, a, at a good point um, uh, in our in our evolution of not just understanding but execution of randomized uh, trials, so I have no no conflicts of interest uh, with this. Just as a to begin, I, I don't I don't think this I even really need to state this necessarily, but um, yeah, I, it is uh, worthwhile just considering reconsidering why randomized trials are so important. Why are they considered the highest 
source of evidence. And you see the, the, the typical evidence pyramid here where you've got things like expert opinion and editorials at the bottom, and then various types of studies that move up until you reach randomized trials. And, and the reason for that, why randomized trials is there is because it lowers the risk of bias. So as you move up this chain, you are lowering the risk of bias. And what does that mean again? So observe, bias is when the observed results uh, of your study are systematically deviated from what the truth is. So your study found that treatment A was better than treatment B, but in fact, the reality is, is that treatment B might be better than treatment A, or there might be no difference. Why did you find something that was different from the truth? And it's often a result of these forms of biases. Um, selection bias in terms of the types of patients who are getting the treatments versus those who are not. Um, intervention bias in terms of how the, uh, the interventions are implemented. Measurement bias, how the outcomes uh, are, are assessed. And then even in the analysis and publication, there's bias uh, there. And the, 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 the methodology of a randomized trial, of a good randomized trial, works to minimize all of these biases. And they do so differently. So please understand that a, a randomized trial is not a homogeneous thing. There are good randomized trials and there are bad randomized trials. And, and good randomized trials, what makes them good is that they've gone even farther to reduce these biases in how they're designed and how they are executed. So with that said, you know, what are the barriers? If we accept that randomized trials are important, what are the barriers to randomized trials in pediatric neurosurgery? So um, we can look at it like this. This is the anatomy, very simply put, the anatomy of a randomized trial. Okay, it begins here uh, on the left where somebody has to come up with a question. Um, they have to design a randomized trial. They have to get funding for the randomized trial, and then they have to initiate the randomized trial. Once that process is started, you've got to identify your sample population, um, identify those who are potentially eligible, recruit them, consent them, randomize them, and then uh, they get uh, assigned to, let's say, one of two groups of, of treatments. Uh, which are often surgery with what we're considering, and then you measure their outcome. Okay, so that's a simple description of, of the process of doing a randomized trial. Um, but at each of these stages, there are barriers that we face. And I think things like lack of surgeon equipoise. And what I mean by that is that at a community level, there may be disagreement about what procedure, what, which of two procedures is better. Um, you know, roughly half of surgeons think uh, procedure A is better than procedure B and vice versa. So there's community equipoise, but at the individual surgeon level, the surgeon doesn't have equipoise. You know, there are many surgeons who say, no, I don't really care what my, what my colleagues think. I know that the treatment A is better and this is fine. I don't need a randomized trial for this. That's one, that's one barrier. The other barrier is that we deal with uncommon conditions. So even the most common things that we deal with in pediatric neurosurgery, like hydrocephalus, for example, in the grand scheme of things, they, they, they dwarf uh, in comparison to things like uh, adult uh, cardiac disease or stroke um, uh, and things like that. So it, there's still uncommon conditions. Um, the consent process is difficult. You're dealing with, you're not consenting typically the patient, you're, cons you're consenting the parent. And um, when the choice is between two different surgeries, for example, that's a, that's a different type of consent process and a more difficult one than when you're comparing two non-surgical types of interventions. And then the intervention that, and interventions themselves can be difficult to standardize because we're talking here about surgery. It's not about just the prescription of a medication. Um, so that's often a barrier. And then uh, finally, you know, you've got outcomes that um, can be difficult to, to assess because they're complex outcomes and they are outcomes that often require prolonged follow-up because we are treating these kids uh, in infancy many times. And what we're really interested in is, is how they're doing later in childhood and even into adulthood. So a lot of barriers here. When you look at all this red, it's, it seems a little disheartening, but we, we know that um, there, there is a long track record in history of successful, meaningful, important, impactful, randomized trials in pediatric neurosurgery. I've, I've just gone through, I've just listed a few here. There's, there's many others, but, but these are a few that have been very successful and they've managed to overcome these barriers. And so we can look back at those trials and see what did they teach us about these barriers? What can we learn from those going ahead and going forward in terms of how to do successful RCTs in pediatric neurosurgery? And I'll focus on, on three in particular and look at how they uh, addressed these barriers that I talked about. So one is, is probably the original randomized trial in pediatric neurosurgery that was really just, that remains a, a landmark study. 1998, this was Jim Drake and John Kessel's uh, shunt design trial comparing three different types of shunt valves where in their primary outcome, they found no significant difference 
uh, for shunt failure. That was a, a really a landmark study that paved the way for all the future work that laid ahead. Um, this was another tr uh, tremendous landmark study, the MOMS trial, uh, comparing prenatal versus postnatal repair uh, for myelomeningocele, showing with, with various outcome measures, the potential benefit of prenatal uh, repair. That was a huge study from 10 years ago now. And then this study um, was, was one that I was involved in from a few years ago. This was a randomized trial comparing ETV-CPC versus uh, shunt in Uganda. And here we use cognitive outcome as a primary outcome and found no significant difference between these two uh, treatments. So now we, if we put those in the background for a sec, let's go, let's go look at these, um, uh, these barriers again. So first, the barriers of dealing with uncommon conditions. How do you manage that when you know that the condition that you're dealing with is uncommon? And what the implication of that is, is that there's obviously just fewer subjects to enroll, right? You, you, there's a minimum number of uh, patients that you're gonna need for your randomized trial to have sufficient power. And in a condition that's uncommon, it's just gonna take longer to complete that recruitment. And, and enthusiasm wanes, you know, um, uh, I will tell you that if a study goes on for many years, even if the same patient population exists, the same number of potential patients exists each year, I can promise you your, your recruitment of those patients is gonna, is gonna decrease year by year by year because enthusiasm in the study will wane and people are gonna be less engaged in it. Um, and the other problem with uncommon conditions is that it's hard to appeal to funding agencies. Why should they give you millions of dollars to run a randomized trial, which is often what it costs, for a condition that is, you know, one tenth as common as, as something else that they could get a bigger bang for their buck from, right? So these these are things you have to think about. So if we go back to the original shunt design trial uh, from Jim Drake and John Kessel. How do they deal with uh, some of these problems? So the the problem of having fewer patients to enroll, they they did the obvious thing, which was it was a multi-center study. This did not involve just one center or two centers, but it was multi-center international study so that they could uh, capture as many patients as possible to help recruitment. The, the, the plus side to this, aside from helping a recruitment, is that it also helps generalizability, meaning that whatever the final results are, they're more likely to, to be applicable to a wider range of patients and a wider range of centers. But it adds a, a significant layer of complexity to a trial. You have to now be watching each center, make sure they're all trained, they're following the protocol, they aren't missing patients, they're doing their outcome assessments, it's, it's a lot of added administrative work uh, to the study. So it's not, it's not a free thing, it's, it costs. Um, funding agencies, how, how do they deal with funding of the trial? Well, they, they, they cobbled together creative and multiple sources of funding, including some industry support as well. And I don't think there's anything wrong with this, but you, you, the, the problem that it potentially, uh, that you have to look out for is to ensure that there is academic independence and integrity maintained. And you can do this. There are structures in, the, in place that can allow you to have these sources of funding and still maintain a study that's of, of uh, high academic integrity. The, the MOMS trial dealt with the, the problem of, uh, of fewer potential subjects to recruit in a different way, in a, in a very um, unusual but, but tremendously effective way, which is they had a national moratorium on the procedure outside of the trial. So in the United States, when the NIH um, um, uh, funded this study, there was a national agreement that amongst the centers that were doing this, that they would either stop or be part of the study. So that anybody who had a, a child that was eligible for fetal repair, the only way you could get that pr procedure was through this randomized trial. That's, now that's a very, very difficult thing to do. I think it was uh, a landmark thing to do and it was crucial for the success of this study. Um, but um, uh, I think it's going to be rare to have that type of national or international cooperation again. Um, the other barrier is lack of surgeon equipoise and, and difficult consent process. I put these two together because the implication of this is that um, it makes uh, randomization difficult because either you have the surgeon thinking that they know what the best procedure is and they don't want to randomize, or you have families that don't want to randomize, either because they have a strong feeling about one procedure versus the other for whatever reason, um, uh, sometimes influenced by their surgeon, by the way, or uh, because even if they don't know which procedure is better, they just feel uncomfortable with the concept of having chance dictate what surgery their child is going to get. And this is especially the case when you've got two treatments that are quite radically different. And how, how can you deal with this? There are a couple of different ways. So in our randomized trial in Uganda, comparing ETV CPC to shunt, what we did was we, we greatly restricted the eligibility criteria. So you could have a, a group of patients who on one extreme 
may be eligible for both procedures, but you know, you may slightly favor shunt. And on the other extreme, you may slightly favor endoscopy. Um, so what we did was we eliminated those extremes and, and just took that, that clear middle group where there was absolutely no question that both procedures were good for this patient or potentially good for this patient. So we really restricted the criteria so that there was no doubt there was equipoise about this potential group. That, that eases a lot of concerns, certainly among surgeons, but the problem is, is that now it can slow recruitment because now you've taken what's already a small population and whittled it down to an even smaller subpopulation. So that has implications for trial recruitment and also for generalizability, because now the results of this study are only going to be applicable to that very narrow group that you've uh, defined. The other way to do it, which we, we, we did not do in the, in the Uganda uh, randomized trial, but which we are doing in our North American HCRN study that's also comparing ETB CPC to shunt, is that we're using an equipoise panel. And what that means is that once an eligible patient is identified, with permission from the family, we have their case reviewed by an independent group of experts, you know, about somewhere between 10 to 20 surgeons who are experts in the field will review the data for this patient and then report back to the surgeon, the treating surgeon, about whether they agree that both procedures are acceptable and good. And then that surgeon can then tell the family, look, 20 uh, independent pediatric neurosurgeons experts feel that, 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 that both procedures are good. So we have, we can, that might give you more comfort in being willing to randomize. Okay. And th this is not a, this is not uh, new to our study. The other studies have done this um, uh, and, and has shown in previous randomized trial that, that it has helped with recruitment. Standardizing interventions um, is, is a big deal for the randomized trials that we do because um, surgeon experience and skill varies and that will determine the potentially the efficacy of the procedure. And that's especially the case for a relatively new procedure that's just being introduced into the community. You know, so one option is to wait for that procedure to disseminate a bit more for people to gain more experience with it. The problem is, is that if you do that too long, then the procedure becomes ingrained into the community, uh, becomes considered a part of standard practice, even though there's no evidence to back up its, its superiority over the old treatment. And at that point, it becomes impossible to do a randomized trial because everybody's just doing the procedure anyway, and they feel it's fine. So there, there's, a, there's a fine line between doing, uh, doing a study too early before people actually know how to do the surgery properly versus waiting too long, and it becomes a standard of care without evidence. So we go back to the mom's trial. That was a, uh, a great example of how to deal with this. And what they did was they, they limited participation to just a few centers um, where there was concentrated expertise, where they were confident that the surgeons had the skill and experience to do the procedure well. Now, of course, they could only do this because there was that national moratorium. And so even though there were just a few centers, patients were coming from all over the country to just these few centers to have the procedure done. Um, it does raise questions about generalizability, though, and that's become a particular issue with the mom's trial results, because once it was published, everybody started opening up fetal centers. And uh, now it is the exception, particularly in the U.S., to have a high volume uh, fetal center because they're, they're so, the experience is so diluted because there are so many centers. So it's a, it's a, it's a very serious question as to whether the, the uh, practical results of fetal repair currently uh, replicate what was shown in the randomized trial. Outcomes are complex, and um, it's not just about surgical outcomes, because surgical outcomes are pretty, like shunt failure, they're pretty easy to, uh, to measure. What we really want to know is the outcomes that, that patients and families really care about, and they're often things like cognitive outcome and quality of life and such. And um, the way we dealt with this in, in the uh, Uganda RCT is that we, we did look at treatment failure, so ETV failure, shunt failure, we looked at that certainly, but the primary outcome was cognitive outcome. Um, and quality of life. We felt that those were more important. So we measured those at one, three, and five years because we felt that, that yes, these are complex, but they needed to be done. And we trained people to, to get these outcomes properly. But the other uh, issue with that that I alluded to is that um, we often need uh, prolonged outcome measures because we're, we're treating these um, uh, babies uh, and, as infants, but the meaningful outcomes are often later in life. They occur in adolescence and, uh, and childhood. And the problem with that is that long-term outcome follow-up is costly and it's, it's difficult. So the MOMS trial did sort of a hybrid approach, which was they took, um, they looked at early important outcomes, like the need for shunt. That was a primary outcome. That was a composite outcome. It was more complicated than that, but they, they, they had this early important outcome that was 
primarily a surgical outcome as it were. But at the same time, in parallel to this, they were waiting for the later outcomes. So they looked at development and quality of life later on. The problem with this approach though, is it's a good approach because it gives you sort of early results, is that um, uh, depending on how you uh, look at this statistically, you may not have statistical power to, um, to, to uh, assess outcomes like development and quality of life later on in, in, in the child's uh, course. So, you know, there you go. We've got all these barriers here. Again, a big sea of red. Um, uh, and, but we've seen examples, again, of how these trials have, uh, have dealt with this and, and overcome all these um, uh, barriers. So I, I don't want this to be a negative talk. I think that the point of this was to say that, yes, substantial barriers in randomized trials in pediatric neurosurgery, they certainly do exist, but they are not insurmountable. They're, they're hard right? Uh, they're very hard. I'm not, I'm not going to downplay that. Um, uh, and just as an example, the, the randomized trial that we're doing here in North America, before we recruited the first patient, it was about a four, five-year process from thinking up this randomized trial to writing up various drafts of it, to having it go back and forth between funding agencies, to finally getting funded, to finally getting through ethics approval, to finally recruiting our first patient. That was you know, four or five years of work before the first patient was even recruited. That, that's the, the type of work it takes. Um, but it's possible to do. And I think we're at a point now in our community where there is a critical mass of both expertise and a, a recognition and commitment from individuals and, and our community to, to get these types of studies uh, done. So I, th I think we're at a hopeful place right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kukarni, for excellent talk. Um, it's so important to do a, a randomized trial you pointed out all the difficulties uh, in the dealing in, in doing the in designing this uh, uh, randomized trial. I would like to ask you a very short question. Your, uh, uh, how do you do uh, deal with the possibility of errors? Because uh, you point so 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 many uh, problems during the, the following the, the all the, the process of a randomized trial. You know that is the sum of uh, uh, multiple errors can uh, give you a, 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 that will be so difficult to interpret your uh, initial uh, question. So yes. how do you deal with the possibility of errors? So I think that the, the process of dealing with errors is um, anticipating what they are and then paying great attention to the, the, the study design. So you, 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 it's sort of like what, what Todd hinted at before um, in, in your previous question to him was that it's the early stages that are so critical. Before you recruit your first patient, before you even apply to a funding agency is the design of the study and looking at all the potential sources of error and bias that are there and then finding ways, thinking very hard about how your study is gonna be designed to eliminate or at least minimize those and then having lots of people review this right? And people who've had experience with this before, look at what other errors people have made um, and get experienced people on board to review and be very critical of your study. And that's one of the things about randomized trials is that because they're often very expensive, you do have to go to big funding agencies to get them funded. And those funding agencies really put them through a rigorous review process so that even after all that you've gone through, they'll still find problems with it and they'll help you correct that before they fund it and before you start it. So it's all, it's all very early on. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Narin. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Machado. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kulkarni. It was fantastic talk. I uh, look forward to um, your help with this. Uh, as, as my, uh, you know, we, we have always been trying to create a, a network as you guys have created in Canada. So thank you very much. Look forward to hopefully working with you. Thank you. Uh, so in the next talk, uh, we will go to uh, Professor Uli Tomal because it ties nicely with the, the talk of uh, Dr. Kulkani. Um, Dr. Tomal, Uli Tomal is the professor, uh, Professor Uli Tomal is the professor of pediatric ne neurosurgery and the head of uh, Division of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Charité, as you all know, a powerhouse of world uh, medicine i think it's just been ranked as the best hospital in the world and uh, dr uli tomali has been a great supporter of our listserv he was the brave man who held who 
who hosted the first uh, uh, neurosurgery inter, uh, international neurosurgery residence course in in um, um, Berlin in 2016 and all these things are coming from uh, that uh, meeting so uh, it's a real pleasure to invite him and he's running a, a re international registry so look forward to hearing from you professor tamale thank you okay okay now i got my uh, audio <laughs> yeah. I was a little bit surprised because I thought George Jello will talk now, but uh, um, he, he will come. Uh, uh, okay. I think it will be nice to tie you with this one. Thanks. Okay. No, perfect. Thank you very much, Naren, for putting all this together. This is a lot of effort. Thank you for inviting me, for giving this uh, kind of talk. And uh, it's a great privilege to talk just be, uh, after Abaya Kukani, who uh, did just a uh, fantastic job. And um, the standards of uh, uh, randomized uh, controlled trials are still there and registries are maybe uh, the small sisters and brothers of those randomized trials in order to get further insight into uh, in to what we are actually doing in our everyday life. But I think they can be quite a good uh, resource. Uh, and if you look into uh, uh, Wikipedia, registries play, of course, a very big role since IT development has uh, taken place and uh, web-based as well as uh, local registries can be implemented much, much easier than it used to be in former times. And um, you can see uh, the section of health and medicine uh, where registries uh, play definitely a big, big role in health policies. Uh, most of most important examples may be the cancer registries, which are implemented in almost all countries. If you directly compare uh, randomized controlled trials to registries, um, we can refer to what uh, Professor Kulkani already told us, um, is that, um, of course, for the randomized trial, you need a clear hypothesis. Um, and um, for this, you uh, need a thorough planning uh, statistical calculation of sample uh, size in order to perform those pr uh, prospective controlled data collection, which again needs a lot of um, effort um, and resources. Um, and then you can only look for the primary analysis according to your um, strict protocol as well uh, to your hypothesis. Uh, but it will generate a very high um, evidence um, to answer the question of your hypothesis. Secondary to this, you can still refer to this data which has been collected and you look for further analysis of subgroups which will um, not generate the same level of evidence, but uh, still this data can uh, be used in addition. Comparing to this, registries are more like topic or disease related. Um, there's a continuous data collection um, and it can be uh, collected in an unlimited sample size. Uh, it should be done in the prospective data uh, collection because otherwise the um, quality of data collection might be restricted. And uh, having a certain amount of uh, samples available in your cohort in the registry uh, gives you the opportunity for flexible analyzing different kinds of uh, questions and hypotheses which you can generate from this. Uh, and then giving some further answers uh, to questions you have, however, with a lower evidence level, of course, because all those like equipoise and bias cannot be completely excluded from those kind of registries. I would uh, like to go through some examples in which registries play a very important role. And if you look at brain tumors in children, we all know that the incidence is relatively low. However, it's the most common solid tumors in children uh, and the uh, second um, common of all tumors in children. And in those in Germany, for example, in the 80s, we have impl implemented a kind of interdisciplinary cooperation um, within a so-called treatment network for children with brain tumors. Um, and uh, there are different cities and institutions have been selected in order to collect data on different kinds of uh, tumor entities for these um, uh, rare uh, diagnoses, but still very important diseases. And um, 
this network is implementing not only oncologists who were the founders uh, of this uh, interdisciplinary approach, but um, also other disciplines which are, of course, closely related to the diagnosis as well as the treatment and follow-up of those patients. Uh, and um, I told you that this was implemented in the 80s. And if you look uh, here at the turquoise uh, curve, uh, it came from a 10-year uh, overall survival rate uh, of lower than 50%. And uh, to the uh, 2010 data, um, we are able to see 80% of survival rates. And uh, this is definitely due to the fact that uh, there's more understanding generated on different kinds of uh, data collections. Um, and thereby implementing uh, the knowledge into treatment protocols. Um, in Germany, we have the Kinderkrebs Stiftung, which is the foundation specifically for uh, cancer in pediatric and children. And uh, this HIT network uh, was funded by 8.5 million um, at the moment in different kind of um, entity related researchers. And as you can see here, there are different kind of registers as well as um, prospective randomized trials which are running in parallel uh, to brain tumor uh, diseases. And the most important registries are the logic registries which deal with a low grade glioma. Um, Zyab registry um, of a germ cell um, of choroid plexus tumors, for example, um, reptoid tumors, um, as well as recurrent brain tumor registry. Uh, and all those are collecting data in order um, to uh, get further understanding of those diseases, uh, which are not necessarily can be put into a uh, prospect of randomized trials at this certain stage due to any kind of reason. Um, if we look at the low-grade glioma registry, for example, we were able uh, to implement um, also some uh, surgical data, which was not the fact in um, the past decades, where it was more like uh, oncologically um, uh, driven uh, kind of questions and also in data implementations and the neurosurgical part were now more and more uh, getting um, um, significant importance so that we were able to um, make an uh, item um, definition for neurosurgical questions. Looking at those data generation from the past decades, uh, many different papers have been published and you can see the overview uh, from the 1996 um, HIT-LGD trial, um, which um, generates different entities of tumors. Uh, and then over the time, here's the 1996, it changed to the 2004 trial and then was transferred into the LGG registry um, over time. And if you look at certain data, uh, you can see how the treatment protocols change over time. And specifically for us neurosurgeons, we can look, for example, the rate of complete resection compared to partial or subtotal resection uh, was actually changing. Uh, that the, at least the surgical approach to those kind of tumors uh, found some different um, targets to be safer, try to be as complete as possible possible in uh, low risk patients, uh, but uh, try to be a little bit more reluctant and uh, keep the quality of life of the patients. This is something which we have learned over the time. The survival rates are very similar uh, throughout those trials and the green is the registry, um, however, improving um, not significantly, but a little bit. And from this kind of data collection, um, <clears throat> a guideline was generated, um, which was uh, published from the of European Brain Tumor Group um, in order to define um, how to deal with those low-grade gliomas um, in terms of here uh, um, defining the resection grades from the radio radiological perspective as well as the, radio, uh, the neurosurgical perfect, uh, perspective and then different kind of uh, details which have been uh, generated from those kind of knowledge over the time. So this is a direct... Um, um, example how um, data collection over trials, starting with trials and then transferred into a registry have improved definitely uh, the treatment by uh, defining those kind of guidelines. Um, similar projects is uh, the DIPG registry, 
on the real European basis, which of course is much, much more difficult because we still don't know how to deal with those tumors, when to biopsy, uh, and how to improve their um, survival as well as their quality of life over time. But I think still this is a very good example uh, where data collection on an international basis uh, will help us in order um, to uh, better uh, to get better ideas uh, how to improve those kind of devastating diseases. From the European um, community, especially the European Commission, um, rare diseases, uh, which are very important for pediatric neurosurgery as well, have been addressed in the so-called European Reference Network. Um, they have been implemented in 2017, and uh, at the current stage, this European Reference Network tried to implement registries uh, for those kind of networks, uh, which are dealing with uh, different kind of um, of topics for neurosurgery. It's important here the craniosynostosis are addressed in the ER and cranio. Uh, then we have the um, the ER and PET can where the pediatric cancers and also the brain tumors are addressed. And uh, on this European basis, we are now working um, to actually implement registries in order to understand more about those kind of topics uh, in order to transfer like institutional knowledge, institutional and also like um, um, eminence-based medicine more into a, a solid data collection in order to understand who is doing what and what is improving actually the outcome of those kind of patients. Uh, another uh, thing is driven by this European uh, initiative, which is the patient reported outcome measure. And this is, I think, a very important uh, thing which we uh, should acknowledge uh, that uh, not only we as healthcare professionals, but also the patients and the, the parents are able to put in their perspective of outcome into databases and registries. And um, this is one uh, project which we implemented ag uh, together with our uh, mm, neurosurgical adult colleagues, as well as the orthopedics and uh, trauma colleagues who are all working on spine surgeries uh, and a registry for patient-related outcome measures were implemented that uh, families and patients can actually put their outcomes into a registry and uh, we are collecting data for uh, spina bifida patients, Chiari patients, um, uh, and similar cases uh, for, uh, for spine. So uh, looking back more at the practical level, the registry at the, at the end has the goal um, or needs to define a kind of goal that can be a disease or the identification of any kind of lack of knowledge, uh, which is too diffuse that it can be addressed uh, by uh, um, prospective randomized trial. And especially um, if the knowledge is uh, not uh, there at this moment that actually a clear hypothesis can be made according to those kind of goals, uh, then it's better to collect data on a broader basis in order to understand more and then make the basis for such kinds of randomized trials. Um, the database environment is important and the question is, do you want to do it on a local level, uh, on the national level or an international level and then the accessibility uh, should it be done on a software which is used uh, in parallel in different uh, institutions or is it a web-based solution for example this uh, directly transferred to the software tool um, and um, of course the participating center selection is important because at the end uh, those kind of registries only work if there is a sustainability uh, in the data collection so a lot of effort is needed from all kinds of participating centers as well as uh, healthcare professionals. Item selection is similar important as it is in randomized control trials because it should reflect the practicability of those kinds of registries uh, and the, uh, should look at relevant items which are important for the disease or the topics uh, but should not overwhelm the participating centers. Um, data protection and ethics approval is as important as it is in any other trials uh, and um, uh, the committees need to uh, support those kind of efforts uh, accordingly. Commitment and sustainability are already said and therefore uh, often resources are necessary which are not as big as they are normally from trials. 
the hydrocephalus clinical research network was already uh, mentioned as a big role model um, how data collection can be uh, organized and as far as i know not only prospective randomized trials have been implemented in this network but also some registries um, and of course, uh, we have tried in Germany to uh, make similar steps, but however, on a very basic level until today, um, it was actually uh, our colleagues from Göttingen who uh, have implemented um, due to any kind of lack of IT solutions in their own hospital, they started to implement their own uh, data collections uh, for their um, clinical follow-up of hydrocephalus patients as well as for other pediatric neurosurgical diseases. And uh, we started to co uh, collaborate uh, with Göttingen and to implement the same kind of registry in our hospital. So we are doing parallel uh, data collections uh, on a local basis. Um, and um, this kind of solution was published by Christoph Bock. Um, where baseline data is collected, surgical data, as well as follow-up data, and this can be exported and then uh, analyzed accordingly uh, for statistical analysis. And um, they have shown nicely how they change their uh, therapy regimen over time from using hydrocephalus um, fixed uh, differential pressure valve to uh, adjustable differential pressure, uh, pressure valves. Uh, and then over the time adjustable gravitational um, assisted valve. Um, and then of course they can look for any kind of um, augmentation of the valves, of revisions of any kind of valve types and the kind of um, revisions which uh, have been needed in those kind of groups as well as looking for different outcome measures in terms of revision-free survival. Um, looking at age groups, um, type of hydrocephalus, as well as prematurity, for example. Um, so these are very important uh, measures. And we are now have extended uh, uh, this kind of database into other hospitals like Tübingen and Düsseldorf. So we are trying to make this on a, um, a multi-center level and then address uh, certain topics in the future. Um, a very important thing which was already mentioned by Naren is the um, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus in uh, preterm babies. And uh, we all know that this approach to this um, disease is very difficult because um, the treatment protocols are very diverse. And uh, if you look at the recommendations by the CN, uh, um, uh, CNS guidelines, which were published on a new uh, level in 2020, we can see that there are only limited um, guidelines available on a moderate uh, level of evidence. So in this is only said that ventricular access devices, external ventricular drainages, ventricular subgalial shunts, or lumbar punctures are treatment options to manage post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Um, in this new uh, form of guidelines, endoscopic lavage was also implemented, uh, which was initiated in Brazil, and we have uh, generated some data about this topic over time and think this is a valuable option. Uh, our personal data uh, was promising, uh, but however, we know that our personal data does not reflect uh, the general application on an international basis. And that's why this was a clear topic which we uh, would like to have addressed in a registry uh, study. So the trophy registry um, was um, initiated on an international basis. Um, and in this uh, trophy registries, we um, integrate like endoscopic lavage to, um, in parallel to external ventricular drainage or ventricular access devices or ventricular subgalial shunts in order to follow up for clinical complications um, and imaging as well as follow-up studies for ventricular size, size um, shunt revisions or any kind of other uh, complications. And then in 24, 36 and 60 months follow-up, uh, outcome measures like Bailey uh, indices or uh, gross motor functional uh, scores as well health utility index and hydrocephalus outcome questionnaires should be answers and questions what are what kind of uh, treatment options are better. Um, this is an online database which can be accessed uh, through um, a web page and um, anybody could actually access this um, database and get a registration. Um, we um, 
normally ask for question what kind of standard treatment protocols are already implemented in the in the uh, center respectively and then if somebody um, agrees to the um, uh, to the regulations on ethics basis as well as um, data protection, uh, they could start enroll patients. Uh, and the inclusion criteria are strictly defined for this registry uh, in terms of no previous hydrocephalus related neurosurgical intervention. Gestational age uh, refers to a, a neonate. Uh, imaging proven intraventricular hemorrhage, as well as active hydrocephalus, which is progressive over time. And then, of course, medical necessity for surgical interventions, like those four different options I already mentioned, and the commitment uh, for a follow-up of a five-year period for each patient. Um, our status report was published in uh, this year. Um, and uh, what we could um, already see that there's a very nice international um, activity going on on the trophy uh, registry. So we have uh, 22 registered countries. We have 33 active centers who are um, uh, participating in the study uh, and 149 patients are already included. And I'm very grateful for all those centers who are really uh, putting a lot of effort in this. Uh, as you can see here, Germany and Russia are the biggest uh, countries who are actually enrolling uh, patients. And uh, this is quite an interesting topic because in Russia, uh, this initiative was taken in order to improve the outcome of those patients in which uh, no clear treatment protocols have been implemented so far. Uh, so they're using the environment of the trophy registry in order to uh, improve the treatment protocols on a national basis. And you, you can see the 33 active contributing centers um, and the top 10 accordingly. Um, it was also interesting then if we, if we looked at the standard treatment um, form, which every center has to uh, fill out before uh, being able to include any patients, we could see that um, our four main options of treatment and some others were used. But if you look um, that only a few centers have only one options which were used. Uh, the majority used two different options of those or uh, more than um, half of the, of the centers were actually three or even four different options. That uh, shows clearly the heterogeneity of the approach towards this complicated disease. Um, and you could also see Prof that- Professor, um, Professor Stomar, you have got- I'm almost finished. This. Thank, thank you. Yeah, uh, that in external ventricular drainage, there's actually a decrease um, in the use of this kind of treatment, as well as neuroendoscopic lavage, there's a slight increase, however, still uh, being not used as much uh, throughout the uh, centers. Um, at the moment, uh, we have included uh, 149 patients, as I said to you, and uh, we have a strict um, outcome parameters which we defined in our steering committee, uh, and we would like to have uh, at least a total of 200 patients before we start analyzing. Uh, until then, we will not look at the data and will not give any uh, further approaches. There's a second, uh, another initiative on the same basis now where the environment of the registry is already there. This is uh, dealing with uh, brain trauma, uh, and especially craniectomy and cranios, uh, cranioplasty. Uh, the initiative goes from Düsseldorf. Thomas Beetz is the uh, main player uh, who did a lot of efforts in this, uh, but it's also is, uh, now done uh, and supported by the European Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, um, which is uh, another a topic which will come in the future. So in summary, uh, registries are perfectly uh, for rare diseases, which address for almost all the diseases we are dealing with in pediatric neurosurgery, uh, in which limited knowledge is uh, there and related. Uh, most treatment protocols are related to individual experience. Our IT and web-based technology, which has advanced, gives us uh, the perfect environment for broader knowledge acquisition inside of those kind of registries and the implementation of registries um, will reflect treatment protocols, will define standard of cares, and will um, give us data uh, to uh, uh, adapt those kind of treatment protocols over time. So the basic um, conclusion from this is that actually the implementation of registries will already improve uh, the 
uh, treatment protocols being more standardized that maybe have been done before. And at the end, the broader data-based approach to further evolve protocols will lead to uh, the define uh, more specific questions, which uh, will be the basis for designing randomized control trials. And then a specific uh, hypothesis can be either even proven or disproving over time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Machado. Thank you, Tomal, for your excellent talk. Uh, really, uh, it's so important to, to have uh, this uh, registry. I have one, one short question for you. You showed the, the impact of uh, a registry in oncology. With oncology, even uh, in our specialty, we have uh, uh, big numbers. So uh, the, the, the impact of uh, registry uh, was uh, big in the, either in treatment and uh, in survival, as uh, you have shown. Uh, you mentioned also the, the, the rare diseases. Do you think that uh, we can expect the same impact as uh, in other, in more common diseases with the registry, or we, we will uh, only know more about the history, the natural history of the disease uh, without any impact in the in the definition of uh, different kind of treatment, what what is your point for it in that uh, sense? Uh, I think, especially in rare diseases, the registries make uh, such an important will play or should play a very important role because what we are dealing with at the moment is that a lot of centers are doing treatment protocols which have been evolved over time due to historic reasons of the respective centers. And then we are um, communicating our results in meetings, uh, but that will not necessarily change any kind of uh, for the further or the for the long term outcome. If we start registries, we start international corporations or even national corporations. We start to discuss among each other how what kind of data are you delivering for those kind of um, rare diseases? What kind of protocols in treatment are you using and what is your outcome accordingly? And uh, due to this basis, I think we will learn a lot uh, to find together more closely and actually to evolve uh, to better standardization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Narin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Machado. Thank you uh, again, Professor Tomali. Uh, so it gives me uh, immense pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. George Jallo. Uh, Dr. George Jallo is uh, an eminent neurosurgeon from uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm sure you have studied from at least one of his books and read many of his papers. Uh, he's a very busy man. Uh, he's not only the, uh, uh, at Johns Hopkins, he's also the um, uh, medical director of chief of chief physician at uh, the Old Children's Hospital and also the vice dean uh, of the hospital, as well as the director of the Neuroprotection um, uh, Research Center. So thank you, Professor Dr. Jallo, in your very busy time, and you always have supported the listserv um, for your talk. And I think I, I, this talk means a lot to me in the sense that uh, I always say to my residents, if you get the operation first time right, you are going to be a, a not so busy surgeon in life. And you have to get to only one operation to redo and your life is all too busy. So uh, looking forward to your a talk, Dr. Jallo. Thank you. Thanks, Naren. Thank you, Professor Machado. Uh, hopefully, you can see my uh, my slides. Yes, my absolutely. And I think you know that we've we've heard some great uh, presentations on clinical trials uh, as well as registries. Um, I, I do want to share our, our our personal experience here at Johns Hopkins All Children's, um, looking at reducing reducing shunt infections and reoperations in shunt patients, as Naren. Uh, uh, stated. First of all, you know, um, I think we all have to admit that shunts are okay, right? You know, they are the bread and butter uh, for what we do as uh, pediatric neurosurgeons, and we recognize uh, that 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 hydrocephalus is not a uniform uh, disease. Um, however, uh, we you know that 
shunts have modified the prognosis of hydrocephalus, and we've been able to resolve uh, almost all the cases of hydrocephalus. Um, we've converted what was previously a lethal disease into a curable disease with a relatively good prognosis according to uh, the etiology. Um, and I think, you know, what we can say is that we all recognize that, you know, we will say that the best shunt is really to have no shunt, um, especially knowing that the infection rate could be anywhere from two to 15% within three months. There's mechanical failure of anywhere from 30 to 40%, 40 to 80% by five years, seizures of at 5% in the first year and at 1% in, uh, per year uh, thereafter. Uh, as evident, and and if there are non-physiological solutions such as overshunting uh, with these uh, non-physiological solutions, um, I think you know for for the young trainees, um, uh, there was a, a lecture by Anthony Ashoff Ashoff uh, in 1998 um, in, uh, at the second Neuro Horizons conference on pediatric neurology and neurosurgery, and when he was finishing up his talk on shunts for hydrocephalus. And, you know, it was a very controversial conclusion. In conclusion, he said that natural uh, is much better than silicone and, you know, take it as it is uh, for that. Uh, it was very provocative uh, at that time. So I think the biggest problem is shut infection. You know, why does it happen? How often does it happen? Um, and, you know, that we all recognize that infection is risk of any any time we do an operation, regardless of the technique that we use. Uh, it is a foreign body that is implanted uh, and can involve any part of the body. Um, on the In the United States, the national average is anywhere between 5 to 10 percent. When does a shunt infection happen? Uh, typically, it, it occurs within the first two months. Uh, up to 70% of the infections will occur within the first uh, 60 days of surgery. 90% uh, of infections occur within six months of surgery, uh, and less than 10% of infections occur after six months. Exceptions to recent shunt infection surgery is really uh, if there's a recent infection or surgery uh, on an area where the shunt resides. And I can tell you, you know, we all see uh, infections that occur when uh, other surgeons, whether it be plastic surgeons, general surgeons, are operating near our shunts. Uh, ventricular atrial shunts can be infected by uh, bacteremic events uh, or when uh, patients are on intravenous antibiotics or intravenous solutions um, and those intravenous access devices are, uh, uh, are get a transient sepsis, uh, can seed the shunt or occasionally when less virulent or indolent organisms such, such as propriana acne or other skin organisms can seed uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the tubing or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the shunt. Um, and a shunt tap ne almost never causes a shunt infection itself. The rate of reinfection is very high, as high as 20%. Other risk factors for shunt infection is the age of the patient as recognized. They, they are more likely to see a shunt infection in neonates than older children. Uh, the number of surgeries that, it, that a baby or child may have, experience of the surgeon and the duration of surgery. And how do we treat these shunt infections? Uh, one, it's usually to remove the shunt and place a temporary external ventricular drain. Occasionally one may be able to treat these uh, shunts with only antibiotics, uh, uh, such as for the hemophilus uh, influenza. Uh, you can treat with uh, antibiotics, external drain, until the uh, infection is treated, obtain three negative cultures, and then place a new system. Um, consider an alternative to the shunt, whether it be uh, with endoscopy or an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, uh, core coagulation of the core plexus. Um, and it's always uh, difficult to when, when de deciding to replace uh, the shunt. So how do we reduce shunt infections? I think, you know, it's an experienced team, uh, protocols, cleanliness, uh, testing for MRSA in high-risk patients, um, antibiotics in surgery, using the, the, the implementation or the advent of the antibiotic impregnated uh, shunts uh, in, the early, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, clean incisions, good hygiene. 
Um, what does that seem to do, reduce shunt infection rates? I think it's the use of um, uh, antibiotics on the wards before going to surgery. Um, and what I mean by that is using antibiotics, you know, 24 or 48 hours uh, before the, the, the actual operating room. Um, antibiotics after surgery, uh, covering the incisions, keeping the incisions dry, uh, the use of antibiotic ointment, um, and et cetera. When, when, I, when we look at this, I think the first uh, use of shunt protocols to reduce shunt infections was really uh, out of Marseille with Maurice Schuchs and his group um, in, the, you know, in, in the 1990s. Um, and uh, they implemented a protocol uh, where they looked at their shunt infections uh, uh, prior uh, to uh, the use of this uh, protocol. Uh, and when they revised their protocol and they looked at their experience from 1978 to 1982, looking at 300 children or 600 operations, and then the implementation of a protocol uh, after that, uh, and they looked at 600, ch another 300 uh, children uh, between 1983 and 1990. Uh, and what they found is that they were able to lower their, their incidence of the shunts to two infections uh, in 600 patients uh, or the, the per procedure rate to 0.17 um, and the overall annual incidence of a shunt infection in their unit was uh, down to 1% uh, using this protocol. And the protocol was uh, looking at uh, assessment of the patient the shut implementation timing, uh, implementing at the first case of the day, uh, the limiting the theater, the operating room staff to four people, uh, including an experienced neurosurgeon, uh, the selection of the material, the surgical technique, uh, using the implementation of antibiotics, uh, which was 30 minutes before skin incision, uh, as well as the uh, post-operative uh, period. Uh, using uh, no antibiotic medications following surgery. Uh, however, the cleanliness of the wound afterwards. So I would say this was the first use of a shunt protocol uh, back in the 80s. The next publication really uh, was in 2007, looking at that protocol coming out of the Belgian group, uh, looking at the analysis of 115 consecutive uh, uh, procedures. And again, uh, they looked at uh, their technique um, and they too used a similar uh, protocol um, as well, you know, where they stated that it was the first uh, procedure of the day uh, using, however, they used systemic antibiotics for 24 hours. Uh, they kept the operating room doors closed, similar to the Shooks protocol, avoided any movements in the operating room and no unauthorized uh, entrance and uh, avoided heat. They were a little more specific on avoided, avoiding heat lamps. Um, and then the, as we heard uh, uh, about the shunt protocol and the hydrocephalus clinical research uh, network, looking at four centers uh, that looked at their shunt protocol, where they decreased the shunt infection rate from about 9% uh, prior to the protocol to about 5.7 or 6% uh, using uh, th their protocol uh, across these uh, four centers. So clearly, a standardized protocol for shunt surgery significantly reduced a shunt infection across a multi a multi center protocol, and you can see, you know, this the protocol that was uh, used across these multiple centers. And now these, you know, this this network is quadrupled in in terms of the number of centers uh, that are participating in it. So when I and you can see the the number of infections per month. Um, at, and the decreased uh, across the protocol. So when I moved down to All Children's in 2015, uh, there were three other neurosurgeons. Um, and the first thing that I want to implement is, first of all, is why create a protocol? Um, especially when you look at the historical average of four to 6%, which you know was already, I thought was pretty good. Um, and we had multiple surgeons preferences um, but my thought was, if we can develop a protocol, I felt that we could actually improve on our historical shut infection, our annual uh, infection rate of four to six percent, um, and that would be better for the surgeons, the patients, as well as the institution, 
if we had one protocol that we all followed uh, so that the organization and the operating room theater knew how we would be caring for all patients uh, with a shunt. And the other thing was, who was going to monitor these protocol violations? Was it going to be neurosurgery? Was it going to be the operating room? Or was it going to be the organization? And what we ended up doing was we standardized the protocol and, and we gave it a name. Actually, we called it shunt like a champion, um, similar to you know what, what uh, I think as any good, and I apologize, uh, any good protocols really want to make sure that the the entire team understands the value of it and what we looked at was you know we established it in july of 2016 it took us uh, about six months uh, to develop the protocol and we looked at our infections uh, thereafter and we what we found was after we Im uh, implemented it our annual infection rate was uh, down to 1.4 2 percent 0.58 and then what we realized is in uh, 20 in FY year 20, we had an uptick of about to 3.9, uh, yet below, but it, we did have an uptick and we looked at it very closely. Um, and then we were able in 21 to go back down to 0%. And we went about 356 days without uh, an infection. And this was the protocol that we developed. Uh, it was a checklist that every patient, every surgeon would fill out. Um, it was a checklist as well as a data collection sheet uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, ensuring that we all followed the protocol uh, in terms of the catheters that were being implement, implanted, the valves, uh, the use of antibiotics. It essentially allowed everyone in the operating room as well as uh, preoperatively, postoperatively to ensure that we are following both the checklist as well as uh, the protocol and it was able to allow us to it gathered the data that we needed to follow it. And what I'd say is when you looked at this, we can follow the shut infections once the protocol was implemented and we followed it closely. And then in 20, we had an uptick of the number of infections. And you can see that given that we are following it so closely, you can, you can see that we had a slight increase in the number of gram negative infections in, uh, in, in the year of uh, 2020. Um, and uh, we also knew uh, the type of catheters that we were using. And, and we immediately uh, did a, a deeper uh, analysis of this um, and looking at why uh, we had a slight increase as well as a return uh, to the operating room uh, at that time. Um, and what we did was, you know, again, we, since we were looking at this very closely, we were able to easily analyze uh, within each month uh, why we had the increase in number of returns to the infections as well as the number of returns uh, to the operating room. We began using the new codman certus valve as well as we began using the new back to seal catheters uh, rather than the Medtronic catheters. Um, and there might've been a new learning curve. One of the things that we did was with the return to the operating rooms, uh, we, we looked at it, whether it was an infection, was it a wound issue? Was it related to the underlying condition? Uh, the loculated hydrocephalus was it a technical issue. Or was it a hardware problem? And there was a monthly discussion uh, at our monthly M&M um, and there are presentations both at our monthly conference as well as to the larger organization, to our surgical colleagues, as well as into our perioperative con uh, colleagues in the operating room so that we everyone was aware uh, if there were any issues. And you can see, you know, here in FY18, 19, 20, uh, and 21, the, the, the difference, uh, the, you know, where the impact or the changes were uh, in, in 20 as compared to the other uh, years there. The, the, the sheet uh, and the analysis looking at the etiology of the hydrocephalus, the location of the shunt uh, and the, the discussion that was held uh, regarding uh, why there's a return to the operating room. And this was uh, performed on every patient uh, that was readmitted or that especially if they were returned uh, to the operating room. And you can see when we looked at our returns um, on average, every, you know, our, our average return uh, per year is around 11 to 13%. In 20, it was up to 23%. Um, and then in, uh, uh, when we were able to analyze it even deeper, we were able to change it back down to 8%. And in 21, we're back down to 8.5%. Uh, 
And I think this is only possible if you look at this and track it uh, closely uh, as a department uh, uh, and as a group. So you, once you analyze it, uh, you're able to delve and make any changes that need to be uh, had uh, as a group to see if there's any reason why patients are returning to the operating room uh, for un unexpected reasons or for technical reasons. And, you know, just to conclude, I think, you know, what we understand is that, you know, this hydrocephalus, you know, it's a dynamic state. There's many etiologies for these patients. You really need to have strict adherence to the protocol. It's a team approach, non-individual management. Um, and there's got to be an open analysis and discussion, both at the neurosurgery, at the departmental level, at the uh, department of surgery and the op perioperative level and the organizational level. And it's got to be a continuous uh, review uh, for quality improvement uh, and review to be able to, to make changes in real time uh, and uh, to help benefit both the department uh, and the patients. Thank you, Naren. Professor Machado, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalo. So, so interesting and important questions that you raised. Uh, I would like to just to uh, ask you one uh, question. We know that uh, uh, in many centers, when we talk to neurosurgeons in uh, many uh, centers, uh, shunt operations are uh, frequently performed by the junior neurosurgeon. How do you convince people that the, it is important to have an experienced neurosurgeon to do uh, uh, what is uh, uh, what we, we think it's a simple procedure? Do, do, you, do you have any of these uh, problems with your team in the beginning? Yes. So, I mean, that's a great uh, question. So, you know, when we looked at it, we had four uh, consultants, consultant neurosurgeons. Um, and what we end, what we do look at is we do look at their individual infection rates um, and we track the individual consultants infections. And if there's a, an increase in their infection rate, whether they're doing the surgery or a junior faculty is doing the, the procedure under their name, um, we would know that they've got an increased infection rate um, and they're ultimately responsible. So they have to, they, they're accountable for the infections. So they have to, if they're held accountable, they have to get up there and explain why their infection rate is higher than the other members of the department. So if you hold the individual member surgeon, individual senior members accountable for the infections. Um, I think that's that's the key. And did you see any ethical problems by doing that? I mean, uh, you're pointing the one specific surgeon that is uh, not doing a, a good job, maybe. No, I we don't because it's all transparent. Uh, you know, we 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 hold we. we Everything's public. Everything is transparent. Everyone knows what the other surgeon's infection rate is. We under, we also mm -hmm. we also um when, when it's an open discussion and, and all the returns to the operating room. Um, everyone knows you know who who implanted the shunt. Um, and as well as the reason for the return was it a technical reason there was a return to the operating room? Was it an infection or was it a hardware problem? Um, and we, we follow it uh, very closely. Um, and if there's a discrepancy between one surgeon from the, from the group, um, it, it is discussed uh, uh, at the departmental level. Okay. I would hate yeah. to work for us, honestly. Let's be real. <laughs> I, I, I think you know, the truth is, you know, the bottom line is if we're, it's transparent, uh, everyone knows what the other surgeons uh infection rate as well as their return to the operating room is but um i think if you want to improve the quality you need the transparency if i may just make one point uh, i'm sure mr solanke will come into uh, when he comes to talk about it i think in, in birmingham when i worked as well uh, i think if, if there was a return to surgery within a week of shunt implantation then we had kind of a mini inquiry to look at why 
that happened just to learn. So I think that does help. You, you know, Naren, we we look at this. If there's a return, we actually look at the returns within 90 days mm -hmm. uh, at our center, mm -hmm. and it, and if you know, if it's it's it, it's a learning process for all of us, uh, and it's what it's what's best for the, for the children. There's no, it's not a punishment, mm -hmm. um, and as long and we're very collegial with one another. Uh, I think yeah. you know, the group has been together for decades, so it's not as if one is looking at the other partner. Um, in sense that, oh, I'm trying to compete. There's no competition among the group. And I think that's what makes it um, a partnership rather than a competition. And I think that's the key. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Machado. Thank you, Dr. Jallo. That's fantastic. As you said, that it's a bread and butter shunt infection and the shunts and getting that right really makes life life a bit more sweeter for being a pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, this now brings me to uh, introduce Professor um, Sio. Um, uh, it's a, I have known Professor Sio now for, for almost 10 uh, years. I learned from him at the European course, uh, European pediatric neurosurgery course, and I have had the privilege of keeping in contact with him. Uh, Professor Sio is uh, uh, based in Singapore and uh, he is uh, highly regarded, having previously been the president of the ASEAN uh, Society of Neurosurgery, uh, Australasian Society of Neurosurgery. And um, in uh, 2022, in December, hopefully able to uh, be the president of the ISPN Congress and also uh, now been, uh, uh, become the president elect of the ISPN. So it's a really great privilege to have Dr. Sia, and particularly considering that it's Singapore, they are already seven or eight hours after UK. Uh, I, I really thank Dr. Sia for kindly uh, um, being here at this time or at early morning back in Singapore. It's an important topic. Uh, we all come across it. It's a hard topic uh, and uh, look forward to hearing from Professor Sia on how he looks at it. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Naren. Uh, so when you asked me to talk something about outcome, I thought, well, what if the patient doesn't have a really, really good outcome? So I think this is where we started. And, and so there are actually, when you look at it, and so this is a talk that's going to be a little bit on the ethics of maybe some legal issues, not really day-to-day -day the neurosurgery, although I'll try to introduce something. And I apologize, my slides are very long, very wordy, because somehow when you do ethics, you know, it's not something talking of, a picture is talking of a, a lot of words, but basically there are potential uh, you know, basis, uh, you know, if, how do you withdraw potential life prolonging treatments? And usually there are four reasons. Uh, one is about autonomy. If patient wants it, you can't say no. Futility, then this is what we're going to talk about where treatment is not successful in prolonging life, but I think we need to go in deeper into that. Then best interest where, well, treatment may be successful, but the quality or quality of life may not be what it it's in the best interest of the patient to provide it. And of course, we are all aware of distributive justice where treatment cannot be provided because of scarce resources. So futility, actually the term first appeared in medical ethics in the 18, uh, 1980s. The idea was that, well, if doctors identified a partner treatment was not was filled down, then no further treatment needed to be given to patients. So basically we applied DNR, that will solve the problem. Um, because actually as a doctor, we do not have obligation to provide futile treatment. And so, you know, because, you know, paternis paternism was already going out of the window. So, you know, we don't want to be seen as being very paternistic. But unfortunately, you know, uh, it was very difficult to try to define futile treatment in a way that would be practically applicable. You know, so you know, is it because the patient will be permanently unconscious or dependent on medical care? And if you look at this article in the, uh, it's actually a letter in the Journal of Medical Ethics by Brian Jeanette, you know, the one of the person who actually came up with the GCS score, right? They're saying decisions not to apply coronal, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitations or DNA orders. The clear distinction should be made between the reasons for we're holding it. So it may be filled out because it's very unlikely to be successful or quality of life after that will be changed to so poor level that, you know, we have proved to be a greater burden than just the benefit of prolongation of life. And that the quality of life is already so poor due to chronic autonomy disease 
their life should be it should not be prolonged by CPR. But actually, when you look at the criticism of this uh, item number three, actually, if the diseases are really so poor in the first place, and you know, not to give to write CPR, actually, then there'll be a lot of other diseases that actually you do not want to prolong treatment as well. So the problem is that. The concept of utility is something that you know somehow seems to be quite difficult to define, right? Because it's very difficult to determine if your treatment, for example, CPR has no chance of working. How do you know, right? Then of course you cannot look at past cases uh, uh, that just because this particular treatment had been given or therefore it will work because everybody is different, right? Here we are looking at one person at a time. We cannot look at a whole group unlike the registries that we heard about earlier. And of course, then they can also be influenced by self-fulfilling prophecies, well, because in the past treatment have been stopped or held because they were regarded as futile. So if you tell the people now that you can't do it, of course, that the treatment is futile. Right? Then the other thing about futility is that it contains value judgment. So what counts as a successful outcome of CPR? Is it just purely return of spontaneous circulation, short-term survival? Is it hours, days? survival to hospital discharge, or survival with a particular quality of life. And then what probability of success is so low as to make resuscitation futile? Is it 5%, 1%, 0.1%? And some patients may not want to take the chance of resuscitation being successful, no matter how small. And so, although we may use the label futile, more commonly, there is some chance of treatment succeed, succeeding, but probability of benefit or magnitude is so low that we probably think that it will be potentially inappropriate to provide it. And so, you know, the Oxford Dictionary uh, defines futility, uh, futility as some the leaky vein filling of the desired end through intrinsic defect. So I think in discussing futility, it's important to distinguish between effect and benefit, right? So effective treatment, if not beneficial, should, may also be futile. And then, of course, it should have some form of anatomical, physiological, biological effect on the patient but it has to benefit the patient as a whole, right? And then hopelessness can be confused with fertility, but hope is an emotion response to a situation. It is not an objective determination. At the same time, futility, as I mentioned, fertility is a determination made regarding the cause of action for one individual person. It cannot be applied to a group or society as a whole. And so it's a word that comes out a lot when there are disagreements actually over treatment of patients. And this is really one of the issues that we face, right? Where do you want to provide treatment to this patient or not? Why do you not want to provide? So I think it's a clash between two fundamental principles in medical ethics, if you're looking at it from an ethical point of view, which is beneficence and autonomy, right? So trouble is for trying to, uh, you know, define it is that actually it's just so futile yeah, that the, 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 the attempts to define the treatment uh, themselves futile. And actually, this is a, another big problem because um, in, in about six years ago, there was an uh, official statement from actually several societies, the uh, American Thoracic Society, uh, Crito Nurse Society, uh, I think, uh, this uh, Society of uh, Critical Care Physicians and so on, they came up with a term that you should not use the word futile, but instead apply the term potentially inappropriate, right? So to, as to describe treatments that at least have some chance of accomplishing the effects sought by the patient, but which clinicians believe that competing ethical considerations justify not providing them. And then as physicians, we should talk to these patients and all that so that they know whether the treatment is appropriate or not, right? And then, you know, so actually to use the term potentially inappropriate rather than filter to emphasize two important aspects of such treatment. First of all, is that the word filter or ineffective um, is not as clear as the word inappropriate um, because uh, we, we, we depend on both technical medical experience and also value laden claim rather than strictly technical judgment. And then secondly, potentially signals that the judgments are preliminary rather than final. And so, you know, you might want to review the situation again, right? Because the ethical concerns that may be raised to justify the refusals include concerns that treatment is highly unlikely to be successful, is extremely expensive, or is intended to achieve a goal of controversial value. But there are also then groups that came up with 
arguments against using the word inappropriate because it's too broad. All right. At, at the same time, when we use the term medical futility, it confirms unambiguously that human beings are mortal and medicine's power are limited. And so it leads to more naturally to integrating palliative and comfort care into the critical care decision making. And it therefore encourages us to think more deeply about our roles in the inevitable ending of patients' lives. Right. And so, you know, again, these are just a lot of controversy about. Uh, you know, whether you should use the word, um, you know, inappropriate or should you use uh, futility, right, which conveys pointlessness or uselessness, right? But, you know, the other thing is the concept of medical futility has been recognized throughout our history, medical history, because it expresses unambiguously that human beings are mortal, that medicine's powers are limited, and that all of us in healthcare need to think deeply about how we guide patients through the inevitable ending of their lives, right? Now, we come to the pediatric perspective. Now, we know in our practice, pediatric death is actually quite rare. In a pediatric ICU setting, vast majority of patients survive. Mortality rates within the pediatric ICUs are usually less than 2.5%. And the thing about children is that, you know, maybe because of plasticity, they survive despite complex congenital, uh, chronic congenital or quiet conditions, and they survive many, many years. And then we see that in our patients, right? And, and as long as we give them regularly uh, medical care. And so even in the concept of in, in, in pediatric neurosurgery practice, futile cases are rare, right? Now, one of the things about the kids, uh, we don't see these children most of the time, although sometimes we do, um, if they come with IV, present IVH, are the extremely preterm infants, right? And uh, they are defined as uh, infants who are born before 28 completed weeks of gestation. And um, all these children usually will need some form of resuscitation above, maybe different intensity. Some just need ventilation, oxygenation. Some actually need much more. And then the guideline for resuscitation in this particular group of patients actually are very different. For instance, in Belgium, in one of the uh, uh, provinces, from 26 weeks onwards, they should always be resuscitated. But if they are under 24 weeks of age, they need not. They should not be resuscitated unless. It is the explicit wish of the parents. And after that, and that's after they are well informed. So you can see that actually it varies. And look at this. This is just in our newspaper just a few weeks ago about this baby born 22 weeks at home. She's now three years old. She survived, right? And supposedly doing well. But we know that many of these patients are not going to be really normal. They are going to need some form of long-term care because of cognitive issues and things like that. So I'll just show you a few cases that I think we have to make decisions whether should they, they, are they futile or not. So like a seven-year-old girl, known DIPG, diagnosed already more than a year ago, now has increasing that, uh, drowsiness, GCS about 10 to 12 uh, on mesogastric feet, lower limbs are weak, bilateral signal, and a new CT scan now shows hydrocephalus. Do you do anything? Do you shun or do you say, well, she's had now life, is this case futile? We probably shouldn't let her, you know, die in peace. This is a, uh, another baby born 33 weeks, 18 month from an 18 year old baby, a mother, right? normal vaginal delivery, antenatally okay, but delivered in a private hospital at birth, presented apnea, um, and then feeding intolerance. The ultrasound show, and the CD scan shows a huge, big posture for the tumor. Right? Is this case futile? Now, what happened? The neurosurgeon in the hospital put in an EBD and transferred the patient to our hospital. What did we do? Well, okay, we did further imaging, and it, now you see drop mats. Is this a futile case and huge, big tumor in a post -fossil. Problem is, you don't know what you're dealing with. So, because if she had a leak from the EDVD, we decided to put a reservoir rather than have an open drain. This is a, one of my colleagues' consideration. And, but decided to do at the same time, why not just put a scope in and see where you can take a biopsy? And this turned out to be most likely a Medullary blastoma, definitely CSF, um, malignant cells present. Is this case futile? Well, if you think of the summary in the end, you know, a three week old, moderate preterm baby, less than two kg, it's deemed unsuitable for surgical resection, chemotherapy. So basically, you know, terminally extubated and she passed away. What about this case? This was a three day old baby girl, you know, it's an unbooked delivery, meaning that no antenatal follow up. At birth, large head and the head increasing was increasing in size and tense fontanelle scan done. Can you see huge big 
um, this is a uh, uh, germ cell tumor, right? uh, secretory type, right? Very, very malignant. Is this a filter case? Probably is because family also didn't want anything and we didn't do anything, baby died. What about this case? This was a day one baby. There was actually a vagina delivery, but it was a very difficult labor and delivery. And then after that, you know, had to be intubated immediately. And then it was transferred from the private hospital to a hospital. And look at the scan, the x-ray, right? Tetraplegic. And um, this is what the MRI showed. The baby had to be intubated. But is this case you tell? Another case, five, three-year-old girl fell from height, four stories high. Right, single mother uh, left at home uh, alone because the aunt who was 12 years old uh, went out to buy food. Uh, but hemodynamically very well. Only thing at the time when she came in, she had a plegic. And look at the scan, there's a fracture here. The cervical spinal cord is swollen. All right. And so is this a case filter? We don't think so because, you know, this is just a one time off. I mean, she's probably going to be permanently tetraplegic or maybe some improvement, but I wouldn't think that she's uh, filled down, but definitely flaccid tetraplegia, neurogenic bladder, poor family set up. Then what about this case, 15-year-old male, suddenly acute pain in the neck. And then by the time he came to us, he was also tetraplegic, essentially level C5. Basically what he had was a, um, a bleed from a AV fistula. We actually did an angiogram and, and then actually had the fistula uh, coil. And then, Within hours after that, he develops subarachnoid hemorrhage. I think it was a bleed from the coiling. Um, do you do anything? Yes, we put in EVD. Uh, he actually did very well, although he's now starting to talk to a valve. And, um, you know, but he's still tetraplegic. But is he filled out? I don't think so. And then a case of a multi, um, you know, uh, child with a uh, multi suture synostosis. Is this filter? We don't think so, but also, it's also FGFR2 synopsis. We've seen quite a lot of this, all right? Only thing was uh, this child also had a heart problem, but we, because of the head, we actually had to do a posterior compression. Um, and then he had to have trachotomize, all right? VSD, ASD closure at six weeks. Filter? Probably not. So the thing is, there are legal basis for treating uh, severely disabled children. First of all, most important, it is not permissible to do an act that intentionally causes death of a patient. So we may decline to provide treatment to a patient if that's in the patient's best interest and if it's in accordance with established medical practice. Right? This is an approach taken in adults, focusing on their values, beliefs, but this is not available to children. So the overarching test, which is legal, is the, whether continuing treatment is in the child's best interest and this must be made from perspective of individual and not from the assessment of an outsider. Right? As a, a judge said in one case, even severely handicapped people find the quality of life rewarding, which to the unhandicapped may be manifestly intolerable. So basically, this best interest principle of child actually has uh, you know, become part of a legal practice. I think it was actually first used by even Busham and Childress, although Actually, in law, it's been there a long time. So they say that long before autonomy and privacy is applied to incompetence or minors, responsibility of parents towards their children was legally defined as responsibility to act in the best interest of the patients. Right. So it has become the guidance principle of, uh, of a lot of uh, countries and things like that. Right. So basically, the thing is, does it serve just as a guidance principle? It's a principle that provides substantial direction as to how decisions are to be made? Or is it an intervention principle, which is specifying the conditions under which third parties are to intervene, intervene or both? And actually, in, in most of the laws, especially in the UK, um, where you're talking about custody determinations between parents, actually it's used as an intervention, right? Uh, much more than just a, uh, just a guidance principle. I think if I'm what I understand my reading in the US, it's probably more towards uh, guidance, right? And then so in the end, defining what is the point of treatment in field out treatment. So I think some of you will know this Charlie Gutt case uh, and the judge in this case is field out treatment has been described as pointless or of no effective benefit. Now to determine field out treatment in terms of it being pointless means that one needs to be clear and to agree on what 
the point of treatment is. If the point of continuing treatment is to cure the patient, then prolonging life with a ventilator will be filled out for patients who are permanently unconscious. However, we can't say that it's pointless to continue medical treatments for such a patient unless there is agreement about what the point of treatment is. There can be different views about what the aim of medical treatment is and what contributes a successful outcome as what we already mentioned. So a lot of times, therefore, today, we need to hinge on identifying cares of goal, right? Intervention that do not benefit a patient by achieving a care of goal, right? Can be considered filter, filter even if they do have a measurable effect. However, when the patient or the surrogate makes the prolongation of life itself the primary goal, the most burdensome interventions will potentially seem reasonable, even if they cannot reverse the underlying condition or cost of the patient's illness. So that may be futile. So actually, the, the other thing we need to do is to uh, make sure that we're assessing benefit versus harm, right? So as practitioners, pediatric practitioners, we need to spe speculate, unfortunately, speculate on the child's future to capacity uh, to appreciate the benefit. So it requires both prognostication upon the eventual cognitive function, which is, I think, very, very difficult for us because most of us are not really specially trained to do that. But we, but we can use that to try to determine benefit versus harm. And it's not, as I said, it's not so straightforward, hard to anticipate. And then, you know, as also mentioned, children likely to demonstrate vast better improvement after severe injuries, right, compared to adults. And the permanence of severely compromised consciousness may not be elucidated for months, frequently after important life-sustaining decisions have been made. And I think we all have seen that many times in our patients. So speculation regarding pursuing benefits versus harm requires the assumption that parents and guardians, all guardians' value will be shared by the child when the capacity is reached. So again, we need to go back. So, I mean, there are some questions like, should you perform trichosomy just because you can therefore send a trisomy 18 patient home for ventilation? Right? Should you actually consider putting a very severe developed child with developmental delay on ECMO? Probably not. Right? But these are some things that we kind of you know, know we should not be doing. So I'm concluding... And my title in this concluding slide is trying to conclude when there's no conclusion. As mentioned, there are many discussions, even disagreements on definition and use of term futility, whether it's replacing the term with an inappropriate. And so basically, yeah, attempts to define futile treatment are themselves futile. But nevertheless, as I think as medical practitioners, deep insight, we know what futility and futile treatments are. We kind of know scenarios where it's ethically concerning to continue pursuit of treatment. They are not easy to define in simple terms because there's so many moral, ethical, professional, and legal issues to consider. And also because each person is different and even if the disease is the same. And luckily, in pediatric neurosurgery, we do not see many cases that are futile. Nevertheless, we do make the ultimate decision as to start or end treatment. And we should do them with consideration of child's best interests, respect for parents' autonomies and wishes, as well as taken, taking into consideration legal, ethical issues. And I mean, these terms are easy to talk about and discuss, but they're very hard to accept and follow. Thank you very much. Professor Machado, thank you. Thank you, Nairi. Uh, nice to see you and you. Yes, there you go. Good uh, to see you too. Let me ask you one uh, simple question. Who has the last word, the final decision? The neurosurgeon, the pediatrician, the family, or mainly the, the mother? What is your view concerning this? I think uh, the medical team, not just the neurosurgeon, but usually the intensive care doctor together and the pediatrician, we, we are the people who in a way have to make a final decision. But I think from what my understanding of, and talking to parents, you know, you need to tell them what their expectations are. And it's not an easy thing to do, right? But I think it's something that has, has to be done. Now, if the family do not accept what we propose, then, you know, we have to go, the, the next solution is to go to court. The judge oh, really? will make a final decision. Okay. That's a difficult decision. I, I have seen some many uh, people, many mothers that uh, they don't accept the, the, this, the, the term. So they ask you, 
uh, you need to do something, then. Mm. So then we go. So we go on to decide. You know what is the point. So I think I think defining the point of uh, the treatment is very important. Like I said, you know, if the point of treatment is just to prolong life, you know, yeah. it's probably quite meaningless. So this is where I think, uh, you know, I and I think as a if the, as a neurosurgeon alone, we 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 it's very hard to decide. Uh, I think you need the whole team to decide, and if necessary, go back, go out to the or even the you know ethics team in the hospital ethics committee or whatever. I mean, because uh, nowadays, you know, in, in the past, I think it's very, it's not much, much easier. And actually with adults at end of life, it's actually much easier to, you know, describe what is supposed to be should tell. But I think with children, uh, it's much, much harder because expectations yeah. are very, very different. Yeah, correct. Thank you very much. Narin. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you Professor Machado. Uh, thank you, Professor Tu. Uh, just one observation. I, you are all very senior than me, and you have seen far, far more cases than me. But just two weeks ago, I had to do a decompressive craniectomy on a child hit by a car. Very, very bad uh, injury. I had to, uh, on the left side, there was a depressed skull fracture of all of the temporal bone. Uh, including the petrous temporal depressed, but acute subdural was on the other side, evacuated. And I put the ICP and EBD and while closing the ICPs went up to 40, 50. And uh, I closed, took her to scan. I knew it was going to be extradural other side, extradural other side came back. And, uh, and when we were taking to the patient to uh, CT scan, ICPs were 80s, 90s. Then I took her back to the, took the extradural out, came back to 50, 60. And I, you know, I thought there was no hope for this girl. You know, I was, I mean, it was in the early hours of the morning. And then we repeated CT the next day and then the MRI three days later and one week later. And there's not a single area of infarction. There's contusions, but there's no area of infarction. So sometimes with these children, you know, I was so convinced that at three o'clock in the morning, this was the worst case I have seen with ICPs 80, 90, hovering for a long time. And so sometimes this uh, child had also venous sinus thrombosis. Um, so sometimes with children, it's so hard to predict which one is going to do bad, which one is going to do bad. And I'm sure you have all uh, seen far more cases of where you thought there was no hope and the child gets better. Uh, Professor Machado, what's your thoughts on that? And Professor Tours and uh, Professor... I think uh, you're right. Uh, and once you uh, mentioned that, it's very rare for us to consider uh, uh, futile treatment. Uh, you should try because uh, uh, we have uh, in our favor um, the plasticity of the brain of one child. And um, you don't know. Uh, you have to try as hard as you can. That's my point. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, 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 what you agree with that, but uh, I think that's the, what we must do. Yeah, I think I think with trauma, right, which is just why I show some trauma cases and spine cases. It's very hard to decide. I mean, I think the ones that we know very clearly are the tumor cases, right? Because we know that you know it's it's something that's going to keep happening and getting worse and worse. Whereas the trauma is usually just a one-off time. Now they may they may die from it, but they may survive from it, and actually. This is the part where you know we just have to do our best. And I agree with you about these sort of cases. I was gonna show one trauma case which I thought was gonna be hopeless, but actually she also did very well as well. But I, I thought uh, I showed the other cases uh, should be sufficient enough. But I think so. So the the ones that in the end the, that are gonna be futile uh, are the, those with malignant brain tumors that we know will progress. Those with uh, you know very small babies that are going to you know. Even if, like, like the case of the the the, uh, the, the fractured cervical spine from delivery, I mean, you know, that that case, no matter how, it's going to be very difficult to try to keep that baby alive if you really want to try it. So yeah, I think we we kind of know what are the cases, but it's it's the whole process, not just we make a decision. I think nowadays it's impossible for one person to make a decision. So we actually have to get the whole team, yeah. and you may have to talk to parents many 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 times. You know, and finally get a decision. But once you decide it's a decision, then if really parents really object to it, then I think you may have to go to court to, to get the court to actually help you out. Thanks.
Okay, thank you. Back to you, Nari. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Great, thanks. So um, I'm going to leave the last presentation which, to Mr. Salanki, which is the most important presentation for our times in terms of COVID. So I'm just going to go through this presentation of mine on centralization of services. Um, in UK, as you know, uh, many of the pediatric services have been centralized, craniosynostosis surgery, epilepsy, pediatric epilepsy surgery, uh, uh, neurovascular almost. Uh, and so it creates a lot of, um, lot of uh, uh, issues in the sense that people who have had the centralization are obviously happy. The people who haven't had the centralization are not happy. And I had this unique uh, position of going from a centralized service for craniosynostosis in Birmingham, then to Bristol, then now to Oxford, which has centralized craniofacial service. So I started this talk while I was in Bristol when we did not have centralized craniofacial service. Now I have moved to Oxford, we have a centralized uh, service. So I wonder how I, my, my, my view changed. So basically the aim of a centralized, any, any service is that is safe, high quality, affordable, accessible. And um, we all know that we, you know, we have gone through our own learning curve. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, the uh, when we are learning, then we come to a plateau phase. Sometimes after a plateau phase, we can have a bit of a deterioration. And then as you know, we finally come to be very wise, then it starts to uh, slowly go down. So the, the question is that by having centralization, whether you can have um, better quality of care. But the problem with uh, assessing quality of services that between departments is the heterogeneity of patients in different departments. And also different patients, different physicians have different points where they intervene. The one who selects only the good patients to operate will always have a good outcome. And uh, so you can't easily compare um, two, two different de departments. And uh, the other problem is that you know, we still don't have any agreed outcome measures uh, for you know almost most things, so it's really tough. And once again, if you are going to have these outcome measures and then to see who has a better outcome, you really have to pump a lot of money to do studies into the outcome measures. And the the studies that have been done regarding the size uh, and the, the volume and the outcome relationship are based basically a poor quality from poor quality data, population-based databases, which are retrospective rather than prospective carefully controlled studies. Surrogate markers for quality, uh, you know, we have different surrogate markers uh, that we usually use, mortality rate, complication rate, discharge, where they are going, course, length of stay, but very rarely, patient satisfaction or functional outcome. This is not because we don't want to do it, it's because it does take a lot of effort. And if you don't have money to have nurses to collect data uh, who are impartial, et cetera, et cetera, it's very hard to do these more detailed uh, outcome measures. In terms of uh, uh, looking at the volume and outcome um, uh, relationship, I think it, it all starts from the subspecialization. I mean, subspecialization of in medicine started about 200 years ago when medicine started to be, become more advanced. And even back in 1917, ophthalmology department, ophthalmologists in US uh, had their own exam for ophthalmology. So, you know, the official opening of subspecialization. And there are many studies to show that subspecialization improves outcome. For example, with the lung resection, comparing to general surgeon to general thoracic surgeons, they have less, uh, less mortality in undertaking lung resections. And uh, in terms of the volume relationship outcome, there, there are some unanswered questions. They are which, which uh, procedures that experience is important to improve outcome? And uh, what's the minimum number of cases you have to have to say that, that you actually have enough volume for a case? Should it be, um, uh, you know, for example, in craniopharyngioma, you know, one eminent surgeon said that, you know, he does five cases a year, which he considered high, high number compared to someone who's doing two. And so once again, you know, where do you define it? And uh, what number to arrive at the, at the plateau phase. So the, what I mean is that what's the number to arrive at the plateau phase and how many cases you need to do every year to say that you are having a good volume and good experience. Experience uh, depends on many things, case volume, 
and the current case rate, how many cases are you doing now? Because you might have done lots before and also years of experience. And I just saw a, 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 a meme uh, of, uh, uh, from Africa, which said when, a, when, a, when an elderly man passes away, a whole library is burnt because experience, you know, which we can't uh, learn without time. And that does help in terms of uh, giving quality. Case volume and outcome, uh, Marutapa uh, did a study. This was a system, systematic review, and they found that increased case volume was associated with improved outcome, as well as the, the experience also had an independent effect on outcome, just not the numbers. And depending on the operations, the learning curve can be, uh, the, in their study, they found 25 to 75 procedures. For example, single port um, a lap a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, one could get to the plateau phase with eight cases. However, for example, septomyotoplasty, it will take even a good surgeon about five years to be good enough. And then there's a deterioration phase that Marutapa uh, noted. And this is a deterioration phase that happens uh, despite increased experience and increased caseload, and also with increased experience. I'm sure you have also moved around departments. You would have seen sometimes the largest department doesn't necessarily have the best outcome. So what's the reason for that? You know, no, no one quite knows. It. Is it mental fatigue, burnout, complacency, uh, or the senior surgeons having more other, other commitments? So in terms of centralization, I think the, the reason for centralization is now there's less and less tolerance for suboptimal outcome during the learning curve. And there's a rapid pace of increase in knowledge where you have to have um, some person specializing in this area and patients have very high expectations as well. It's interesting that the, in one study by Tevis, they found that patient satisfaction uh, depended independently on knowing that a center is excellent and that it had a large volume. So that was more important in terms of patient satisfaction that the, since the center has large volume rather than how well the patient did or what's the complication rate or readmission rate. I have seen this as well. If it is a prestigious hospital, patients don't ask any questions, even outcomes might not be good. And one, when you are in another hospital where outcomes are very good, Patients are very hard to please because they think that that big hospital with a big name, you know, that might be giving a better, out, better outcome. So names do, brand names do matter. So regionalization and centralization, um, I think centralization, by that I mean is that, you know, in UK we have got this, uh, for example, craniofacial surgery, four centers, and the idea is to increase safety, quality, cost effectiveness. And that in cost effectiveness, meaning better outcome with lower costs. I think in US that was recognized pretty early on in 1985 when they said minimum numbers for various important surgeries like open heart surgery, radiation therapy. The improved, there are many studies which have showed that improved outcome with increased volume in neurosurgery. However, there are potential uh, disadvantage for centralization. Uh, the patients can get delayed in accessing care and uh, a centralization can increase market share of a hospital, but not necessarily guarantee improved quality. We assume that the increased volume goes with the improved quality, but that's not a, definitely a given. In US in 2009, WANS, had a positional statement that they, are, they, they recognize the volume um, outcome relationship, but they also recognize the limitations of that. And they, had, they did not uh, recommend uh, a mandatory regionalization of neurosurgical service. And the decision might be more than just uh, outcomes. So limitations of the studies that we currently have, they are mostly observational, retrospective, and population-based. So trying to make important decisions on, um, on not so good quality data, which doesn't usually help. I did a survey of our list of members to see whether they thought various subspecialty <laughs> centralization will improve outcome. So this was cranial synostosis, you can see. So 10 is, it, you know, it will definitely improve. Zero centralization doesn't improve. You can see the, the bar chart is skewed to the 
uh, to the centralization. And this was for a pediatric epilepsy surgery. Once again, it shows centralization is better. Uh, although it was only 16 people who answered it, then for Moya Moya, once again, the skew towards uh, centralization and the pediatric tumor surgery, uh, posterior fossa, even this is all neurosurgeons, they give them, uh, their opinion is, uh, when I say centralization, I hear meant few centers in the nation, not regionalization. So once again, even for posterior fossa, many neurosurgeons, at least in this limited study, think that centralization is better for outcome. Craniopharyngioma, centralization. And uh, then I asked, what do you think would be the effect of centralization on the ability to access uh, for patients to access services, the red one says, you know, it, it shouldn't have any effect and blue saying uh, it improves access or, um, sorry, red one says uh, worsen overall access. So the problem is that, you know, the further you live, it really does take a long time. We see that in craniofacial surgery, we are patients, the, the time the patients get picked up and referred to cranial facial surgeries, centers can be quite long. And then what do you think the effect of centralization on the overall patient journey? 25% uh, said centralization shouldn't have any effect. 25% quarter thought it will make it worse. And uh, third, one third thought it will improve. So there's no consensus that uh, centralization necessarily makes a, a patient journey worse. Maybe our better outcome can have better patient journey. Then I asked, do you think centralization in praxis leads to delay in management? Um, uh, almost four out of 10 said they, they don't think that there, there would be delay in management. Uh, very small said it will uh, increase, uh, and but 37, one third thought, yes, centralization can lead to delay in management. Do you think centralization would eventually lead to relative slowing of innovation and advancement of the field? I mean, this is, you know, interestingly, three quarters said it doesn't. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at anything in life, you know, whether it's in the Google, I remember Google when it was the smallest company which broke through. Many, many innovations come from people who are outside the traditional thinking because whenever we go into big departments, we are beaten up to think like that. So it's very hard to think outside the outside that box. So, you know, on short term, in my personal opinion, it will be good to have, you know, it will be good to have centralization. But in the long term, you know, if there are four centers which they don't have to compete, then you can, in my opinion, that can lead to a decrease in innovation because usually these outliers would come up with new ideas that break the mold. But in this survey, people didn't think that that should, that will affect innovation. Do you think centralization could lead to um, worsening of outcomes? Uh, this one, once again, you know, most people thought that's not the case. Why I put this question is that sometimes when it's centralized, people can get complacent. When it's a small practice, people have more time and concentrate on their cases. So that's why I asked. But in this study, people didn't think that majority didn't think that will have any uh, that will not affect outcome. Do you think centralization leads to deterioration in service provision at times of pandemic? I think in this one what do you call one third majority thought that it would deteriorate. I think that if this, if this uh, uh, pandemic, as it looks like, is going to be prolonged, then the centralized uh, service uh, for the Achilles tendon of centralized service will be, will be shown. Uh, so on the whole, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, I think the consensus is that centralization is uh, good, but I think there needs to be very careful studies into this because sometimes these can be fallacies. And if they are a centralization, then there has to be a way of innovation. There has to be uh, minimum uh, minimum sets of uh, papers and uh, innovations that has to be looked at so that people don't become complacent. But if you are going to have centralization, then you have to think hard about how you are going to give service provision. Because if all, this, all the important surgeries are even posterior for the surgeries are going to be centralized if, according to my survey that they prefer. So why would a neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon be in a periphery that just doing a shunt surgery? So that's something that for the, uh, the people who make decisions. So I hope this gives you some idea, some thoughts for you regarding the uh, important question of centralization and regionalization. Thank you very much. Any questions, Dr. Mashodop? Thank you, Nari. 
this is a very interesting and important uh, uh, problem that you have discussed. I think uh, there are reasons for centralization in, in pediatric neurosurgery. For instance, if you consider epilepsy surgery or craniofacial surgery. Uh, but uh, oncology, I, I'm not so sure because you have uh, good centers for oncology almost everywhere today. So uh, um, I think uh, we must learn more, uh, uh, we'll talk or we'll speak more about these uh, questions. Uh, the problem is that the uh, pediatric neurosurgery uh, always uh, need uh, 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 is a, 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 a team, need a, a team, it's a team work. We need many specialities to work, for instance, in, in epilepsy surgery, for instance. And it, you, you won't find that in every place. So no way to, to, to avoid uh, centralization. But other, th the same to uh, craniofacial surgery, but uh, the other uh, pathologies, I'm not sure. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Mashallah. I think you are right. That's a, that's a point where they definitely has to be. And there's a point we are no, mm. no need to be. It's a very fine point at that point. So this brings to the last and uh, important lecture talk from Mr. Girish Salanki. He's the chairman of the British Pediatric Neurosurgery Group. Uh, he's a senior neurosurgeon at Birmingham. He has pretty much trained uh, uh, pediatric neurosurgeon in every unit in UK and elsewhere as well, including Professor Machado's uh, uh, residence. So uh, it's a real honor to invite pro, uh, Mr. Solanke. Uh, and first of all, he's my mentor since 2008. Uh, and I had the pleasure of working with him next to him for two years. Uh, and I picked up so many things, so many, uh, uh, so many neurosurgical as well as um, leadership uh, uh, points while sitting next to him and eavesdropping and, and, and picking his thoughts. So, Mr. Solangi, you know, this pandemic is not over. Uh, and what's your thoughts, how we can keep things going? Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, Naren. Uh, uh, I really appreciate you putting me into this uh, August uh, group of faculty. Uh, and I hope I can uh, help in improving outcomes. But you know, having received the graveyard shift, I might not, be, I might not have the uh, full attention uh, of the team here. Uh, but yes, I, I think this is an important thing. Uh, of course, none of us were prepared for a pandemic and we, none of us expected a pandemic. Sorry, is my um, uh, uh, PowerPoint show, uh, sl a slide showing? Yes, it's showing. It's showing. Uh, and yes. is it showing as a, as a uh, PowerPoint um, uh, um, show? Show. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Yeah, so I put the topic COVID-19 pandemic, role of a national pediatric neurosurgery center. Uh, it's a bit of a, you know, a heavy, heavy title. But um, yeah, I think we can go through this together and see, you know, what are the lessons learned in the pandemic. Um, Let's see if this thing is working. Yes, no conflicts of interest. So I'll start, you know, for the, because this is an international audience, I'll probably start by defining what the BNG is. So that's the British Pediatric Neurosurgery Group. The SBNS is the Society of British Neurological Surgeons. Um, the NHS, of course, National Health Service, Royal College of Surgeons, uh, the uh, Public Health Education, NICE. So these are the sort of uh, things that we are very accustomed to, but I thought I would just mention it to you as well. The British Pediatric Neurosurgery Group uh, is now 87 active neuro neurosurgeons performing pediatric neurosurgery in the UK and Ireland. It's a subspecialty group of the SBNS, the Society of British Neurological Surgeons. And the chair of the uh, British Pediatric Neurosurgery Group sits on the SBNS Council representing the group. Our group is actually the largest and the oldest subspecialty group in the, um, uh, the, the British Neurosurgical Society. So when the pandemic uh, arrived, I think we all had to kind of catch our tails and start you know, moving very quickly. So one of, one of the important things that we did right at the outset was communication. So the SPNS president and secretary uh, got in touch with all the uh, subspecialty groups and we all started working together in formulating um, guidelines and a response uh, for our subspecialty groups. Uh, one of the important things for us uh, was that the, um, uh, 
we, we needed to be in contact. So, you know, there are 18 to 19 pediatric neurosurgery centers in the UK and Ireland. So we had to create a rapid response group of all clinical service leads, which I did. Uh, and uh, they were able, therefore, there would be like a chain of communication. Uh, so at the very highest level, we would be in contact every day and each one of the clinical service leads would be in contact with their teams. Uh, and that allowed us to know what was going on right from the ground up all the way to the, um, the, the level of the, the, uh, the professional sort of recommendations. And so we had a full representation for Dublin, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England. And we all uh, talked every day, we worked together. Uh, we also made contact with the Royal College of Surgeons for development of common guidelines uh, with commissioning groups, clinical reference groups, particularly for women and children services, and with the general pediatric surgical specialities so that we could start working together in developing uh, a response. And, you know, I was just looking uh, in the news today, we are still, uh, you know, in pretty much as Naren said, in the throes of the pandemic, uh, just under half a million cases reported worldwide on the 4th of December. Uh, you know, over five, five and a quarter million people died uh, worldwide. Uh, and even, even though 8 billion, 95 million vaccine doses have been administered in 184 countries, um, the, the daily incidence of cases is still quite high. The highest today was in the US, 61,000 cases. So we're not in the clear by a long shot. And of course, the new strain, uh, the Om Omicron uh, variant has arrived. Uh, and uh, thanks to the uh, sagacity and the uh, work done by the South African uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Omicron has uh, become known, uh, even though it is now pretty much well accepted that the variant probably developed by September, uh, and uh, it's uh, now reported in over 12 countries, and you can see the yellow shaded uh, countries where it has already been reported. So it's not to say that it started in South Africa, but South Africa reported it first. So we are constantly learning about COVID-19, and the first thing that I think all of us have to do, and I recommend we continue to do, is to keep reading the guidance for infection prevention and control in the healthcare setting, because it's critically important that we stay safe so we can keep our patients safe. And the uh, precautions that we recommend to our patients, we must in the first instance carry them out ourselves. Uh, at the very outset, uh, we received instructions from NHS England uh, asking us to make a list of the procedures, surgical procedures that we would consider absolutely emergency. That means either immediate or those that require to be done within 72 hours of the surgery. So that was our, my very first task, was to identify those conditions, detail them, then those that needed to be done in the first four weeks, three months, and then over three months. And we then went through the whole gamut of pediatric neurosurgery uh, and identified those uh, procedures in a very simplified way that could be used as a guide uh, the list, of course, wasn't exhaustive, but it covered all of the uh, important areas. Uh, and that then was uh, circulated and distributed nationally. The second thing that we had to do uh, was communicate. So we had all those patients who had already been listed for surgery, waiting clinic appointments, and pretty much everything was on lockdown. So we had to communicate with parents. And that was the essential thing that we had to do. And where surgery had been postponed, we had to provide them with an honest expectation of when surgery was going to be likely, even if it was going to be after six months, or after three months. We then also discussed how we would make decisions that would stand up. So shared decision when there was need, for example, to upgrade somebody's surgery. Uh, we were concerned about the possibility that, uh, that for example, transferoidal surgery could put the uh, surgeons at risk. And so all of those decisions had to be done uh, initially in a local MDT and then through a national platform. So we offered both. So in those situations where there was disagreement at the um, departmental level or hospital level, where the hospital team, for example, the anesthetist refused to perform surgery on a patient that was much needed, then we would provide a second opinion nationally to support our colleagues around the country. Uh, and then uh, new referrals and careful ongoing case. So all of that 
uh, was pretty much initially done. So we started with the first wave, March 2020 onwards. Um, this, this is a paper that highlights, uh, reviews the first year, uh, the, the, the in-hospital mortality of the first COVID wave using the WHO clinical characterization protocol in the UK. You can see here how the, the wave hit the UK pretty much starting on the 9th of March and rising within the first six weeks by the third week was a massive peak, which then over the next few months by August, uh, the first wave was done. Uh, but that is how it came. It came with a bang, uh, overwhelmed hospital facilities, uh, PICUs, ITUs, um, all admissions had been pretty much closed to absolutely the uh, life-threatening and emergency admissions. And I'm sure that that was the same picture all across uh, the world. Uh, this is uh, pretty much a graph that shows all the various factors uh, that intervene in the first wave. And you can see here the ones in white, uh, what we call the adjusted confounders, age, sex, comorbidity, severity of illness, and all of those kind of bind together with other uh, confounders to determine the admission to hospital. And then once the patient is in a hospital, it's the steroid treatment, the critical care, and respiratory support, or what we call the unmeasured mediators that will decide on mortality. And then there are the unadjusted confounders, which is your ability in the hospital to take patients uh, or critical care facilities and other confounders. So all of those things took part in the, um, the survival of the patients. Uh, when we think about uh, what are the things that actually cause a spike in um, the virus activity uh, causing the waves, uh, it's very clear that uh, it's not one factor, but many factors. Uh, of course, now that we got vaccines, the effectiveness of the vaccines, um, which wanes over time, is clearly a factor. Human behavior, you become confident that nothing is happening. You drop your guard. Uh, whether you have natural acquired immunity plays a very important role, both in suffering from the disease and transferring it. Travel, we know that uh, during gatherings and the winter holidays particularly, uh, the travel and uh, close quarter gatherings increases um, uh, the, uh, the number of new cases. And then the infection prevention policies, if they're not implemented or recommended, uh, creates uh, the opportunity for dissemination. Uh, so we all know since uh, the vaccines arrived by December 2020, that uh, most of the countries have been able to bring down their uh, infection levels. And by spring of 2021, uh, the disease was very much under control. Uh, until, of course, the Delta variant then surfaced. Uh, and we know that uh, the, um, the vaccines only work for a period of time and the decreasing immunity, either natural or acquired, will cause uh, recrudescence of uh, reinfections. And finally, the virus mutation is a, another important cause uh, for uh, uh, surges in um, uh, sort of wave life activity of the virus. And we know that by July 21, the contagious Delta variant that appeared now become, has become dominant around the world. Uh, but now in November, Omicron has uh, appeared and uh, it seems to be, uh, for example, in the UK yesterday, uh, between yesterday and today, the number of cases doubled. Uh, there's a 50% increase in the um, diagnosed cases. So suggesting that there is probably already some um, dissemination of the, the new variant in the community and that um, uh, measures to stop it from arriving in force in the country are probably now uh, not going to be effective anymore. So I wanted to remind you that this is how we started and this is how we must continue uh, because unless we use masks and prote protective equipment, regular cleaning and physical distancing, and regular testing and screening, uh, we're putting ourselves at risk, then we are not available to treat our patients and of course our patients as well. And there's very good evidence of that. So where uh, COVID-19 precautions have been used, uh, there is less cases of um, uh, surgical, sorry, uh, COVID spikes and where those precautions are not taken care of, uh, the incidence of um, new cases or reinfection increases as well. So, what I want to tell you really is what we did as a society. The first thing was to get together, start communications, and then our first task was to provide national guidance. The second one was to 
then monitor the effect of the guidance. The third one then was to evaluate the impact of the uh, guidance. Uh, and then at the national and local level, consider how do we start logistic recovery? Uh, so, uh, and then of course, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about those four steps. So not neurosurgery guidance, uh, we started with our pediatric neurosurgery guidance. To do that, I formed the rapid response group, uh, which started looking at guidance around the world and uh, from the public health and uh, other uh, responsible teams, WHO and so on. Uh, set up a, a uh, advisory panel of the past four chairs of the BPNG with the current chair uh, to go through the recommendations. And finally, the SBNS chair ratified the final guidance guideline recommendations, which we then submitted uh, to NHS England uh, on our website, to Royal College of Surgeons, and they were disseminated uh, for a general purpose use. Uh, and uh, as you know, PR in neurosurgery only accounts for 10 to 15% of neurosurgery. Uh, and the evidence to, at the beginning of the pandemic suggested that children developed either a mild condition or uh, were not uh, as immune compromised as adults. And therefore it provided uh, uh, a degree of um, uh, interaction with children a lot more than adults were able to. Our biggest concern at the very beginning, as I mentioned, was the surgery in close proximity to the face, eyes, and paranasal sinuses. As the greatest risk to neurosurgeons, ENT, ophthalmic, maxillofacial, craniofacial surgeons, and we set up some guidelines to reflect that and the use of adequate uh, you know, personal protection. Uh, in, in our case, level three full PPE was used. Uh, and then we set up uh, also a clinical guide for managing pediatric neurosurgery patients during the pandemic for all of the neurosurgeons in the UK. Uh, which uh, was then revised again on the 24th of April. Uh, we also provided uh, similar guidance for surgical activities for the neurosciences group, uh, which was put through the Royal College of Surgeons uh, and the commissioning groups. Uh, and uh, so we kept doing this and updating our guidance in the various um, uh, uh, fora. Uh, one of the things that we stipulated was uh, the risk of neurosurgery. So what is the risk to the patient and to the surgeons uh, when performing certain types of neurosurgery? Uh, and we alluded to the um, surgeon, neurosurgery of the head, particularly transphenoidal surgery. And that was one of the things that at the very beginning of the pandemic we had to deal with. But we were absolutely clear that patients with hydrocephalus, uh, whether we knew they, whether they had COVID or not, they should be operated on as a matter of life and death and that we'll take full precautions until the COVID status was made known. Um, and this was then finally agreed. Uh, in cases, uh, particularly those that uh, did not have um, uh, previous uh, shunting or at uh, shunting that required revision, uh, we tried to reduce uh, surgical uh, interventions to minimum and started recommending the use of ETV success score to determine the best uh, type of intervention. Uh, in, onco in oncological surgery, again, we uh, started recommending the reduced surgical interventions, for example, in some of the cases, uh, whether a biopsy would be more appropriate. In others, uh, for example, uh, a limited resection uh, and um, alternative treatments. So all of that was part, very much part and parcel of the uh, development of guidelines. Um, I, I won't go into too much detail here because it will take forever, but uh, these are some examples of recommendations that we made. For example, uh, parents were very worried to bring their children to the hospital, uh, but they needed to have at conference monitoring done. Uh, there was no possibility for district nurses to go to their homes. So we then started a campaign to teach parents how to measure that circumference. And we introduced that in the guidelines so that uh, they could demonstrate a simple way to measure that circumference and they could then measure in colors and give us that circumference measurements so we could have some idea about children at risk. Uh, surgical procedures, uh, as I mentioned, we were in a situation where uh, we could be um, mandated, for example, not to carry out some uh, procedures and unless there was a national consensus uh, we would be in difficulties because there were 18 units. So what we did is we set up guidelines, guidelines uh, as you can see here, 1A, immediate surgery, life-threatening, 1B, uh, as soon as possible within um, the 72 hours, 
uh, three would be four, uh, four weeks and then um, three, uh, less than three months and then more than three months to four. Uh, so we were able to categorize in a very simplified fashion why we thought procedures should be done. And this was uh, pretty much well received and um, uh, accepted by the generality. And we were able to continue with our activities. So once the guideline was set and everybody's following it, the next thing was how to monitor what's going on. So we set up a rapid response group and I had reports on a weekly basis about patient surgical activity reduction, uh, staff sick leave, which units had less staff, which units might need to transfer patients to other units where there was more staff, staff deployment to adult units, uh, loss of anesthetists and so on. And so all of that allowed us to provide a degree of uh, control and monitoring. And uh, I was really grateful that everybody contributed to this uh, by taking time to send those reports. Uh, we were able to, using our national operative activity, which we provide on a continuing basis since uh, way back 2006, you can see the data here of the last 10, uh, 12 years, uh, that uh, th this is annual surgical activity. Uh, and that's about uh, 50 uh, odd, about 53% uh, is uh, emergency or uh, urgent activity and 47% is elective activity. Uh, this is only pediatric neurosurgery activity. We do something like uh, just under 7,000 cases per year uh, for the whole country. Uh, so there's a large number of patients that we can uh, use to determine how, uh, how COVID-19 changes uh, were uh, um, impacting on our practice. Uh, this is a chart uh, that shows activity in 2018 and 19, and you can see more than 50% of our activity is CSF uh, with uh, between five to 600, um, uh, five to 750 tumors a year. Uh, the other activity is less than 500 cases uh, nationally. Uh, epilepsy and craniofacial, you know, head to head, uh, just crossing the 500 mark. So these are uh, a good sort of a baseline for activity for the whole country. And then uh, when COVID hit us, uh, we started getting weekly reports and we were able to work out, of, for example, that there was a weekly overall reduction of all activity by 51%. Uh, but emergency activity reduction was only 15% suggesting that emergency activity was still ongoing, although less than before. Uh, and the majority of the reduction had to be elective activity. Uh, when we looked into groups, this is a weekly overall reduction. So the numbers you see here, are the reduction, percentage of reduction in the various groups. For example, we had 51% reduction in surgical demand. That means patients not coming to the hospital. When we looked at the trauma cases, we saw here 80% reduction in trauma cases. Of course, that's a very good news because uh, of the pandemic, uh, the uh, road traffic accidents pretty much came to a halt. Uh, but we also noticed a significant reduction in one third of the patients with brain tumors just disappeared. Uh, so one third reduction in uh, brain tumor surgery, uh, 45, nearly 50% reduction, therefore, of patients' hydrocephalus. So what happened to them? So this, of course, created uh, difficulties in the sense that they were presenting, but presenting late. And I think the one important paper that was published was a Brazilian pediatric neurosurgery, which did a very similar study uh, and reported uh, that the majority, about 46% had a reduction, 46% uh, of Brazilian units had a reduction between 26 to 50% of the activity, showing that uh, pretty much across the world, uh, there was a pretty similar pediatric neurosurgery uh, drop in activity. Uh, so then we had to evaluate the impact. Uh, so as I said, one was, of course, decrease in the uh, surgical activity. Uh, the other was, where are the children? And if they're not coming, what's happening with them? And the, the biggest group that we were concerned was the children at risk, uh, that they might be suffering from non-accidental head injuries, and there was no way for us to monitor that, and the children with cancer. Uh, the children with hydrocephalus were coming, but possibly some of them quite late. Uh, then the late presentation of children in neurological deterioration. Uh, so it was well recognized across all the surgical specialties. The NHS started a campaign to get children and patients to seek medical care sooner and to get them to call 111 and other uh, telephone lines that would advise them to come to the hospital. Uh, by the end of the year, we knew that there was a huge backlog 
of something like uh, 2 million, 100,000 people uh, which had not been screened. Uh, there was uh, enormous amounts of referrals dropped by 25%. Um, the, um, the activity, particularly in cancer, dropped. And by the end of, um, you can see here the numbers that I'm providing you, operations that fallen to around 60% of expected. Uh, 12,500 people are waiting for cancer surgery across the UK. This is, of course, all across all the services. Same thing applies to chemotherapy, radiotherapy. It was an uh, enormous heat for patients who urgently needed treatment. By the end of the year, when we looked at uh, the paper that was published in Lancet Oncology in April, 45% of those with potential cancer symptoms had not contacted the doctors. They, they didn't want upset. They didn't want to uh, get infected. They cited reasons, including fear of contracting COVID or avoiding placing extra strain on the NHS. Suspected cancer referrals fell by about 350,000 compared to the same period in 2019. Uh, so you had to imagine that a lot of those uh, were actually cancer. And then combined with interrupt interruptions in cancer screening programs, um, diagnostics, delay in scans, a spike in late cancer presentations and diagnosis anticipated. In fact, it's all coming to fruition now. And uh, previously curable tumors were more difficult to treat and further excess that's unavoidable. So the UK's uh, NHS currently has about more than 4.6 million people on waiting lists for surgery. 300,000 people on hold for more than 12 months, a wait time that is 100 times higher than before the pandemic. A large proportion of these delays are patients with cancer. The Royal College surgeons particularly concerned that it could take several years to clear the backlog. Although the government has given enormous amounts of money for COVID recovery, the problem, of course, is that there isn't capacity to do this recovery. And uh, UK cancer surgeons are also increasingly fearful of a wave of compensation claims from patients who are unable to receive their treatment during the pandemic and whose cancers have now subsequently progressed and become harder to treat. So uh, leaving the monitoring aside, how are we going to manage and recover uh, now that um, you know, we got to a state where we could start thinking about recovery. So the first thing, of course, uh, the UK launched the, taste, uh, the test and trace uh, program, which was aimed at uh, testing pretty much everybody. We had the NHS app that was monitoring our movements and uh, uh, pointing out where we were coming in contact with people who were diagnosed with COVID. So all of that was an attempt to try and control the spread of the virus. Uh, but uh, when we look at the impact on healthcare, we can see starting in March, shielding measures introduced to protect people at high risk. Uh, urgent cancer referrals started dropping by April. Uh, you know, by July, three and a half thousand avoidable cancer deaths in England in the, ne uh, in the next five years was predicted. So uh, we had set up two enormous Nightingale hospitals. Uh, this uh, really didn't uh, come to fruition in terms of uh, being very effective they were converted into cancer testing centers. So uh, at the same time uh, as the pandemic, the first wave was coming to an end, there was some concern that the, the winter would bring the second wave. So uh, the national operative um, uh, evaluation, um, uh, what do you call the operative pressure escalation levels uh, is, is a strategy framework that allows the NHS to uh, up, uh, up their tempo or upgrade their delivery of services or bring it down depending on the need. Uh, and this uses centralization of pediatric ICU beds um, and uh, recruitment of other units which may be dormant. So this is something that is across the region, uh, is used as a national strategy. So one of the things that I was approached was to consider, for example, moving neurosurgery patients to centralized PICU units in other hospitals so that the local uh, PICU centers could be converted to adult ITU centers to treat COVID patients. Uh, of course, we resisted that. And uh, fortunately, uh, we were uh, able to avoid such a, dra a dra draconian plan where neurosurgery patients, maybe with emergency craniotomies, would have to travel a distance to go to another PICU. So that was avoided. Uh, the other thing that came in quite handy was that at the time neurosurgery, had designed a project called GERFT, which is getting it right first time. Uh, and that was, uh, an, again, a national program run by the Society of British Neurosurgeons with support from the NHS, which was looking at what are the things that we can do in our NHS 
that can save money, can optimize care, and can get it right first time so that we avoid complications. So we looked at the, the advice that was given to us for cranial neurosurgery. Uh, and uh, again, this is an enormous amount of patients uh, nationally that were looked at. Uh, so the recommendations were very strong. Uh, we were uh, able to use some of those recommendations um, uh, for uh, improving the delivery of care during the pandemic. And this is both for cranial and spinal services. It's quite a long list here, so I'm not going to spend too much time with this. <clears throat> but what I wanted to tell you is when we got to the time of recovery, it had to be a nationally led recovery. Uh, and uh, the first thing was, can you start doing elective surgical procedures? <clears throat> and if you can, uh, what, what is the list? Uh, so the national guideline for elective surgical is uh, then was designed where there were five COVID groups. That means uh, some patients you can do, say, uh, as life-threatening in emergency, that is the emergency side. But for elective patients, uh, the first one will be you have to do it within one week. The second one will be for eight weeks. The third one will be three months. And then after three months. So that way we could start prioritizing elective surgical procedures. Uh, because until then, all elective surgical lists had been suspended. So we had to bring them back, but we had to bring them back in a way that allowed some triage and those that were urgent needed to be done first. Girish, uh, sorry, if, uh, but two yeah. or three minutes left. Thanks, <laughs> Jess. Thanks. No worries. Thanks. Uh, it, uh, it's a bit of a boring concept. No, 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 no it's interesting, but, <laughs> but uh, just yeah, for no the worries. time. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll put some, um, you know, going to fifth gear now. Sure, thanks. So it, it basically, you know, the important thing was uh, which hospital could open up for elective work. So you had to work out whether you had uh, an adequate anesthetic workforce, whether the hospital had adequate PICU or ICU capacity to allow the activity to occur without affecting COVID patients. Did you have supplies of um, the, uh, you know, PPE, the level three PPE, personal protection equipment? Did you have uh, surgical beds, emergency intubation facilities? So all of that, did you have, uh, you know, aerosol uh, generating procedures in place? So all of that had to be identified first. And then you then prioritized for each hospital, uh, how much activity could you increase and when you'd increase. The Royal College of Surgeons provided us with the COVID-19 toolkit for recovery for surgical areas, which was very helpful. Uh, and of course, it was not just surgery, but outpatient. So we started with outpatient activity and in outpatient activity, essentially, uh, we recommended nationally that you should consider face-to-face -face for all new patients, video consultations to review concerns that may not warrant a full face-to-face, -face, and continue telephone consultations for follow-up care. So that allowed us to start seeing patients and making decisions. Then we talked about admitting patients. So to admit patients, we had to create a COVID-negative patient area, ward capacity and strategy expansion, a light specialty support. If you admit a patient, you can't discharge a patient unless the patient can mobilize safely to go home. So we had to get the SALT team, the occupational therapy team, the physiotherapy team, all of them to agree to rapid discharges. Uh, and then we again had to set up a criteria, follow up national criteria for opening up the wards, uh, ITUs, restarting elective surgery. Um, and then uh, once all of that was done, uh, we were hit by a second wave. Uh, <laughs> and we had to do winter planning. So this is just an example of the European, uh, how did uh, the death rate suddenly escalate all across Europe? So these are something like 30 countries here. And the ones in red were the most uh, viciously affected and at the worst death rates in, um, in Europe. So you can see the, uh, the ones that exceeded Spring Peak, below Spring Peak, far below Spring Peak. And actually the UK was actually you know, not too bad. And when you look at the, um, uh, the effect, you can see this, this graph shows you the first wave and the second wave. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the mortality uh, with the deaths was significantly less than expected. And we were actually able to continue uh, work uh, during the second wave winter. Uh, and of course, now we're talking about the third wave and winter planning. This is the latest um, uh, data that I had from April. Uh, of course, uh, there is a more recent chart, but you can see here that the UK is actually not too bad at all. It's at the bottom 
showing that they have the lowest activity at the moment. I think France is the worst activity. This was in April, but of course, as you know, a number of countries in Europe have now gone into lockdown. So the third wave is hit Europe. We, I think, probably a little bit better. But uh, Naren, if you give me a few minutes, I just want to talk sure. about winter planning. So the, what, the most important thing that we are facing now, whether there's a Delta variant or Omicron variant, is actually how do we uh, compete with the seasonal increase in flu? Now, in 2020, everybody was wearing a mask. There are hardly any cases of flu. Since then, everybody is off the mask and the flu cases are rising. Uh, the seasonal um, di vomiting and diarrhea. So all of those um, viruses are now rampant. So the beds are being, uh, we, you know, there's a competition for beds. And what we did is we looked at 10,000 children over the last 10 years. This is our Birmingham Children's Hospital. And you can see quite clearly that there's a seasonality here, that the admissions rise in the summer, they drop in the winter, winter being January, February, November, December. Uh, and then uh, this graph shows you a little bit better. There's a 10 year follow up. And uh, we can see that the summer activity is significantly greater than winter. If you look at the zero here, uh, the winter activity drops because there are no beds available. You can't operate on them. And the same thing happens with PICU activity. So we identified the five top neurosurgery PICU conditions and then started targeting those uh, for um, uh, in increasing beds. Now, as we know, this is a flow. So patients first, the bottleneck is not directly in the hospital in the neurosurgery department, but it starts in the A&E department. So we have to then look at admissions in A&E department and how that bottleneck started. We have to look at ambulance transfers, delayed transfer of care, you know, are we discharging patients rapidly? So these are graphs that show that until 2019, uh, the country was actually improving our ability to flex beds during the winter, the number of admissions in the winter were dropping sequentially. You could see these are the 13 weeks starting in October to December uh, to Christmas. Uh, so in the 13 weeks, the, the delayed transfer care seems to drop sequentially. And by December, there is very little transfer care. Everybody wants to go home for Christmas. And hospitals also drop their surgical activity. So you can see an improvement here as well. And you can see between the 12th and 13th week of December, more than a thousand cases drop. And this pretty much has to do with the Christmas season and hospitals closing down uh, surgical activity. So we know this information and using this information, we can then start planning whether we, we can open up additional activity. And this is a sort of discussion and I'm not going to spend too much time here because this, this information yeah. really is more local. But what I wanted to say is that the approach to winter planning is flexible increase in PICU capacity, flexible increase in PICU staff, upscale your level two to level three in the regional operational networks. This is again, a local plan for the children's hospital, uh, which you see here, and something that we designed called the fast lane corridor for oncology procedures, vascular procedures, shunts and hydrocephalus and trauma, where uh, everything is done so quickly that you can get them discharged much more rapidly than other patients who may need to stay in hospital longer. And then nationally uh, for winter, the national phase three strategy uh, came in where we increased surgical capacity in the winter by as much as 150%, increase in open primary centers, GP practices, so that a lot of these patients can be dealt with outside the hospital. And I'm going to finish now uh, to, with some take home messages as a chair of a BPNG or, or a pediatric neurosurgery group, that the, the thing that has taken us through this pandemic was that we worked together. We had amazing collegiate collaboration and support. We developed very rapid, robust and secure communications. Uh, we kept talking to other national groups. We talked about developing common standards, particularly the Brazilian group. We stayed abreast of developments. Uh, we maintain personal protection. Uh, most hospitals had the sh uh, staff shielding. That means one consultant stayed in the hospital, the other stayed at home, so that we wouldn't all get COVID at the same time and be taken out of action, so the whole department would shut down. We acted quickly and prepared to step down during searches. We shared information, we gave honest feedback, we worked together, and we remained patient and persevered. So thank you. Um, for your patience in listening. Thank you, thank you, Girish. Professor Machado, thank you. Thank you, Girish. Nice to see you. 
Well, uh, I think uh, it's an outstanding talk and uh, uh, you cover everything that uh, happened uh, so dramatically around the world. Uh, if I could point uh, one single thing that I, I think it was very uh, uh, deleterious for, for uh, our activity is the, the, that the, the, the children facilities and in hospitals like ours and the University of Sao Paulo were turned to adult facilities. I don't know if this happened in England. And so uh, uh, we had much, much less uh, beds for treat uh, children with uh, oncology and uh, all, all the problems. And uh, some uh, of the, our surgeries would uh, absolutely come to zero, for instance, epilepsy surgery or craniofacial. But uh, I think it's, uh, it was a, a dramatic period. And thank you very much. Thank you, Nari, for the opportunity to discuss all this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Solangi. Thank you very much, Professor Machado, for um, fabulously taking us through uh, this session with your thoughtful questions and comments. Uh, and so this brings us to the close. And uh, we had two days of uh, free papers from, from uh, everywhere from Malaysia to Argentina. And we had uh, four symposiums uh, for the first collaborative symposiums, I, as far as I know, in the webinar world with the, the, the World Spine Society and World, uh, World Spinal Column Society and the WFNS Spine Committee. And today with the former uh, WFNS Neurotrauma Committee and now the pediatric symposium. Uh, Dr. Russell Andrews, if I may invite you to give the last uh, closing remarks as you have been a LISA member as long as it started, I think, and now you have spent the, you got up early in the morning, uh, in the mid, early or small hours of the morning to follow this meeting and you were here yesterday as well. So may I please ask you to uh, say the closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Well, uh I think Naren needs uh, no introduction, um, but we should give him a real round of uh, applause and thanks for again assembling a, a conference of amazing depth and breadth. Uh, uh, I think Naren, you've been a, um, a unique uh, example of what one person can do with uh, dedication and energy to uh, influence or move the needle in a field like neurosurgery. So I uh, congratulate you on another uh, excellent uh, uh, set of lectures that you brought together. And uh, one other comment um, that when you were giving your talk on the uh, uh, regionalization versus centralization, and I was thinking of the talk that Ed Benzel gave yesterday, um, the uh, voice of experience, and it might be, a, uh, I'm not sure the list server would be a forum for this, but letting senior experienced neurosurgeons give a distillation of what they would say the important points they would pass on to the young incoming generation, uh, maybe 500 words in uh, bullet points or whatever, what they've learned in their careers that uh, could be passed on so others may avoid some of the problems that we've all gone through. Um, but that, that just came to, to mind as you were talking uh, uh, a little while ago. But again, uh, congratulations. And I think we all should thank Naren for what he's done over the last, uh, well, it's been well over a decade now. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Russell Andrews. Uh, I think you know, with the support I have with all the, all the list of members, it's actually quite a pleasure, it's a very you know, great pleasure to do what I do. And in terms of what you just said about getting the wise words of senior neurosurgeons, uh, I think that's why I'm starting this uh, podcast where I'm going to get the senior neurosurgeons to um, give their you know, lifetime of, uh, you know, I, I have changed through my life as a person, a neurosurgeon and everything. And someone like Dr. Benzer, yourself, Mr. Solanke, Professor Machado, and I said, you know, you learn from other people. Uh, life is too short to learn yourselves. So I will certainly push that one, uh, um, God willing, this year. So thank you very much, everyone, for being supportive and for absolutely fantastic lectures, eminent people and people coming from around the world. And it's all on the YouTube. So thank you very much. And we'll definitely have a 2022 W. 
uh, NWC. I think this has. To, I think it. You no, know, in, in the in the in the in the um, in the rainbow, this this uh, world webinar neurosurgery conference uh, has its place, even after the the COVID has passed. So, and uh, most likely, I will ask uh, like the INRC for other teams to run it, so they can bring new energy and new new ideas. Wishing you all a great evening, wherever you are. Good night and take care and God bless you. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thanks, man. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.